Book Three, Chapter Twenty Four of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Three, Chapter Twenty Four. The same afternoon, Robert started on a walk to a distant farm where one of his Sunday school boys lay recovering from rheumatic fever. The rector had his pocket full of articles, a story book in one, a puzzle map in the other, destined for Master Carter's amusement. On the way, he was to pick up Mr. Wendover at the park gates. It was a delicious April morning. A soft west wind blew through leaf and grass, driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air. The spring was stirring everywhere, and Robert raced along, feeling in every vein a life and ebullience akin to that of nature. As he neared the place of meeting, it occurred to him that the squire had been unusually busy lately, unusually silent and absent too on their walks. What was he always at work on? Robert had often inquired of him as to the nature of those piles of proof and manuscript with which his table was littered. The squire had never given any but the most general answer, and had always changed the subject. There was an invincible personal reserve about him, which, through all his walks and talks with Ellesmere, had never, as yet, broken down. He would talk of other men and other men's labours by the hour, but not of his own. Ellesmere reflected on the fact mingling with the reflection a certain humorous scorn of his own constant openness and readiness to take counsel with the world. However, his book isn't a mere excuse, as Langham's is, Ellesmere inwardly remarked. Langham, in a certain sense, plays even with learning. Mr. Wendover plays at nothing. By the way, he had a letter from Langham in his pocket, much more cheerful and human than usual. Let him look through it again. Not a word, of course, of that National Gallery experience. A circumstance, however, which threw no light on it either way. "'I find myself a good deal reconciled to life by this migration of mine,' wrote Langham. "'Now that my enforced duties to them are all done with, my fellow-creatures seem to me much more decent fellows than before. The great stir of London, in which, unless I please, I have no part whatever, attracts me more than I could have thought possible.' No one in these noisy streets has any rightful claim upon me. I have cut away at one stroke of lectures and boards of studies and tutors' meetings, and all the rest of the wearisome Oxford make-believe, and the creature left behind feels lighter and nimbler than he has felt for years. I go to concerts and theatres. I look at the people in the streets. I even begin to take an outsider's interest in social questions, in the puny dykes which well-meaning people are trying to raise all round us against the encroaching, devastating labour troubles of the future. By dint of running away from life, I may end by cutting a much more passable figure in it than before. Be, be consoled, my dear Ellesmere. Reconsider your remonstrances. There, under the great cedar by the gate, stood Mr. Wendover. Illumined as he was by the spring sunshine, he struck Ellesmere as looking unusually shrunken and old. And yet, under the look of physical exhaustion, there was a new serenity, almost a peacefulness of expression, which gave the whole man a different aspect. "'Don't take me far,' he said abruptly as they started. "'I've not got the energy for it. I've been overworking and must go away.' "'I've been sure of it for some time,' said Ellesmere warmly. "'You ought to have a long rest. But uh, mayn't I know, Mr. Wendover, before you take it, what this great task is you've been toiling at?' Remember, you have never told me a word of it. And Ellesmere's smile had in it a touch of most friendly reproach. Fatigue had left the scholar relaxed, comparatively defenceless. His sunk and wrinkled eyes lit up with a smile, faint indeed, but of unwanted softness. A task indeed, he said with a sigh. The task of a lifetime. Today I finished the second third of it. Probably before the last section is begun, some interloping German will have stepped down before me. It is the way of the race. But for the moment there is the satisfaction of having come to an end of some sort. A natural halt, at any rate. Elsmere's eyes were still interrogative. Oh, well, said the squire hastily. It is a book I planned just after I took my doctor's degree at Berlin. It struck me then as the great want of modern scholarship. It is a history of evidence, or rather more strictly, a history of testimony. Robert started. The library flashed into his mind, and Langham's figure in the long grey coat sitting on the stool. "'A great subject,' he said slowly. "'A magnificent subject. How have you conceived it, I wonder?' 
simply from the standpoint of evolution, of development. The philosophical value of the subject is enormous. You must have considered it, of course. Every historian must. But few people have any idea in detail of the amount of light which the history of human witness in the world, systematically carried through, throws on the history of the human mind, that is to say, on the history of ideas. The squire paused, his keen, scrutinising look dwelling on the face beside him, as though to judge whether he were understood. "'Oh, true,' cried Osmere, "'most true. Now I know what vague want it is that you have been haunting me for months.' He stopped short, his look, a glow with all the young thinker's ardour, fixed on the squire. The squire received the outburst in silence, a somewhat ambiguous silence. "'But go on,' said Elsmere. "'Please, go on.' "'Well, you remember,' said the squire slowly, "'that when Tractarianism began, I was for a time one of Newman's victims. "'Then, when Newman departed, I went over body and bones to the liberal reaction which followed his going. "'In the first ardour of what seemed to me a release from slavery, I migrated to Berlin, "'in search of knowledge which was there was no getting in England.' And there, with the taste of a dozen aimless theological controversies still in my mouth, this idea at first took hold of me. It was simply this. Could one, through an exhaustive examination of human records, helped by modern physiological and mental science, get at the conditions, physical and mental, which govern the greater or lesser correspondence between human witness and the fact it reports? A chance task, cried Robert. Hardly conceivable. The squire smiled slightly, the smile of a man who looks back with indulgent half medical satire on the rash ambitions of his youth. Naturally, he resumed, I soon saw I must restrict myself to European testimony, and that only up to the Renaissance. To do that, of course, I had to dig into the East, to learn several Oriental languages, Sanskrit among them. Hebrew I already knew. Then, when I got my languages, I began to work steadily through the whole mass of existing records, sifting and comparing. It is thirty years since I started. Fifteen years ago I finished the section dealing with classical antiquity, with India, Persia, Egypt and Judea. Today I have put the last strokes to a history of testimony from the Christian era down to the sixth century, from Livy to Gregory of Tours, from Augustine to Justinian. Elsmere turned to him with wonder with a movement of irrepressible homage. Thirty years of unbroken solitary labour for one end, one cause. In our hurried fragmentary life, a purpose of this tenacity, this power of realising itself, strikes the imagination. And your two books? But a mere interlude, replied the squire briefly. After the completion of the first part of my work, there were certain deposits left in me which it was a relief to get rid of especially in connection with my renewed impressions of England, he added dryly. Elsmere was silent, thinking this, then, was the explanation of the squire's minute and exhaustive knowledge of the early Christian centuries, a knowledge into which, apart from certain forbidden topics, he had himself dipped so freely. Suddenly, as he mused, there awoke in the young man a new hunger, a new unmanageable impulse towards frankness of speech. All his nascent intellectual powers were alive and clamorous. For the moment his past reticences and timidities looked to him absurd. The mind rebelled against the barriers it had been rearing against itself. It rushed on to sweep them away, crying out that all this shrinking from free discussion had been at bottom a mere treason to faith. "'Naturally, Mr. Wendover,' he said at last, and his tone had a half-defiant, half-nervous energy, you have given your best attention all these years to the Christian problems. Naturally, said the squire dryly. Then, as his companion still seemed to wait, keenly expectant, he resumed with something cynical in the smile which accompanied the words, But I have no wish to infringe our convention. A convention, was it? replied Elsmere, flushing. I think I only wanted to make my own position clear and prevent misunderstanding. "'But it is impossible that I should be indifferent to the results of thirty years such work as you can give to so great a subject.' The squire drew himself up a little under his cloak, and seemed to consider. His tired eyes, fixed on the spring lane before them, saw in reality only the long retrospects of the past. Then a light broke in them, transformed them, a light of battle. 
He turned to the man beside him, and his sharp look swept over him from head to foot. Well, if he would have it, let him have it. He had been contemptuously content so far to let the subject be. But Mr. Wendover, in spite of his philosophy, had never been proof all his life against an anti-clerical instinct worthy almost of a Paris municipal councillor. In spite of his fatigue, there woke in him a kind of cruel, whimsical pleasure of the notion of speaking, once for all, what he conceived to be the whole bare truth to this clever, attractive dreamer, to the young fellow who thought he could condescend to science from the standpoint of the Christian miracles. "'Results?' he said interrogatively. Well, as you will understand, it is tolerably difficult to summarise such a mass at a moment's notice. But I can give you the lines of my last volumes, if it would interest you to hear them. That walk prolonged itself far beyond Mr. Wendover's original intention. There was something in the situation, in Ellesmere's comments, or arguments, or silences, which after a while banished the scholar's sense of exhaustion, and made him oblivious of the country distances. No man feels another soul's quivering and struggling in his grasp without excitement, that his nerve and his self-restraint be what they may. As for Ellesmere, that hour and a half, little as he realised it at the time, represented the turning point of life. He listened, he suggested, he put in an acute remark here, an argument there, such as the squire had often difficulty in meeting. Every now and then the inner protest of an attacked faith would break through in words so full of poignancy, in imagery so dramatic, that the squire's closely knit sentences would be for the moment wholly disarranged. On the whole, he proved himself no mean guardian of all that was most sacred to himself and to Catherine, and the squire's intellectual respect for him rose considerably. All the same, by the end of their conversation, that first period of happy, unclouded youth we've been considering was over for poor Ellesmere. In obedience to certain inevitable laws and instincts of the mind, he had been for months tempting his fate, inviting catastrophe. Nonetheless did the first sure approaches of that catastrophe fill him with a restless resistance which was in itself anguish. As to the squire's talk, it was simply the outpouring of one of the richest, most sceptical, and most highly trained of minds on the subject of Christian origins and no previous period of his life would have greatly affected Ellesmere. But now, at every step, the ideas, impressions, arguments, bred in him by his months of historical work and ordinary converse with the squire, rushed in, as they had done once before, to cripple resistance, to check an emerging answer, to justify Mr. Wendover. We may quote a few fragmentary utterances taken almost at random from the long wrestle of the two men, for the sake of indicating the main lines of a bitter after-struggle. Testimony, like every other human product, has developed. Man's power of apprehending and recording what he sees and hears has grown from less to more, from weaker to stronger, like any other of his faculties, just as the reasoning powers of the cave-dweller have developed into the reasoning powers of a cant. What one wants is the ordered proof of this, and it can be got from history and experience. To plunge into the Christian period without having first cleared the mind as to what is meant in history and literature by the critical method, which in history may be defined as the science of what is credible, and in literature as the science of what is rational, is to invite fiasco. The theologian in such a state sees no obstacle to accepting an arbitrary list of documents with all the strange stuff they may contain, and declaring them to be sound historical material. When he applies it to all the strange stuff of a similar kind surrounding them, the most rigorous principles of modern science. Or he has to make believe that the reasoning process is exhibited in the speeches of the Acts, in certain passages of St. Paul's epistles, or in the Old Testament quotations in the Gospels, have a validity for the mind of the nineteenth century, when in truth they are the imperfect, half-childish products of the mind of the first century, of quite insignificant or indirect value to the historian of fact of enormous value to the historian of testimony and its varieties. Suppose, for instance, before I begin to deal with the Christian story and the earliest Christian development, I try to make out beforehand what are the moulds, the channels into which the testimony of the time must run. I look for these moulds, of course, in the dominant ideas, 
the intellectual preconceptions and preoccupations existing when the period begins. In the first place, I shall find present in the age which saw the birth of Christianity, as in so many other ages, a universal preconception in favour of miracle, that is to say, of deviations from the common norm of experience, governing the work of all men of all schools. Very well. Allow for it, then. Read the testimony of the period in the light of it. Be prepared for the inevitable differences between it and the testimony of your own day. The witness of the time is not true, nor, in the strict sense, false. It is merely incompetent, half-trained, pre-scientific, but all through perfectly natural. The wonder would have been to have had a life of Christ without miracles. The air teems with them. The East is full of messiahs. Even a Tacitus is superstitious. Even a Vespasian works miracles. Even a Nero cannot die, but fifty years after his death is still looked for as the inaugurator of a millennium of horror. The resurrection is partly invented, partly imagined, partly ideally true. In any case, wholly intelligible and natural as a product of the age, when once you have the key of that age. In the next place, look for the preconceptions that have a definite historical origin. Those, for instance, flowing from the pre-Christian apocalyptic literature of the Jews, taking the Maccabean legend of Daniel as the centre of inquiry, those flowing from Alexandrian Judaism and the school of Philo, those from the Palestinian schools of Vestigiousis. Examine your synoptic gospels, your gospel of St. John, your apocalypse, in the light of these. You have no other chance of understanding them, but so examined they fall into place, become explicable and rational. Such material as science can make full use of. The doctrine of the divinity of Christ, Christian eschatology, and the Christian views of prophecy, which also have found their place in a sound historical scheme, it is discreditable now for the man of intelligence to refuse to read his Livy in the light of his Momsen. My object has been to help in making it discreditable to him to refuse to read his Christian documents in the light of a trained scientific criticism. We should have made some advance in rationality when the man who is perfectly capable of dealing sanely with legend in one connection and in another will insist on confounding it with history proper, cannot do so any longer without losing caste, without falling ipso facto out of court with men of education. It is enough for a man of letters if he has helped ever so little in the final staking out of the boundaries between reason and unreason. And so on. These are mere ragged leadings from an ample store. The discussion in reality ranged over the whole field of history, plunged into philosophy, and into the subtlest problems of mind. At the end of it, after he had been conscious for many bitter moments of that same constriction of heart which had overtaken him once before at Mr. Wendover's hands, the religious passion in Ellesmere once more rose with sudden, stubborn energy against the iron negations pressed upon it. "'I will not fight you any more, Mr. Wendover,' he said, with his moved, flashing look. "'I am perfectly conscious that my own mental experience of the last two years has made it necessary to re-examine some of these intellectual foundations of faith. But as to the faith itself, that is its own witness. It does not depend, after all, upon anything external, but upon the living voice of the Eternal in the soul of man. Involuntarily his pace quickened. The whole man was gathered into one great useless, pitiful defiance, and the outer world was forgotten. The squire kept up with difficulty a while, a faint glimmer of sarcasm playing now and then round the straight, thin-lipped mouth. Then suddenly he stopped. "'No, let it be. Forget me and my book, Ellesmere. Everything can be got out of in this world. By the way, we seem to have reached the ends of the earth. Those are the new Marlin cottages, I believe. With your leave, I'll sit down in one of them and send to the hall for the carriage.' Ellesmere's repentant attention was drawn at once to his companion. "'I am a selfish idiot,' he said hotly, "'to have led you into over-walking and over-talking like this.' The squire made some short reply, and instantly turned the matter off. The momentary softness which had marked his meeting with Ellesmere had entirely vanished, leaving only the Mr. Wendover of every day, who was merely made awkward and unapproachable by the slightest touch of personal sympathy. No living being, certainly not his foolish little sister, had any right to take care of the squire. 
and as the signs of age became more apparent, this one fact had often worked powerfully on the sympathies of Ellesmere's chivalrous youth, though as yet he had been no more capable than anyone else of breaking through the squire's haughty reserve. As they turned down the newly worn track to the cottages, whereof the weekly progress had been for some time the delight of Ellesmere's heart, they met old Merrick in his pony carriage. He stopped his shambling steed at sight of the pair. The bleared spectacled eyes lit up, the prim mouth broke into a smile which matched the April sun. "'Well, Squire, well, Mr. Ellesmere, you got to have a look at those places. I never saw such palaces. I only hope I may end my days in anything so good. Will you give me a lease, Squire?' Mr. Wendover's deep eyes took a momentary survey, half-indulgent, half-contemptuous, of the naive, awkward-looking creature in the pony carriage. Then, without troubling to find an answer, he went his way. Robert stayed chatting a moment or two, knowing perfectly well what Merrick's gay garrulity meant. A sharp and bitter sense of the ironies of life swept across him. The squire humanised, influenced by him. He knew that was the image in Merrick's mind. He remembered with a quiet scorn its presence in his own. And never, never had he felt his own weakness and the strength of that grim personality so much as at that instant. That evening Catherine noticed an unusual silence and depression in Robert. She did her best to cheer it away, to get at the cause of it. In vain. At last, with her usual wise tenderness, she left him alone, conscious herself, as she closed the study door behind her, of a momentary dreariness of soul, coming she knew not whence, and only dispersed by the instinctive upward leap of prayer. Robert was no sooner alone than he put down his pipe and sat brooding over the fire. All the long debate of the afternoon began to fight itself out again in the shrinking mind. Suddenly, in his restless pain, a thought occurred to him. He'd be much struck in the squire's conversation by certain allusions to arguments drawn from the book of Daniel. It was not a subject with which Robert had any great familiarity. He remembered his pusey dimly, certain in divinity lectures, an article of Westcott's. He raised his hand quickly and took down the monograph on the use of the Old Testament of the New, which the squire had sent him in the earliest days of their acquaintance. A secret dread and repugnance had held him from it till now. Curiously enough, it was not he, but Catherine, as we shall see, who had opened it first. Now, however, he got it down and turned to the section on Daniel. It was a change of conviction on the subject of the date and authorship of this strained product of Jewish patriotism in the second century before Christ that drove Monsieur Renan out of the Church of Rome. For the Catholic Church to confess, he says in his souvenir, that Daniel is an apocryphal book of the time of the Maccabees, would be to confess that she had made a mistake. If she had made this mistake, she may have made others. She is no longer divinely inspired. The Protestant who is in truth more bound to the book of Daniel than Monsieur Renan, has various ways of getting over the difficulties raised against the supposed authorship of the book by modern criticism. Robert found all these ways enumerated in the brilliant and vigorous pages of the book before him. In the first place, like the orthodox Saint Sulpician, the Protestant meets the critic with a flat non posumus. Your arguments are useless and irrelevant, he says in effect. However plausible may be your objections, the book of Daniel is what it professes to be, because our Lord quoted in it in such a manner as to distinctly recognise its authority. The all-true and all-knowing cannot have made a mistake, nor can he have expressly led his disciples to regard as genuine and divine prophecies which were in truth the inventions of an ingenious romancer. But the liberal Anglican, the man, that is to say, whose logical sense is inferior to his sense of literary probabilities, proceeds quite differently. Your arguments are perfectly just, he says to the critic. The book is a patriotic fraud, of no value except to the historian of literature. But how do you know that our Lord quoted it as true in the strict sense? In fact, he quoted it as literature, as a Greek might have quoted Homer, as an Englishman might quote Shakespeare and many a harassed churchman takes refuge forthwith in the new explanation. 
It is very difficult, no doubt, to make the passages in the Gospels agree with it, but at the bottom of his mind there is a saving silent scorn for the old theories of inspiration. He admits to himself that probably Christ was not correctly reported in the matter. Then appears the critic, having no interests to serve, no parti pris to defend, and states the matter calmly, dispassionately, as it appears to him. No reasonable man, says the ablest German exponent of the book of Daniel, can doubt that this is the most interesting piece of writing belonging to the years 169 or 170 B.C. It was written to stir up the courage and patriotism of the Jews, weighed down by the persecutions of Antiochus Epiphanes. It had enormous vogue. It inaugurated a new apocalyptic literature, and clearly the youth of Jesus of Nazareth was vitally influenced by it. It entered into his thought. It helped to shape his career. But Ellesmere did not trouble himself much with the critic, as at any rate he was reported by the author of the book before him. Long before the critical case was reached, he had flung the book heavily from him. The mind accomplished its further task without help from outside. In the stillness of the night, there is up, weirdly before him, a whole new mental picture, effacing, pushing out innumerable older images of thought. It was the image of a purely human Christ, a purely human, explicable, yet always wonderful Christianity. It broke his heart, but the spell of it was like some dream country, wherein we see all the familiar objects of life in new relations and perspectives. He gazed upon it fascinated, the wailing underneath checked a while by the strange beauty and order of the emerging spectacle. Only a little while. Then with a groan, Elsmo looked up, his eyes worn, his lips white and set. I must face it. I must face it through. God help me. A slight sound overhead in Catherine's room sent a sudden spasm of feeling through the young face. He threw himself down, hiding from his own foresight of what was to be. My darling, my darling, but you shall know nothing of it yet. End of Book Three, Chapter Twenty Four. Book Three, Chapter Twenty Five of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Three, Chapter Twenty Five. And he did face it through. The next three months were the bitterest months of Ellesmere's life. They were marked by anguished mental struggle, by a consciousness of painful separation from the soul nearest to his own, and by a constantly increasing sense of oppression, of closing avenues and narrowing alternatives, which for weeks together seemed to hold the mind in a grip whence there was no escape. That struggle was not hurried and embittered by the bodily presence of the squire. Mr. Wendover went off to Italy a few days after the conversation we have described, but though he was not present in the flesh, the great book of his life was in Ellesmere's hands. He had formally invited Ellesmere's remarks upon it, and the air of Muirwell seemed still echoing with his sentences, still astir with his thoughts. That curious instinct of pursuit, that avid, imperious wish to crush an irritating resistance which his last walk with Ellesmere had first awakened in him with any strength, persisted. He wrote to Robert from abroad, and the proud, fastidious scholar had never taken more pains with anything than with those letters. Robert might have stopped them, might have cast the whole matter from him with one resolute effort. In other relations he had well enough and to spare. Was it an unexpected weakness of fibre that made it impossible, that had placed him in this way at the squire's disposal? Half the world would answer yes. Might not the other half plead that in every generation there is a minority of these mobile, impressionable, defenceless natures, who are ultimately at the mercy of experience, at the mercy of thought, at the mercy, shall we say, of truth, and that, in fact, it is from this minority that all human advance comes. During these three miserable months it cannot be said, poor Ellesmere, that he attempted any systematic study of Christian evidence. His mind was too much torn, his heart too sore. He pounced feverishly on one test point after another, on the Pentateuch, the Prophets, the relation of the New Testament to the thoughts and beliefs of its time, 
the Gospel of St. John, the evidence as to the resurrection, the intellectual and moral conditions surrounding the formation of the canon. His mind swayed hither and thither, driven from each resting place in turn by the pressure of some new difficulty. And, let it be said again, all through, the only constant element in the whole dismal process was his trained historical sense. If he had gone through this conflict at Oxford, for instance, he would have come out of it unscathed, for he would simply have remained throughout it ignorant of the true problems at issue. As it was, the keen instrument he had sharpened so laboriously on indifferent material now ploughed its agonising way, bit by bit, into the most intimate recesses of thought and faith. Much of the actual struggle he was able to keep from Catherine's view, as he had vowed to himself to keep it. For after the squire's departure, Mrs. Darcy too went joyously up to London to flutter a while through the golden alleys of Mayfair, and Ellesmere was left once more in undisturbed possession of the Muirwell Library. There for a while, on every day, oh, pitiful relief, he could hide himself from the eyes he loved. But, after all, married love allows of nothing but the shallowest concealments. Catherine had already had one or two alarms. Once, in Robert's study, among a tumbled mass of books he had pulled out in search of something missing, and which she was putting in order, she had come across that very book on the prophecies which at a critical moment had so deeply affected Ellesmere. It lay open, and Catherine was caught by the heading of a section, The Messianic Idea. She began to read, mechanically at first, and read about a page. That page so shocked a mind accustomed to a purely traditional and mystical interpretation of the Bible that the book dropped abruptly from her hand, and she stood a moment by her husband's table, her fine face pale and frowning. She noticed, with bitterness, Mr. Wendover's name on the title page. Was it right for Robert to have such books? Was it wise, was it prudent, for the Christian to measure himself against such antagonism as this? She wrestled painfully with the question. "'Oh, but I can't understand,' she said to herself with an almost agonised energy. "'It is I who am timid, faithless. He must, he must know what they say. He must have gone through the dark places if he is to carry others through them.' So she stilled and trampled on the inward protest. She yearned to speak of it to Robert, but something withheld her. In her passionate wifely trust she could not bear to seem to question the use he made of his time and thought, and a delicate moral scruple warned her she might easily allow her dislike of the wind over friendship to lead her into exaggeration and injustice. But the stab at that moment recurred, dealt now by one slight incident, now by another. And after the squire's departure Catherine suddenly realised that the whole atmosphere of their home life was changed. Robert was giving himself to his people with a more scrupulous energy than ever. Never had she seen him so pitiful, so full of heart for every human creature. His sermons, with their constant imaginative dwelling on the earthly life of Jesus, affected her now with a poignancy, a pathos, which was almost unbearable. And his tenderness to her was beyond words. But with that tenderness there was constantly mixed a note of remorse, a painful self-depreciation, which he could hardly notice in speech, but which every now and then wrung her heart. And in his parish work he often showed a depression, an irritability, entirely new to her. He, who had always the happiest power of forgetting to-morrow all the rubs of to-day, seemed now quite incapable of saving himself and his cheerfulness in the old ways, nay, had developed a capacity for sheer worry she had never seen in him before. And meanwhile, all the old gossips of the place spoke their mind freely to Catherine on the subject of the rector's looks, coupling their remarks with a variety of prescriptions, out of which Robert did sometimes manage to get one of his old laughs. His sleeplessness, too, which had always been a constitutional tendency, had become now so constant and wearing that Catherine began to feel a nervous hatred of his bookwork and of those long mornings at the hall, a passionate wish to put an end to it and carry him away for a holiday but he would not hear of the holiday, and he could hardly bear any talk of himself. And Catherine had been brought up in a school of feeling which bade love to be very scrupulous, very delicate, and which recognised in the strongest way the right of every human soul to its own privacy, its own reserves. That something definite troubled him, she was certain. What it was, he clearly avoided telling her, and she could not hurt him by impatience. He would tell her soon, when it was right, 
she cried pitifully to herself. Meantime both suffered, she not knowing why, clinging to each other the while more passionately than ever. One night, however, coming down in her dressing-gown into the study in search of a Christian year she had left behind her, she found Robert with papers strewn before him, his arms on the table, and his head laid down upon them. He looked up as she came in, and the expression of his eyes drew her to him irresistibly. "'Were you asleep, Robert? Do come to bed.' He sat up, and with a pathetic gesture held out his arms to her. She came on to his knee, putting her white arms round his neck, while he leant his head against her breast. "'Are you tired with all your walking to-day?' she said presently, a pang at her heart. "'I am tired,' he said, "'but not with walking. "'Does your book worry you? "'You shouldn't work so hard, Robert. "'You shouldn't.' "'He started. "'Don't talk of it. "'Don't let us talk or think at all. "'Only feel.' "'And he tightened his arms round her, "'happy once more for a moment "'in this environment of a perfect love. "'There was silence for a few moments, "'Catherine feeling more and more disturbed and anxious. "'Think of your mountains.' he said presently, his eyes still pressed against her, of High Fell and the moonlight and the house where Mary Backhouse died. Oh, Catherine, I see you still and shall always see you, as I saw you then, my angel of healing and of grace. I, too, have been thinking of her to-night, said Catherine softly, and of the walk to Shanmore. This evening in the garden it seemed to me as though there were Westmoreland scents in the air. I was haunted by a vision of bracken and rocks and sheep browsing up the fell slopes. "'Oh, for a breath of the wind on high fell!' cried Robert. It was so new to her, the dear voice with his accent in it of yearning depression. "'I want more of the spirit of the mountains, their serenity, their strength. Say to me that Dudden sonnet you used to say me to—' "'Say to me that Dudden sonnet you used to say to me there, "'as you said it to me that last Sunday before our wedding, "'when we walked up the Shanmore Road to say good-bye to that blessed spot. Ha! <laughs> "'How I sit and think of it sometimes, when life seems to be going crookedly, "'that rock on the fell-side where I found you and caught you "'and snared you, my dove, for ever.' "'And Catherine, whose mere voice was as balm to this man of many impulses, "'softly in the midnight silence,' those noble lines in which Wordsworth has expressed, with the reserve and yet the strength of the great poet, the loftiest yearning of the purest hearts. Enough, if something from our hand have power to live and move and serve the future hour, and if, as towards the silent tomb we go, through love, through hope and faith's transcendent dower, we feel that we are greater than we know. He has divined it all, said Robert drawing a long breath when she stopped, which seemed to relax the fibres of the inner man. The fever and the fret of human thought, the sense of littleness, of impotence, of evanescence, and he has soothed it all. "'Oh, not all, not all!' cried Catherine, her look kindling, and her rare passion breaking through. "'How little in comparison!' For her thoughts were with him, of whom it was said, "'He needeth not that any one should bear witness concerning man,' for he knew what was in man. But Robert's only response was silence, and a kind of quivering sigh. "'Robert,' she cried, pressing her cheek against his temple, "'tell me, my dear, dear husband, what it is troubles you. Something does. I am certain, certain.' "'Catherine, wife, beloved,' he said to her, after another pause, in a tone of strange tension she never forgot. Generations of men and women have known what it is to be led spiritually into the desert, into that outer wilderness where even the Lord was tempted. What am I that I should claim to escape it? And you cannot come through it with me, my darling. No, not even you. It is loneliness. It is solitariness itself. And he shuddered. But pray for me. Pray that he may be with me, and that at the end there may be light. He pressed her to him convulsively then gently released her. His solemn eyes, fixed upon her as she stood there beside him, seemed to forbid her to say a word more. She stooped. She laid her lips to his. It was a meeting of soul with soul. Then she went softly out, breaking the quiet of the house by a stifled sob as she passed upstairs. 
Oh, but at last she thought she understood him. She had not passed her girlhood, side by side with a man of delicate fibre, of melancholy and scrupulous temperament, and within hearing of all the natural interests of a deeply religious mind, religious biography, religious psychology, and, within certain sharply defined limits, religious speculation, without being brought face to face with the black possibilities of doubts and difficulties as barriers in the Christian path. Has not almost every Christian of illustrious excellence been tried and humbled by them? Catherine looked back upon her own youth, could remember certain crises of religious melancholy, during which she had often dropped off to sleep at night on a pillow wet with tears. They had passed away quickly, and for ever. But she went back to them now, straining her eyes through the darkness of her own past, recalling her father's days of spiritual depression, and the few difficult words she had sometimes heard from him as to those bitter times of religious dryness and hopelessness, by which God chastens from time to time his most faithful and heroic souls. A half-contempt awoke in her for the unclouded serenity and confidence of her own inner life. If her own spiritual experience had gone deeper, she told herself with the strangest self-blame, she would have been able now to understand Robert better, to help him more. She thought, as she lay awake after those painful moments in the study, the tears welling up slowly in the darkness, of many things that had puzzled her in the past. She remembered the book she had seen on his table. Her thoughts travelled over his months of intercourse with the squire, and the memory of Mr. Newcombe's attitude towards the man whom he conceived to be his lord's adversary, as contrasted with Robert's, filled her with a shrinking pain she dared not analyse. Still, all through, her feeling towards her husband was in the main akin to that of the English civilian at home towards English soldiers abroad, suffering and dying that England may be great. She had sheltered herself all her life from those deadly forces of unbelief which exist in English society, by a steady refusal to know what, however, any educated university man must perforce know. But such a course of action was impossible for Robert. He had been forced into the open, into the full tide of the Lord's battle. The chances of that battle are many, and the more courage, the more risk of wounds and pain. But the great captain knows. The great captain does not forget his own. For never, never had she the smallest doubt as to the issue of this sudden crisis in her husband's consciousness, even when she came nearest to apprehending its nature. As well might she doubt the return of daylight, as dream of any permanent eclipse descending upon the faith which had shone through every detail of Robert's ardent, impassive life, with all its struggles, all its failings, all its beauty, since she had known him first. The dread did not even occur to her. In her agony of pity and reverence, she thought of him as passing through a trial, which is especially the believer's trial, the chastening by which God proves the soul he loves. Let her only love and trust in patience. So that, day by day, as Robert's depression still continued, Catherine surrounded him with the tenderest and wisest affection. Her quiet common sense made itself heard, forbidding her to make too much of the change in him, which might, after all, she thought, be partly explained by the mere physical results of his long strain of body and mind during the Mile End epidemic. And for the rest, she would not argue, she would not inquire. She only prayed that she might so leave the Christian life beside him that the Lord's tenderness, the Lord's consolation, might shine upon him through her. It had never been her wont to speak to him much about his own influence, his own effect, in the parish. To the austere Christian considerations of this kind are forbidden. It is not I, but Christ that worketh in me. But now, whenever she came across any striking trace of his power over the weak or the impure, the sick or the sad, she would in some way make it known to him, offering it to him in her delicate tenderness, as though it were a gift that the father had laid in her hand for him, a token that the master was still indeed with his servant, and that all was fundamentally well. And so much, perhaps, the contact with his wife's faith, the power of her love, wrought in Robert, that during these weeks and months he also never lost his own certainty of emergence from the shadow which had overtaken him. And indeed, Driven on from day to day as he was, by an imperious intellectual thirst which would be satisfied, the religion of his heart, the imaginative emotional habit of years, that incessant drama which the soul enacts with the divine powers to which it feels itself committed, 
lived and persisted through it all. Feeling was untouched. The heart was still passionately on the side of all its old loves and adorations, still blindly trustful that in the end, by some compromise as yet unseen, they would be restored to it intact. Some time towards the end of July, Robert was coming home from the hall before lunch, tired and warm, as the morning always left him, and meditating some fresh sheets of the squire's proofs which had been in his hands that morning. On the road crossing that to the rectory, he suddenly saw Reginald Newcombe, thinner and whiter than ever, striding along as fast as cassock and cloak would let him, his eyes on the ground and his wide awake drawn over them. He and Ellesmere had scarcely met for months, and Robert had lately made up his mind that Newcombe was distinctly less friendly, and wished to show it. Ellesmere had touched his arm before Newcombe had perceived anyone near him. Then he drew back with a start. "'Ellesmere, you here. I had an idea you were away for a holiday.' "'Oh, dear, no,' said Robert, smiling. "'I may get away in September, perhaps. Not till then.' "'Mr. Wendover at home?' said the other his eyes turning to the hall, of which the chimneys were just visible from where they stood. "'No, he's abroad.' "'You and he have made friends, I understand,' said the other abruptly, his eagle look returning to Ellesmere. "'I hear of you as always together.' "'We have made friends, and we walk a great deal when the squire is here,' said Robert, meeting Newcombe's harshness of tone with a bright dignity. "'Mr. Wendover has even been doing something for us in the village. You should come and see the new institute.' The roof is on, and we shall open it in August or September. The best building of the kind in the country by far, and Mr. Wendover's gift. "'I suppose you use the library a great deal?' said Newcombe, paying no attention to these remarks, and still eyeing his companion closely. "'A great deal.' Robert had at that moment under his arm a German treatise on the history of the Logos doctrine, which afterwards, looking back on the little scene, he thought it probable Newcombe recognised. They turned towards the rectory together, Newcombe still asking abrupt questions as to the squire. The length of time he was away, Ellesmere's work, parochial and literary, during the past six months, the numbers of his Sunday congregation, of his communicants, etc. Ellesmere bore his catechism with perfect temper, though Newcombe's manner had in it a strange and almost judicial imperativeness. Ellesmere, said his questioner presently, after a pause, I go to have a retreat for priests at the clergy house next month. Father H., mentioning a famous high churchman, will conduct it. You would do me a special favour. And suddenly the face softened and shone with all its old magnetism on Ellesmere. If you would come, I believe you would find nothing to dislike in it or in our rule, which is a most simple one. Robert smiled and laid his hand on the other's arm. No, Newcombe, no. I am in no mood for H., the high churchman looked at him with a quick and painful anxiety visible in the stern eyes. "'Will you tell me what that means?' "'It means,' said Robert, clasping his hands tightly behind him, his pace slackening a little to meet that of Newcombe, "'it means that if you will give me your prayers, Newcombe, your companionship sometimes, your pity always, I will thank you from the bottom of my heart. But I am in a state just now when I must fight my battles for myself, and in God's sight only.' It was the first burst of confidence which had passed his lips to anyone but Catherine. Newcombe stood still, a tremor of strong emotion running through the emaciated face. "'You're in trouble, Ellesmere. I felt it, I knew it, when I first saw you.' "'Yes, I'm in trouble,' said Robert quietly. "'Opinions?' "'Opinions, I suppose, or facts,' said Robert, his arms dropping wearily beside him. "'Have you ever known what it is to be troubled in mind, I wonder, Newcombe?' And he looked at his companion with a sudden pitiful curiosity. A kind of flash passed over Mr. Newcombe's face. "'Have I ever known?' he repeated vaguely, and then he drew his thin hand, the hand of the ascetic and the mystic, hastily across his eyes, and was silent, his lips moving, his gaze on the ground, his whole aspect that of a man wrought out of himself by a sudden passion of memory.' Robert watched him with surprise, and was just speaking when Mr. Newcombe looked up, every drawn, attenuated feature working painfully. "'Did you never ask yourself, Ellesmere?' 
he said slowly. What it was drove me from the bar and journalism to the East End. Do you think I don't know? And his voice rose, his eyes flamed. What black devil it is that is gnawing at your heart now? Why, man, I've been through darker gulfs of hell than you have ever sounded. Many a night I have felt myself mad, mad of doubt, a castaway on a shoreless sea, doubting not only God or Christ, but myself, the soul, the very existence of good. I found only one way out of it, and you will find only one way. The little hand caught Robert's arm impetuously. The voice with this accent of fierce conviction was at his ear. Trample on yourself. Pray down the German. Fast, scourge, kill the body, that the soul may live. What are we, miserable worms, that we should defy the Most High, that you should set our wretched faculties against his omnipotence? Submit, submit, humble yourself, my brother. Fling away the freedom which is your ruin. There is no freedom for man, either a slave to Christ or a slave to his own lusts. There is no other choice. Go away. Exchange your work here for a time for work in London. You have too much leisure here. Satan has too much opportunity. I foresaw it. I foresaw it when you and I first met. I felt I had a message for you, and here I deliver it. In the Lord's name I bid you fly, I bid you yield in time. Better to be the Lord's captive than the Lord's betrayer. The wasted form was drawn up to its full height. The arm was outstretched. The long cloak fell back from it in long folds. Voice and eye were majesty itself. Robert had a tremor of responsive passion. How easy it sounded, how tempting, to cut the knot, to mutilate and starve the rebellious intellect which would assert itself against the soul's purest instincts. Newcomb had done it. Why not he? And then, suddenly, as he stood gazing at his companion, the spring sun and murmur all about them. Another face, another life, another message flashed on his inmost sense, the face and life of Henry Grey. Words torn from their context, but full for him of intensest meaning, passed rapidly through his mind. God is not wisely trusted when declared unintelligible. Such honour rooted in dishonour stands, such faith unfaithful makes us falsely true. God is for ever reason, and his communication, his revelation, is reason. He turned away with a slight sad shake of the head. The spell was broken. Mr Newcombe's arm dropped, and he moved sombrely on beside Robert, the hand which held the little book of hours against his cloak trembling slightly. At the wretched gate he stopped. Goodbye. I must go home. You won't come in. No, no, Newcombe. Believe me, I am no rash, careless egotist, risking wantonly the most precious things in life. But the call is on me, and I must follow it. All life is God's, and all thoughts, but only a fraction of it. He cannot let me wander very far. But the cold fingers he held so warmly dropped from his, and Newcombe turned away. A week afterwards, or, there, or thereabouts, Robert had in some sense followed Newcombe's counsel. Admonished perhaps by sheer physical weakness as much as by anything else, he had for the moment laid down his arms. He had yielded to an invading feebleness of the will, which refused, as it were, to carry on the struggle any longer at such a life-destroying pitch of intensity. The intellectual oppression of itself brought about wild reaction and recoil, and a passionate appeal to that inward witness of the soul which holds its own long after the reason has practically ceased to struggle. It came about in this way. One morning he stood reading in the window of the library the last of the squire's letters. It contained a short but masterly analysis of the mental habits and idiosyncrasies of St Paul, apropos of St Paul's witness to the resurrection. Every now and then, as Ellesmere turned the pages, the orthodox protest would assert itself, the orthodox arguments make themselves felt as though mechanical, involuntary protest. But their force and vitality was gone. Between the pall of Anglican theology and the fiery, fallible man of genius, so weak logically, so strong in poetry, in rhetoric, in moral passion, whose portrait has been drawn for us by a free and temperate criticism, 
the rector knew, in a sort of dull way, that his choice was made. The one picture carried reason and imagination with it, the other contented neither. But as he put down the letter, something seemed to snap within him. Some cord of physical endurance gave way. For five months he had been living intellectually at a speed no man maintains with impunity, and this letter of the squire's, with its imperious demands upon the tired, irritable brain, was the last straw. He sank down on the oriel seat, the letter dropping from his hands. Outside the little garden, now a mass of red and pink roses, the hill and the distant stretches of park were wrapped in a thick, sultry mist, through which a dim, far-off sunlight struggled on to the library floor, and lay in ghostly patches on the polished boards and lower ranges of books. The simplest religious thoughts began to flow over him. The simplest childish words of prayer were on his lips. He felt himself delivered. He knew not how or why. He rose deliberately, laid the squire's letter among his other papers, and tied them up carefully. Then he took up the books which lay piled on the squire's writing-table, all those volumes of German, French, and English criticism, liberal or apologetic, which had been accumulating round him day by day with a feverish, toilsome impartiality, and began rapidly and methodically to put them back in their places on the shelves. "'I've done too much thinking, too much reading,' he was saying to himself as he went through his task. "'Now let it be the turn of something else.' And still, as he handled the books, it was as though Catherine's figure glided backwards and forwards beside him, across the smooth floor, as though her hands were on his arm, her eyes shining into his. Ha! <laughs> he knew well what it was that had made the sharpest sting of this wrestle through which he had been passing. It was not merely religious dread, religious shame, that terror of disloyalty to the divine images which had filled the soul's inmost shrine since its first entry into consciousness, such as every good man feels in a like strait. This had been strong indeed, but men are men, and love is love. Ay, it was to the dark certainty of Catherine's misery that every advance in knowledge and intellectual power had brought him nearer. It was from that certainty that he now, and for the last time, recoiled. It was too much, it could not be borne. He walked home, counting up the engagements of the next few weeks, the school treat, two club field days, a sermon in the county town, the probable opening of the new workmen's institute, and so on. Oh, to be through them all, and away, away amid alpine scents and silences. He stood a moment beside the grey, slowly moving river, half hidden beneath the rank flower growth, the tansy and willow herb, the luxuriant elder and trailing brambles of its August banks, and thought with hungry passion of the clean-swept alpine pasture, the fir woods, and the tameless mountain streams. In three weeks or less, he and Catherine should be climbing the Jammon or the Don du Midi. Until then, he would want all his time for men and women. Books should hold him no more. Catherine only put her arms round his neck in silence when he told her. The relief was too great for words. He, too, held her close, saying nothing. But that night, for the first time for weeks, Elsmer's wife slept in peace and woke without dread of the day before her. End of Book 3, Chapter 25Book 4, Chapter 26 of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book 4, Chapter 26 The next fortnight was a time of truce. Ellesmere neither read nor reasoned. He spent his days in the school, in the village, pottering about the Mile End cottages, or the new institute, sometimes fishing, sometimes passing long summer hours on the commons with his club boys, hunting the ponds for caddises, newts, and water beetles, peering into the furze bushes for second broods, or watching the sand martins in the gravel pits, and trudging home at night in the midst of an escort of enthusiasts, all of them with pockets as full and miry as his own, to deposit the treasures of the day in the club room. Once more the rector, though physically perhaps less ardent than of yore, was the life of the party 
and a certain awe and strangeness which had developed in his boy's minds towards him during the last few weeks passed away. It was curious that in these days he would neither sit nor walk alone if he could help it. Catherine, or a stray parishioner, was almost always with him. All the while, vaguely, in the depths of consciousness, there was the knowledge that behind this piece of quiet water on which his life was now sailing there lay storm and darkness, and that in front loomed fresh possibilities of tempest. He knew, in a way, that it was a treacherous peace which had overtaken him. And yet it was peace. The pressure exerted by the will had temporarily given way, and the deepest forces of the man's being had reasserted themselves. He could feel and love and pray again, and Catherine, seeing the old glow in the eyes, the old spring in the step, made the whole of life one thank-offering. On the evening following that moment of reaction in the Muirworld Library, Robert had written to the squire. His letter had been practically a withdrawal from the correspondence. "'I find,' he wrote, "'that I have been spending too much time and energy lately on these critical matters. It seems to me that my work as a clergyman has suffered. Nor can I deny that your book and your letters have been to me a source of great trouble of mind. My heart is where it was, but my head is often confused.' Let controversy rest a while. My wife says I want a holiday. I think so myself, and we are off in three weeks. Not, however, I hope, before we have welcomed you home again and got you to open the new institute, which is already dazzling the eyes of the village by its size and splendour, and the white paint that Harris the Builder has been lavishing upon it. Ten days later, rather earlier than was expected, the squire and Mrs. Darcy were at home again. Robert re-entered the great house the morning after their arrival with a strange reluctance. Its glow and magnificence, the warm, perfumed air of the hall, brought back a sense of old oppressions, and he walked down the passage to the library with a sinking heart. There he found the squire, busy as usual, with one of those fresh cargoes of books which always accompanied him on any homeward journey. He was more brown, more wrinkled, more shrunken more full of forth, of harsh epigram, of grim anecdote, than ever. Robert sat on the edge of the table, laughing over his stories of French Orientalists, or Roman cardinals, or modern Greek professors, enjoying the impartial sarcasm which one of the greatest of savants was always ready to pour out upon his brethren of the craft. The squire, however, was never genial for a moment during the interview. He did not mention his book, nor Ellesmere's letter. But Ellesmere suspected in him a good deal of suppressed irritability, and, as after a while he abruptly ceased to talk, the visit grew difficult. The rector walked home, feeling restless and depressed. The mind had begun to work again. It was only by a great effort that he could turn his thoughts from the squire and all that the squire had meant to him during the past year, and so woo back to himself the shy bird of peace. Mr. Wendover watched the door close behind him, and then went back to his work with a gesture of impatience. "'Once a priest, always a priest. What a fool I was to forget it. You think you make an impression on the mystic, and at the bottom there is always something which defies you and common sense. Two and do do not and shall not make four, he said to himself, in a mincing voice of angry sarcasm. "'It would give me too much pain that they should.' "'Well, and so I suppose what might have been a rational friendship "'will go by the board like everything else. "'What can make the man shilly-shally in this way? "'He is convinced already, as he knows. "'Those later letters were conclusive. "'His living, perhaps, and his work. "'Not for the money's sake. "'There never was a more incredibly disinterested person born. "'But his work? "'Well, who is to hinder his work? "'Will he be the first parson in the Church of England "'who looks after the poor and holds his tongue?' If you can't speak your mind, it is something, at any rate, to possess one. Nine-tenths of the clergy be without the appendage. But Elsmere, pshaw, sure, he would go muddling on to the end of the chapter. The squire, indeed, was like a hunter whose prey escapes him at the very moment of capture, and there grew on him a mocking, aggressive mood which Elsmere often found hard to bear. One natural symptom of it was his renewed churlishness as to all local matters. Ellesmere, one afternoon, spent an hour in trying to persuade him to open the new institute. "'What on earth do you want me for?' inquired Mr. Wendover, standing before the fire in the library, the Medusa-head peering over his shoulder. "'You know perfectly well that all the gentry about here, 
I suppose you will have some of them, regard me as an old reprobate, and the poor people, I imagine, as a kind of ogre. To me it doesn't matter a tuppenny damn. I apologise. It was the Duke of Wellington's favourite standard of value. But I can't see what good it could do to either you or the village under the circumstances that I just stand on my head for the popular edification. Ellesmere, however, merely stood his ground, arguing and bantering, till the squire grudgingly gave way. This time, after he departed, Mr. Wendover, instead of going to his work, still stood gloomily ruminating in front of the fire. His frowning eyes wandered round the great room before him. For the first time he was conscious that now, as soon as the charm of Ellesmere's presence was withdrawn, his working hours were doubly solitary, that his loneliness weighed upon him more, and that it mattered to him appreciably whether that young man went or stayed. The stirring of a new sensation, however, unparalleled since the brief days when even Roger Wendover had his friends and his attractions like other men, was soon lost in renewed chafing at Ellesmere's absurdities. The squire had been at first perfectly content, so he told himself, to limit the field of their intercourse, and would have been content to go on doing so. But Ellesmere himself had invited freedom of speech between them. "'I would have given him my best,' Mr. Wendover reflected impatiently. "'I could have handed on to him all I shall never use, and he might use admirably. And now we might as well be on the terms we were to begin with, for all the good I get out of him, or he out of me. Clearly nothing but cowardice. He cannot face the intellectual challenge, and he must, I suppose, dread, lest it should affect his work. Good God, what nonsense! As if any one inquired what an English parson believed nowadays, so long as he performs all the usual antics decently. And meanwhile it never occurred to the squire that Elsmere had a wife, and a pious one. Catherine had been dropped out of his calculation as to Ellesmere's future at a very early stage. The following afternoon, Robert, coming home from a round, found Catherine out, and a note awaiting him from the hall. "'Can you and Mrs. Ellesmere come in to tea?' wrote the squire. "'Madame de Netteville is here, and one or two others.' Robert grumbled a good deal, looked for Catherine to devise an excuse for him, could not find her, and at last reluctantly set out alone. He was tired, and his mood was heavy. As he trudged through the park, he never once noticed the soft, sun-flooded distance, the shining loops of the river, the feeding deer, or any of those natural witcheries to which eye and sense were generally so responsive. The labourers going home, the children, with aprons full of crab-apples and lips dyed by the first blackberries who passed him, got but an absent smile or salute from the rector. The interval of exultation and recoil was over. The ship of the mind was once more labouring in alien and dreary seas. He roused himself to remember that he had been curious to see Madame de Netteville. She was an old friend of the squire's, the holder of a London salon, much more exquisite and select than anything Lady Charlotte could show. She had the same thing in Paris before the war, the squire explained. Renan gave me a card to her. Extraordinary woman! No particular originality, but one of the best persons to consult about ideas, like Joubert's Madame de Beaumont, I ever saw. Receptiveness itself. A beauty, too, or was once, and a bit of a sphinx, which adds to the attraction. Mystery becomes a woman vastly. One suspects her of ventures just enough to find her society doubly piquant. Vincent directed him to the upper terrace, whither tea had been taken. This terrace, which was one of the features of Muirwell, occupied the top of the yew-clothed hill on which the library looked out. Evelyn himself had planned it. Along its upper side ran one of the most beautiful of old walls, broken by niches and statues, tapestried with roses and honeysuckle, an opening in the centre to reveal Evelyn's daring conceit of all, a semicircular space holding a fountain and leading to a grotto. The grotto had been scooped out of the hill, it was peopled with dim figures of fauns and nymphs which showed white amid its moist greenery, and in front a marble silence drooped over the fountain, which held gold and silver fish in a singularly clear water. Outside ran the long stretch of level turf, edged with a jewelled rim of flowers, and as the hill fell steeply underneath, the terrace was like a high green platform raised into air, in order that a Wendover might see his domain, which from thence lay for miles spread out before him. Here, beside the fountain, were gathered the squire, 
Mrs. Darcy, Madame de Netteville, and two unknown men. One of them was introduced to Elsmere as Mr. Spooner, and recognised by him as a fellow of the Royal Society, a famous mathematician, sceptic, bon vivant, and sayer of good things. The other was a young liberal Catholic, the author of a remarkable collection of essays on medieval subjects, in which the squire, treating the man's opinions, of course, as of no account, had instantly recognised the note of the true scholar. A pale, small, hectic creature, possessed of that restless energy of mind which often goes with the heightened temperature of consumption. Robert took a seat by Madame de Netteville, whose appearance was picturesqueness itself. Her dress, a skilful mixture of black and creamy yellow, lay about her in folds, as soft, as carelessly effective as her manner. Her plumed hat shadowed a face which was no longer young in such a way as to hide all the lines possible, while the half-light brought admirably out the rich, dark smoothness of the tints, the black lustre of the eyes. A delicate blue-veined hand lay upon her knee, and Robert was conscious after ten minutes or so that all her movements, which seemed at first merely slow and languid, were in reality singularly full of decision and purpose. She was not easy to talk to on a first acquaintance. Robert felt that she was studying him, and was not so much at his ease as usual, partly owing to fatigue and mental worry. She asked him little abrupt questions about the neighbourhood, his parish, his work, in a soft tone which had, however, a distinct aloofness, even hauteur. His answers, on the other hand, were often a trifle reckless and off-hand. He was in a mood to be impatient with a mundane's languid inquiries into clerical work, and it seemed to him the squire's description had been overdone. "'So you try to civilise your peasants?' she said at last. "'Does he succeed? Is it worth while?' "'That depends upon your general ideas of what is worth while,' he answered, smiling. "'Oh, everything is worth while that passes the time,' she said hurriedly. "'The clergy of the old regime went through life half asleep. That was their way of passing it. Your way, being a modern, is to bustle and try experiments.' Her eyes, half-closed but none the less provocative, ran over Elsmere's keen face and pliant frame. An atmosphere of intellectual and social assumption in Raptor, which annoyed Robert in much the same way as Langham's philosophical airs were wont to do. He was drawn without knowing it into a match of wits, wherein his strokes, if they lacked the finish and subtlety of hers, showed certainly no lack of sharpness or mental resource. Madame de Netville's tone insensibly changed, her manner quickened, her great eyes gradually unclosed. Suddenly, as they were in the middle of a skirmish as to the reality of influence, Madame de Netfield, paradoxically maintaining that no human being had ever really converted, transformed, or convinced another, the voice of young Wishart, shrill and tremulous, rose above the general level of talk. "'I am quite ready. I am not the least afraid of a definition. Theology is organised knowledge in the field of religion, a science like any other science.' Leaning forward with his hands round his knees, and speaking with the most elegant and good-humoured sang-froid imaginable. The science of the world's ghosts. I cannot imagine any more fascinating. Well, said Madame de Netteville to Robert, with a deep breath, that was a remark to have hurled at you all at once out of doors on a summer's afternoon. Oh, Mr. Spooner, she said, raising her voice, don't play the heretic here. There is no fun in it. There are too many with you. I did not begin it, my dear madam, and your reproach is unjust. On one side of me, Archbishop Manning's Fidus Achaites, and the speaker took off his large straw hat and gracefully waved it, first to the right, then to the left. On the other, the rector of the parish. Cannon to right of me, cannon to left of me. I submit my courage is unimpeachable. He spoke with the smiling courtesy as excessive as his silky moustache, his long straw-coloured beard, and his Panama hat. Madame de Netville surveyed him with cool, critical eyes. Robert smiled slightly, acknowledged the bow, but did not speak. Mr. Wishart evidently took no heed of anything but his own thoughts. He sat bolt upright with shining, excited eyes. "'Ah, I remember that article of yours in the fortnightly. How you sceptics miss the point!' And out came a stream of argument and denunciation, which had probably lain lava-hot at the heart of the young convert for years, waiting for such a moment as this, when he had before him at close quarters two of the most famous antagonists of his faith. 
The outburst was striking, but certainly unpardonably ill-timed. Madame de Netville retreated into herself with a shrug. Robert, in whom a sore nerve had been set jarring, did his utmost to begin his talk with her again. In vain, for the squire struck in. He'd been sitting huddled together, his cynical eyes wandering from Wishart to Ellesmere, when suddenly some extravagant remark of the young Catholic, and Robert's effort to edge away from the conversation, caught his attention at the same moment. His face hardened, and in his nasal voice he dealt a swift epigram at Mr. Wishart, which for the moment left the young disputant floundering. But only for the moment. In another minute or two the argument, begun so casually, had developed into a serious trial of strength, in which the squire and young Wishart took the chief parts, while Mr. Spooner threw in a laugh and a sarcasm here and there. And as long as Mr. Wendover talked, Madame de Netville listened. Robert's restless repulsion to the whole incident, his passionate wish to escape from these phrases and illustrations and turns of argument which were also wearisomely stale and familiar to him, found no support in her. Mrs. Darcy dared not second his attempts at chat, for Mr. Wendover, on the rare occasions when he held forth, was accustomed to be listened to, and Ellesmere was of too sensitive a social fibre to break up the party by an abrupt exit, which could only have been interpreted in one way. So he stayed, and perforce listened, but in complete silence. None of Mr. Wendover's side hits touched him. Only as the talk went on, the rector in the background got paler and paler. His eyes, as they passed from the mobile face of the Catholic convert, already, for those who knew, marked with the signs of death, to the bronzed visage of the squire, grew duller, more instinct with a slowly dawning despair. Half an hour later he was once more on the road leading to the park gate. He had a vague memory that at parting the squire had shown him the cordiality of one suddenly anxious to apologise by manner, if not by word. Otherwise everything was forgotten. He was only anxious, half-dazed as he was, to make out wherein lay the vital difference between his present self and the Ellesmere who had passed along that road an hour before. He had heard a conversation on religious topics, wherein nothing was new to him, nothing affected him intellectually at all. What was there in that to break the spring of life like this? He stood still, heavily trying to understand himself. Then gradually it became clear to him. A month ago, every word of that hectic young pleader for Christ and the Christian certainties would have roused in him a leaping, passionate sympathy, a heart's yearning assent, even when the intellect was most perplexed. Now that inmost strand had given way. Suddenly the disintegrating force he had been so pitifully, so blindly holding at bay, had penetrated once for all into the sanctuary. What had happened to him had been the first real failure of feeling, the first treachery of the heart. Wishart's hopes and hatreds and sublime defiances of man's petty faculties had aroused in him no echo, no response. His soul had been dead within him. As he gained the shelter of the wooded lane beyond the gate, it seemed to Robert that he was going through, once more, that old fierce temptation of Bunyan's. For after the Lord had in this manner thus graciously delivered me, and had set me down so sweetly in the faith of his holy gospel, and had given me such strong consolation and blessed evidence from heaven, touching my interest in his love through Christ. The tempter came upon me again, and that with a more grievous and dreadful temptation than before, and that was, to sell and part with this most blessed Christ, to exchange him for the things of life, for anything. The temptation lay upon me for the space of a year, and did follow me so continually that I was not rid of it one day in a month. No, not sometimes one hour at many days together, for it did always, in almost whatever I thought, intermix itself therewith in some sort that I could neither eat my food, stoop for a pin, chop a stick, or cast mine eyes to look on this or that, but still the temptation would come, sell Christ for this, or sell Christ for that, sell him, sell him. Was this what lay before the minister of God now in this selva obscura of life? the selling of the master, of the love so sweet, the unction spiritual, for an intellectual satisfaction, the ravaging of all the fair places of the heart by an intellectual need. And still, 
through all the despair, all the revolt, all the pain, which made the summer air a darkness, and closed every sense in him to the evening beauty, he felt the irresistible march and pressure of the new instincts, the new forces, which life and thought had been calling into being. The words of St. Augustine, which he had read to Catherine, taken in a strange new sense, came back to him. Commend to the keeping of the truth whatever the truth hath given thee, and thou shalt lose nothing. Was it the summons of truth which was rending the whole nature in this way? Robert stood still, and with his hands locked behind him, and his face turned like the face of a blind man towards a world of which it saw nothing, went through a desperate catechism of himself. Do I believe in God? Surely, surely. Though he slay me, yet would I trust in him? Do I believe in Christ? Yes, in the teacher, the martyr, the symbol to us Westerns of all things heavenly and abiding, the image and pledge of the invisible life of the Spirit, with all my soul and all my mind. But in the man-god, the word from eternity, in a wonder-working Christ, in a risen and ascended Jesus, in the living intercessor and mediator for the lives of his doomed brethren? He waited, conscious that it was the crisis of his history, and there rose in him, as though articulated one by one by an audible voice, words of irrevocable meaning. Every human soul in which the voice of God makes itself felt enjoys, equally with Jesus of Nazareth, the divine sonship, and miracles do not happen. It was done. He felt for the moment as Bunyan did after his lesser defeat. Now was the battle won, and down fell I as a bird that is shot from the top of a tree into great guilt and fearful despair. Thus, getting out of my bed, I went moping in the field. But God knows, with as heavy a heart as mortal man, I think, could bear, where for the space of two hours I was like a man bereft of life. All these years of happy spiritual certainty, of rejoicing oneness with Christ, to end in this wreck and loss. Was not this indeed il gran rifiuto, the greatest of which human daring is capable? The lane darkened round him. Not a soul was in sight. The only sounds were the sounds of a gently breathing nature, sounds of birds and swaying branches and intermittent gusts of air rustling through the gorse and the drifts of last year's leaves in the wood beside him. He moved mechanically onward, and presently, after the first flutter of desolate terror had passed away, with a new inrushing sense which seemed to him a sense of liberty, of infinite expansion. Suddenly the trees before him thinned, the ground sloped away, and there to the left, on the westernmost edge of the hill, lay the square stone rectory, its windows open to the evening coolness, a white flutter of pigeons round the dovecote on the side lawn, the gold of the August wheat in the great cornfield showing against the heavy girdle of oak wood. Robert stood gazing at it, the home consecrated by love, by effort, by faith the high alternations of intellectual and spiritual debate, the strange emerging sense of deliverance, gave way to a most bitter human pang of misery. Oh, God! My wife! My work! There was a sound of a voice calling, Catherine's voice calling for him. He leant against the gate of the wood-path, struggling sternly with himself. This was no simple matter of his own intellectual consistency or happiness. Another's whole life was concerned. Any precipitate speech or hasty action would be a crime. A man is bound above all things to protect those who depend on him from his own immature or revocable impulses. Not a word yet, till this sense of convulsion and upheaval had passed away, and the mind was once more its own master. He opened the gate and went towards her. She was trailing along the path looking out for him, one delicate hand gathering up her long evening dress, that very same black brocade she had worn in the old days at Burwood, the other playing with her dandied infant puppy who was leaping beside her. As she caught sight of him, there was the flashing smile, the hurrying step, and he felt he could but just drag himself to meet her. "'Robert, how long you have been! I thought you must have stayed to dinner after all. And how tired you seem!' "'I had a long walk,' he said, catching her hand, 
as it slipped itself under his arm, and clinging to it as though to a support. "'And I am tired. There is no use whatever in denying it.' His voice was light, but if it had not been so dark, she must have been startled by his face. As they went on towards the house, however, she scolding him for overwalking, he won his battle with himself. He went through the evening so that even Catherine's jealous eyes saw nothing but extra fatigue. In the most desperate straits of life, love is still the fountain of all endurance, and if ever a man loved, it was Robert Ellesmere. But that night, as he lay sleepless in their quiet room, with the window open to the stars and to the rising gusts of wind, which blew the petals of the cluster rose outside in drifts of fair-weather snow onto the window-sill, he went through an agony which no words can adequately describe. He must, of course, give up his living and his orders. His standards and judgments had always been simple and plain in these respects. In other men it might be right and possible that they should live on in the ministry of the Church, doing the humane and charitable work of the Church, while refusing assent to the intellectual and dogmatic framework on which the Church system rests. But for himself, it would be neither right nor wrong, but simply impossible. He did not argue or reason about it. There was a favourite axiom of Mr. Gray's which had become part of his pupil's spiritual endowment, and which was perpetually present to him at this crisis of his life, in the spirit, if not in the letter. Conviction is the conscience of the mind. And with this intellectual conscience, he was no more capable of trifling than with the moral conscience. The night passed away. How the rare intermittent sounds impressed themselves upon him. The stir of the child's waking soon after midnight in the room overhead. The cry of the owls on the oakwood. The purring of the night jars on the common. The morning chatter of the swallows round the eaves. With the first invasion of the dawn, Robert raised himself and looked at Catherine. She was sleeping with that light, sound sleep which belongs to health of body and mind, one hand under her face, the other stretched out in soft relaxation beside her. Her husband hung over her in a bewilderment of feeling. Before him passed all sorts of incoherent pictures of the future. The mind was caught by all manner of incongruous details in that saddest uprooting which lay before him. How her sleep, her ignorance, reproached him. He thought of the wreck of all her pure ambitions, for him, for their common work, for the people that she had come to love. The ruin of her life of charity and tender usefulness, the darkening of all her hopes, the shaking of all her trust. Two years of devotion of exquisite self-surrender had brought her to this. It was for this he had lured her from the shelter of her hills, for this she had opened to him all her sweet stores of faith, all the deepest springs of her womanhood. Oh, how she must suffer! The thought of it and his own helplessness wrung his heart. How could he keep her love through it all? There was an unspeakable dread mingled with his grief, his remorse. It had been there for months. In her eyes would not only pain, but sin, divide them? Could he possibly prevent her whole relation to him from altering and dwindling? It was to be the problem of his remaining life. With a great cry of the soul to that God it yearned and felt for through all the darkness and ruin which encompassed it, he laid his hand on hers with the timidest passing touch. Catherine, I will make amends. My wife, I will make amends. End of Book 4, Chapter 26Chapter twenty seven of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book four, chapter twenty seven. The next morning, Catherine, finding that Robert still slept on after their usual waking time, and remembering his exhaustion of the night before, left him softly and kept the house quiet that he might not be disturbed. She was in charge of the now toddling Mary in the dining room when the door opened and Robert appeared. At sight of him she sprang up with a half-cry. The face seemed to have lost all its fresh colour, its look of sun and air. 
The eyes were sunk, the lips and chin lined and drawn. It was like a face from which the youth had suddenly been struck out. Robert! But her question died on her lips. A bad night, darling, and a bad headache, he said, groping his way, as it seemed to her, to the table, his hand leaning on her arm. Give me some breakfast. She restrained herself at once, put him into an armchair by the window, and cared for him in her tender, noiseless way. But she had grown almost as pale as he, and her heart was like lead. "'Will you send me off for the day to Thurston Ponds?' he said presently, trying to smile with lips so stiff and nerveless that the will had small control over them. "'Can you walk so far? You did overdo it yesterday, you know. You've never got over Mile End, Robert.' but her voice had a note in it which in his weakness he could hardly bear. He thirsted to be alone again, to be able to think over quietly what was best for her, for them both. There must be a next step, and in her neighbourhood he was too feeble, too tortured to decide upon it. "'No more, dear, no more,' he said impatiently, as she tried to feed him. Then he added as he rose, "'Don't make arrangements for our going next week, Catherine. It can't be so soon.' Catherine looked at him with eyes of utter dismay. The sustaining hope of all these difficult weeks, which had slipped with such terrible unexpectedness into their happy life, was swept away from her. "'Robert, you ought to go.' "'I have too many things to arrange,' he said sharply, almost irritably. Then his tone changed. "'Don't urge it, Catherine.' His eyes, in their weariness, seemed to entreat her not to argue. She stooped and kissed him, her lips trembling. "'When do you want to go to Thurston?' "'As soon as possible. Can you find me my fishing-basket and get me some sandwiches? I shall only lounge there and take it easy.' She did everything for him that wifely hands could do. Then, when his fishing-basket was strapped on and his lunch was slipped into the capacious pocket of the well-worn shooting-coat, she threw her arms round him. "'Robert, you will come away soon?' He roused himself and kissed her. "'I will.' he said simply, withdrawing, however, from her grasp, as though he could not bear those close, pleading eyes. "'Good-bye. I shall be back some time in the afternoon.' From her post beside the study window she watched him take the short cut across the cornfield. She was miserable, and all at sea. A week ago he had been so like himself again, and now? Never had she seen him in anything like this state of physical and mental collapse. "'Oh, Robert!' she cried under her breath, with an abandonment like a child's, strong soul that she was. "'Why won't you tell me, dear? Why won't you let me share? I might help you through. I might.' She supposed he must be again in trouble of mind. A weaker woman would have implored, tormented, till she knew all. Catherine's there is strength and delicacy of nature, and that respect which was inbred in her for the sacra of the inner life stood in her way. She could not catechise him and force his confidence on this subject of all others. It must be given freely. And, oh, it was so long in coming! Surely, surely it must be mainly physical, the result of overstrain, expressing itself in characteristic mental worry, just as daily life reproduces itself in dreams. The worldly man suffers at such times through worldly things, the religious man through his religion. Comforting herself a little with thoughts of this kind, and with certain more or less vague preparations for departure, Catherine got through the morning as best she might. Meanwhile, Robert was trudging along to Thurston, under a sky which, after a few threatening showers, promised once more to be a sky of intense heat. He had with him all the tackle necessary for spooning pike, a sport the novelty and success of which had hugely commended it the year before to those Esau-like instincts Muirworld had so much developed in him. And now, oh, the weariness of the August warmth and the long stretches of sandy road! By the time he reached the ponds he was tired out. But instead of stopping at the largest of the three, where a picturesque group of old brick cottages brought a reminder of man and his works into the prairie solitude of the common, he pushed on to a smaller pond just beyond, now hidden in a green cloud of birchwood. Here, after pushing his way through the closely set trees, he made some futile attempts at fishing, only to put up his rod long before the morning was over, and lay it beside him on the bank. 
and there he sat for hours, vaguely watching the reflection of the clouds, the gambols and quarrels of the waterfowl, the ways of the birds, the alternations of sun and shadow on the softly moving trees, the real self of him passing all the while through an interminable inward drama, starting from the past, stretching to the future, steeped in passion, in pity, in regret. He thought of the feelings with which he had taken orders, of Oxford scenes and Oxford persons, of the efforts, the pains, the successes of his first year at Muirville. What a ghastly mistake it had all been! He felt a kind of sore contempt for himself, for his own lack of prescience, of self-knowledge. His life looked to him so shallow and worthless. How does a man ever retrieve such a false step? He groaned aloud as he thought of Catherine, linked to one born to defeat her hopes, and all that natural pride that a woman feels in the strength and consistency of the man she loves. As he sat there by the water, he touched the depths of self-humiliation. As to religious belief, everything was a chaos. What might be to him the ultimate forms and conditions of thought, the tired mind was quite incapable of divining. To every stage in the process of destruction it was feverishly alive. But its formative energy was for the moment gone. The foundations were swept away, and everything must be built up afresh. Only the habit of faith held, the close instinctive clinging to a power beyond sense, a goodness, a will, not man's. The soul had been stripped of its old defences, but at his worst there was never a moment when Ellesmere felt himself utterly forsaken. But his people, his work, every now and then into the fragmentary debate still going on within him, there would flash little pictures of Muirwell. The green with the sun on the house-fronts, the awning over the village shop, the vane on the old manor-house, the familiar figures at the doors, his church, with every figure in the Sunday congregation as clear to him as though he were there that moment in the pulpit. The children he had taught, the sick he had nursed, this or that weather-beaten or brutalised peasant whose history he knew, whose tragic secrets he had learnt. All these memories and images clung about him as though with ghostly hands, asking, Why would you desert us? You are ours. Stay with us. Then his thoughts would run over the future, dwelling with a tense, realistic sharpness on every detail which lay before him, the arrangements with his locum tenens, the interview with the bishop, the parting with the rectory. It even occurred to him to wonder what must be done with Martha and his mother's cottage. His mother! As he thought of her, a wave of unutterable longing rose and broke. The difficult tears stood in his eyes. He had a strange conviction of that at this crisis of his life she of all human beings would have understood him best. When would the squire know? He pictured the interview with him, divining with the same abnormal clearness of inward vision Mr. Wendover's start of mingled triumph and impatience, triumph in the new recruit, impatient with the quixotic folly which could lead a man to look upon orthodox dogma as a thing real enough to be publicly renounced, or clerical pledges as more than a form of words. So henceforth he was on the same side with the squire, held by an indiscriminating world as bound to the same negations, the same hostilities. The thought roused in him a sudden fierceness of moral repugnance. The squire and Edward Langham, they were the only sceptics of whom he had ever had close and personal experience. And with all his old affection for Langham, all his frank sense of pliancy in the squire's hands, yet in this strait of life how he shrinks from them both. Souls at war with life and man, without holiness, without perfume. Is it the law of things? Once loosen a man's religio, once fling away the old binding elements, the old traditional restraints which have made him what he is, a moral deterioration is certain. How often had he heard it said? How often he had endorsed it? Is it true? His heart grows cold within him. What good man can ever contemplate with patience the loss, not of friends or happiness, but of his best self? What shall it profit a man, indeed, if he gain the whole world? the whole world of knowledge and speculation, and lose his own soul. And then, for his endless comfort, 
there rose on the inward eye the vision of an Oxford lecture-room, of a short, sturdy figure, of a great brow over honest eyes, of words alive with moral passion, of thought instinct with the beauty of holiness. Thank God for the saint in Henry Gray. Thinking of it, Robert felt his own self-respect reborn. Oh, to see Gray in the flesh, to get his advice, his approval! Even though it was the depth of vacation, Gray was so closely connected with the town, as distinguished from the university life of Oxford, it might be quite possible to find him at home. Elsmere suddenly determined to find out at once if he could be seen, and if so, he would go over to Oxford at once. This should be the next step, and he would say nothing to Catherine till afterwards. He felt himself so dull, so weary, so resourceless. Gray should help and counsel him, should send him back with a clearer brain, a quicker ingenuity of love, better furnished against her pain and his own. Then everything else was forgotten, and he thought of nothing but that grisly moment of waking in the empty room, when, still believing at night, he had put out his hand for his wife, and with a superstitious pang had felt himself alone. His heart torn with a hundred inarticulate cries of memory and grief, he sat on beside the water, unconscious of the passing of time, his grey eyes staring sightlessly at the wood-pigeons as they flew past him, at the occasional flash of a kingfisher, at the moving panorama of summer clouds above the trees opposite. At last he was startled back to consciousness by the fall of a few heavy drops of warm rain. He looked at his watch. It was nearly four o'clock. He rose, stiff and cramped with sitting, and at the same instant he saw beyond the birchwood on the open stretch of common a boy's figure, which, after a step or two, he recognised as Ned Irwin. "'You here, Ned?' he said, stopping, the pastoral temper in him reasserting itself at once. "'Why aren't you harvesting?' "'Please, sir, I've finished with the whole meadows yesterday, and Mr. Carter's job don't begin till tomorrow. He's got a machine coming from Whitley, he have, and they won't let him have it till Thursday, so I've been out after things for the club.' And opening the tin box strapped on his back, he showed the day's capture of butterflies, and some belated bird's eggs, the plunder of a bit of common where the turf for the winter's burning was just being cut. "'Goatsucker, linnet, stone chat said the rector, fingering them. "'Well done for August, Ned. If you haven't got anything better to do with them, give them to that small boy of Mr. Carter's that's been ill so long. He'd thank you for them, I know.' The lad nodded with a guttural sound of assent. Then his new-born scientific ardour seemed to struggle with his rustic costiveness of speech. "'I've been just watching a queer creature,' he said at last hurriedly. "'I believe he's that'n.' And he pulled out a well-thumbed handbook and pointed to a cut of the grasshopper warbler. "'Whereabouts?' asked Robert, wondering the while at his own start of interest. "'In that bit of common to other side of the big pond,' said Ned, pointing, his brick-red countenance kindling into suppressed excitement. "'Come and show me,' said the rector, and the two went off together. And sure enough, after a little beating about, they heard the note which had roused to the lad's curiosity, the loud whir of a creature that should have been a grasshopper, and was not. They stalked the bird a few yards, stooping and crouching, Robert's eager hand on the boy's arm, whenever the clumsy rustic movements made too much noise among the underwood. They watched it, uttering its jarring, imitative note on bush after bush, just dropping to the ground as they came near, and flitting a yard or two farther, but otherwise showing no sign of alarm at their presence. Then suddenly the impulse which had been leading him on died in the rector. He stood upright with a long sigh. "'I must go home, Ned,' he said abruptly. "'Where are you off to?' "'Please, sir, my is my sister at the cottage. Her is married Jim, the underkeeper. I've been going there for me tea.' "'Come along, then. We can go together.' They trudged along in silence. Presently Robert turned on his companion. "'Ned, this natural history has been a fine thing for you, my lad. Mind you stick to it. That and good work will make a man of you. When I go away—' The boy started and stopped dead, his dumb animal eyes fixed on his companion. "'You know I shall soon be going off on my holiday,' said Robert, smiling faintly, adding hurriedly as the boy's face resumed its ordinary expression— but some day, Ned, I shall go for good. I don't know whether you've been depending on me, you and some of the others. I think perhaps you have. If so, 
don't depend on me, Ned, any more. It must all come to an end. Everything must. Everything, except the struggle to be a man in the world and not a beast, to make one's heart clean and soft and not hard and vile. That is the one thing that matters, and lasts. Never forget that, Ned. Never forget it. He stood still, towering over the slouching, thick-set form beside him, his pale intensity of look giving a rare dignity and beauty to the face which owed so little of its attractiveness to comeliness of feature. He had the makings of a true shepherd of men, and his mind as he spoke was crossed by a hundred different currents of feeling, bitterness, pain, and yearning unspeakable. No man could feel the wrench that lay before him more than he. Ned Irwin said not a word. His heavy lids were dropped over his deep-set eye. He stood motionless, nervously fiddling with his butterfly net. Awkwardness, and, as it seemed, irresponsiveness in his whole attitude. Robert gathered himself together. "'Well, good night, my lad,' he said with a change of tone. "'Good luck to you. Be off to your tea.' And he turned away, striding swiftly over the short, burnt August grass in the direction of the Muirwell Woods, which rose in a blue haze of heat against the slumberous afternoon sky. He had not gone a hundred yards before he heard a clattering after him. He stopped, and Ned came up with him. "'They're heavy, them things,' said the boy, desperately blurting it out, and pointing, with heaving chest and panting breath, to the rod and basket. "'I'm going that way. I can leave them at the rectory.' Robert's eyes gleamed. "'They're no weight, Ned. Cause why, I've been lazy and caught no fish.' But there. After a moment's hesitation, he slipped off the basket and rod, and put them into the begrimed hand held out for them. "'Bring them when you like. I don't know when I shall want them again. Thank you, and God bless you.' The boy was off with his booty in a second. "'Perhaps he'd like to think it did it for me, by and by,' said Robert sadly to himself, moving on a little moisture in the clear grey eye. About three o'clock next day, Robert was in Oxford. The night before he had telegraphed to ask if Gray was at home. The reply had been, "'Here for a week on way north. Come by all means.' Oh, that look of Catherine's when he had told her of his plan, trying in vain to make it look merely casual and ordinary. "'It's more than a year since I've set eyes on Gray, Catherine, and the day's change would be a boon. I could stay the night at Merton and get home early next day.' But as he turned a pleading look on her, he had been startled by the sudden rigidity of face and form. Her silence had in it an intense, almost a haughty, reproach, which he was too keenly hurt to put into words. He caught her by the arm and drew her forcibly to him. There he made her look into the eyes which were full of nothing but the most passionate, imploring affection. "'Have patience a little more, Catherine,' he just murmured. "'Oh, how I have blessed you for silence!' "'Only till I come back.' "'Till you come back,' she repeated slowly. "'I cannot bear it any longer, Robert, that you should give others your confidence, and not me.' He groaned and let her go. No, there should be but one day more of silence, and that day was interposed for her sake. If Gray, from his calmer standpoint, bade him wait and test himself before taking any irrevocable step, he would obey him, and if so, the worst pang of all need not yet be inflicted on Catherine, though as to his state of mind he would be perfectly open with her. A few hours later his cab deposited him at the well-known door. It seemed to him that he and the scorched plane trees lining the side of the road were the only living things in the wide, sun-beaten street. Every house was shut up. Only the greys' open windows, amid their shuttered neighbours, had a friendly human air. Yes, Mr. Gray was in, and expecting Mr. Ellesmere. Robert climbed the dim, familiar staircase, his heart beating fast. Ellesmere, this is a piece of good fortune. And the two men, after a grasp of the hand, stood fronting each other. Mr. Gray, a light of pleasure on the rugged, dark, complexioned face, looking up at his taller and paler visitor. But Robert could find nothing to say in return and in an instant Mr. Gray's quick eyes detected the strained, nervous emotion of the man before him. "'Come and sit down, Ellesmere. There, in the window, where we can talk. One has to live on this east side of the house this weather.' "'In the first place,' said Mr. Gray, scrutinising him, 
as he returned to his own book-littered corner of the window-seat. "'In the first place, my dear fellow, I can't congratulate you on your appearance. I never saw a man look in worse condition to be up and about.' Well, "'That's nothing,' said Robert, almost impatiently. "'I want a holiday, I believe.' "'Gray,' and he looked nervously out over garden and apple-trees, "'I have come, very selfishly, to ask your advice, to throw a trouble upon you, to claim all your friendship can give me.' He stopped. Mr. Gray was silent, his expression changing instantly, the bright eyes profoundly, anxiously attentive. "'I have just come to the conclusion,' said Robert, after a moment, with quick abruptness, that I ought now, at this moment, to leave the church, and give up my living, for reasons which I will describe to you. But before I act on the conclusion, I wanted the light of your mind upon it, seeing that, that other persons than myself are concerned. "'Give up your living?' echoed Mr. Gray, in a low voice of astonishment. He sat looking at the face and figure of the man before him, with a half-frowning expression. How often Robert had seen some rash, exuberant youth quelled by that momentary frown! Essentially conservative, as was the inmost nature of the man, for all his radicalism there were few things for which Henry Gray felt more instinctive distaste than for unsteadiness of will and purpose, however glorified by fine names. Robert knew it, and strangely enough felt for a moment in the presence of the heretical tutor as a culprit before a judge. "'It is, of course, a matter of opinions,' he said with an effort. "'Do you remember, before I took orders, asking whether I ever had difficulties, and I told you that I had probably never gone deep enough? It was profoundly true, though I didn't really mean it. But this year, no, no, I have not been merely vain and hasty. I may be a shadow creature, but it has been natural growth, not wantonness.' And at last his eyes met Mr. Gray's firmly, almost with solemnity. It was as if, in the last few moments, he had been instinctively testing the quality of his own conduct and motives by the touchstone of the rare personality beside him, and they had stood the trial. There was such pain, such sincerity, above all such freedom from littleness of soul, implied in words and look, that Mr. Gray quickly held out his hand. Robert grasped it, and felt that the way was clear before him. "'Will you give me an account of it?' said Mr. Gray and his tone was grave sympathy itself. "'Or would you rather confine yourself to generalities and accomplished facts?' "'I will try and give you an account of it,' said Robert, and sitting there with his elbows on his knees, his gaze fixed on the yellowing afternoon sky and the intricacies of the garden walls between them and the new museum, he went through the history of the last two years. He described the beginnings of his historical work, the gradual enlargement of the mind's horizons, and the intrusion within them of question after question, and subject after subject. Then he mentioned the squire's name. "'Ah!' exclaimed Mr. Gray. "'I have forgotten you were that man's neighbour. I wonder he didn't set you against the whole business, inhuman old cynic!' He spoke with the strong dislike of the idealist, devoted in practice to an everyday ministry to human need for the intellectual egotist. Robert caught and relished the old pugnacious flash in the eye, the midland strength of accent. Cynic he is, not altogether inhuman, I think. I fought him about his drains and his cottages, however, and he smiled sadly, before I began to read his books. But the man's genius is incontestable, his learning enormous. He found me in a susceptible state, and I recognise that his influence immensely accelerated a process already begun. Mr. Gray was struck with the simplicity and fullness of the avowal. A lesser man would hardly have made it in the same way. Rising to pace up and down the room, the familiar action recalling vividly to Robert the Sunday afternoons of bygone years, he began to put questions with a clearness and decision that made them so many guides to the man answering through the tangle of his own recollections. "'I see,' said the tutor at last, his hands in the pockets of his short grey coat, his brow bent and thoughtful. "'Well, the process in you has been the typical process of the present day. Abstract thought has had little or nothing to say to it. It has all been a question of literary and historical evidence. I am old-fashioned enough,' and he smiled, "'to stick to the a priori impossibility of miracles. But then I am a philosopher. 
you've come to see how a miracle is manufactured, to recognise in it merely a natural, inevitable outgrowth of human testimony in its pre-scientific stages. It has been all experimental, inductive. I imagine, he looked up, you didn't get much help out of the orthodox apologists. Robert shrugged his shoulders. It often seemed to me, he said drearily, I might have got through, but for the men whose books I used to read and respect most in old days. The point of view is generally so extraordinarily limited. Wesker, for instance, who means so much nowadays to the English religious world, first isolates Christianity from all the other religious phenomena of the world, and then argues upon its details. We might as well isolate English jurisprudence and discuss its details without any reference to Teutonic custom or Roman law. You may be as logical or as learned as you like, within the limits chosen, but the whole result is false. You treat Christian witness and biblical literature as you would treat no other witness, and no other literature in the world, and you cannot show cause enough. But so you go on arguing in a circle, ad infinitum. But his voice dropped. The momentary eagerness died away as quickly as it had risen, leaving nothing but depression behind it. Mr. Gray meditated. At last he said, with a delicate change of tone, "'And now, if I may ask it, Elsmere, how far has this destructive process gone?' "'I can't tell you,' said Robert, turning away almost with a groan. "'I only know that the things I loved once I love still, and that, that if I had the heart to think at all I should see more of God in the world than I ever saw before.' The tutor's eyes flashed. Robert had gone back to the window and was miserably looking out. After all, he had told only half his story. "'And so you feel you must give up your living?' "'What else is there for me to do?' cried Robert, turning upon him, startled by the slow, deliberate tone. "'Well, of course, you know that there are many men, men with whom both you and I are acquainted, who hold very much what I imagine your opinions now are, or will settle into, who were still in the Church of England, doing admirable work there. "'I know,' said Elsmere quickly. "'I know. I cannot conceive it, nor could you. Imagine standing up Sunday after Sunday to say the things you do not believe, using words as a convention which those who hear you receive as literal truth, and trusting the maintenance of your position either to your neighbour's forbearance or to your own powers of evasion. With the ideas at present in my head, Nothing would induce me to preach another Easter-day sermon to a congregation that have both a moral and a legal right to demand from me an implicit belief in the material miracle. Yes, said the other gravely. Yes, I believe you are right. It can't be said that the broad church movement has helped us much. How greatly it promised! How little it has performed! For the private person, the worshipper, it is different. Or I think so. No man pries into our prayers, and to cut ourselves off from common worship is to lose that fellowship which is in itself a, a witness and vehicle of God. But his tone had grown hesitating and touched with melancholy. There was a moment's silence. Then Robert walked up to him again. At the same time, he said falteringly, standing before the elder man, as he might have stood as an undergraduate, let me not be rash. If you think this change has been too rapid to last, if you know me better than at this moment I can know myself, if you bid me wait a while before I take any overt step, I will wait. Oh, God knows I will wait. My wife— And his husky voice failed him utterly. Your wife? cried Mr. Gray, startled. Mrs. Elsmere does not know. My wife knows nothing, or almost nothing and it will break her heart." He moved hastily away again, and stood with his back to his friend, his tall, narrow form outlined against the window. Mr. Gray was left in dismay, rapidly turning over the impressions of Catherine left on him by his last year's sight of her. That pale, distinguished woman, with her look of strength and character, he remembered Langham's analysis of her, and of the silent religious intensity she brought with her from her training among the northern hills. Was there a bitterly human tragedy preparing under all this thought drama he'd been listening to? Deeply moved, he went up to Robert, 
and laid his rugged hand almost timidly upon him. Elsmere, it won't break her heart. You are a good man. She is a good woman. What an infinity of meaning there was in the simple words. Take courage. Tell her at once. Tell her everything. And let her decide whether there shall be any waiting. I cannot help you there. She can. She will probably understand you better than you understand yourself. He tightened his grasp, and gently pushed his guest into a chair beside him. Robert was deadly pale, his face quivering painfully. The long physical strain of the past months had weakened for the moment all the controlling forces of the will. Mr. Gray stood over him, the whole man dilating, expanding, under a tyrannous stress of feeling. "'It is hard. It is bitter,' he said slowly, with a wonderful manly tenderness. "'I know it. I have gone through it. So has many and many a poor soul that you and I have known. But there need be no sting in the wound, unless we ourselves envenom it. I know, oh, I know very well, the man of the world scoffs. But to him who has once been a Christian of the old sort, the parting with the Christian mythology is the rending asunder of bones and marrow. It means parting with half the confidence, half the joy of life. But take heart and the tone grew more solemn, still more penetrating. It is the education of God. Do not imagine it will put you farther from him. He is in criticism, in science, in doubt, so long as the doubt is a pure and honest doubt, as yours is. He is in all life, in all thought. The thought of man, as it has shaped itself in institutions, in philosophies, in science, in patient critical work, or in the life of charity, is the one continuous revelation of God. Look for him in it all. See how, little by little, the divine indwelling force, using as its tools, but merely as its tools, man's physical appetites and conditions, has built up conscience and the moral life. Think how every faculty of the mind has been trained in turn to take its part in the great work of faith upon the visible world. Love and imagination built up religion. Shall reason destroy it? No, reason is God's like the rest. Trust it, trust him. The needing strings of the past are dropping from you, they are dropping from the world, not wantonly or by chance, but in the providence of God. Learn the lesson of your own pain. Learn to seek God, not in any single event of past history, but in your own soul in the constant verifications of experience, in the life of Christian love. Spiritually, you've gone through the last wrench, I promise it to you. You being what you are, nothing can cut this ground from under your feet. Whatever may have been the forms of human belief, faith, the faith which saves, has always been rooted here. All things change, creeds and philosophies and outward systems. But God remains. Life that in me has rest, as I, undying life, have power in thee. The lines dropped with low vibrating force from lips unaccustomed indeed to such an outburst. The speaker stood a moment longer in silence beside the figure in the chair, and it seemed to Robert, gazing at him with fixed eyes, that the man's whole presence, at once so homely and so majestic, was charged with benediction. It was as though invisible hands of healing and consecration had been laid upon him. The fiery soul beside him had kindled anew the drooping life of his own. So the torch of God passes on its way, hand reaching out to hand. He bent forward, stammering incoherent words of assent and gratitude, he knew not what. Mr. Gray, who had sunk into his chair, gave him time to recover himself. The intensity of the tutor's own mood relaxed, and presently he began to talk to his guest in a wholly different tone, of the practical detail of the step before him, supposing it to be taken immediately, discussing the probable attitude of Robert's bishop, the least conspicuous mode of withdrawing from the living, and so on. All with gentleness and sympathy indeed, but with an indefinable change of manner, which showed that he felt it were well both for himself and Elsmere to repress any further expression of emotion. There was something, 
a vein of stoicism, perhaps, in Mr. Gray's temper of mind, which, while it gave a special force and sacredness to his rare moments of fervent speech, was wont in general to make men more self-controlled than usual in his presence. Robert felt now the bracing force of it. "'Will you stay with us to dinner?' Mr. Gray asked, when at last Ellesmere got up to go. "'There are one or two lone fellows coming. Ask before your telegram came, of course. Do exactly as you like.' "'I think not,' said Robert, after a pause. "'I longed to see you, but I am not fit for general society.' Mr. Gray did not press him. He rose and went with his visitor to the door. "'Good-bye. Good-bye. Let me always know what I can do for you. And your wife. Poor thing. Poor thing. Go and tell her, Ellesmere. Don't lose a moment you can help. God help her, and you.' They grasped each other's hands. Mr. Gray followed him down the stairs and along the narrow hall. He opened the hall door and smiled a last smile of encouragement and sympathy into the eyes that expressed such a young, moved gratitude. The door closed. Little did Ellesmere realise that never, in his life, would he see that smile or hear that voice again. End of Book Four, Chapter Twenty Seven Book Four, Chapter Twenty Eight of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Four, Chapter Twenty Eight. In half an hour from the time Mr. Gray's door closed upon him, Ellesmere had caught a convenient cross country train and had left the Oxford towers and spires, the shrunken summer Isis, and the flat, hot river meadows far behind him. He had meant to stay at Merton, as we know, for the night. Now his one thought was to get back to Catherine. The urgency of Mr. Gray's words was upon him, and love had a miserable pang that it should have needed to be urged. By eight o'clock he was again at Churton. There were no carriages waiting at the little station, but the thought of the walk across the darkening common through the August moonrise had been a refreshment to him in the heat and crowd of the train. He hurried through the small town, where the streets were full of summer idlers and the lamps were twinkling in the still balmy air, along a dusty stretch of road, leaving man and his dwellings farther and farther to the rear of him, till at last he emerged on a boundless tract of common and struck to the right into a cart-track leading to Muirwell. He was on the top of a high sandy ridge, looking west and north, over a wide evening world of heather and wood and hill. To the right, far ahead, across the misty lower grounds into which he was soon to plunge, rose the woods of Muirwell, black and massive in the twilight distance. To the left, but on a nearer plain, the undulating common stretching downwards from where he stood rose suddenly towards a height crowned with a group of gaunt and jagged firs, landmarks for all the plain, of which every ghostly bough and crest was now sharply outlined against a luminous sky. For the white heaven in front of him was still delicately glowing in all its underparts with soft harmonies of dusky red or blue, while in its higher zone the same tract of sky was closely covered with the finest network of pearl-white cloud, suffused at the moment with a silver radiance so intense that a spectator might almost have dreamed the moon had forgotten its familiar place of rising and was about to mount into a startled expectant west. Not a light in all the wide expanse, and for a while not a sound of human life save the beat of Robert's step or the occasional tap of his stick against the pebbles of the road. Presently he reached the edge of the ridge, whence the rough track he was following sank sharply to the lower levels. Here was a marvellous point of view, and the rector stood a moment beside a bare, weather-blasted fir, a ghostly shadow thrown behind him. All around the gorse and heather seemed still radiating light, as though the air had been so drenched in sunshine that even long after the sun had vanished the invading darkness found itself still unable to win firm possession of earth and sky. Every little stone in the sandy road was still weirdly visible. The colour of the heather, now in lavish bloom, could be felt, though hardly seen. Before him melted line after line of woodland, broken by hollow after hollow, filled with vaporous wreaths of mist. About him were the sounds of a wild nature. The air was resonant with the purring of the night-jars, 
and every now and then he caught the loud clap of their wings as they swayed unsteadily through the firs and bracken. Overhead a trio of wild ducks flew across from pond to pond, their hoarse cry descending through the darkness. The partridges on the hill called to each other, and certain sharp sounds betrayed to the solitary listener the presence of a flock of swans on a neighbouring pool. The rector felt himself alone on a wide earth. It was almost with a start of pleasure that he caught at last the barking of dogs on a few distant farms, or the dim, thunderous rush of a train through the wide wooded landscape beyond the heath. Behind that frowning mass of wood lay the rectory. The lights must be lit in the little drawing-room. Catherine must be sitting by the lamp, her fine head bent over book or work, grieving for him, perhaps, her anxious, expectant heart going out to him through the dark. He thinks of the village lying wrapped in the peace of the August night, the lamp-rays from shop-front or casement streaming out onto the green. He thinks of his child, of his dead mother, feeling heavy and bitter within him all the time the message of separation and exile. But his mood was no longer one of mere dread, of helpless pain, of miserable self-scorn. Contact with Henry Gray had brought him that rekindling of the flame of conscience, that medicinal stirring of the soul's waters, which is the most precious boon that man can give to man. In that sense which attaches to every successive resurrection of our best life from the shades of despair or selfishness, he had, that day, almost that hour, been born again. He was no longer filled mainly with the sense of personal failure, with scorn for his own blundering, impetuous temper, so lacking in prescience and in balance, or in respect to his wife with such an anguished, impotent remorse. He was nerved and braced. Whatever oscillations the mind might go through in its search for another equilibrium, to-night there was a moment of calm. The earth to him was once more full of God, existence full of value. "'The things I have always loved, I love still,' he had said to Mr. Gray. And in this healing darkness it was as if the old loves, the old familiar images of thought, returned to him new-clad, re-entering the desolate heart in a white-winged procession of consolation. On the heath beside him the Christ stood once more, and as the disciple felt the sacred presence, he could bear for the first time to let the chafing, pent-up current of love flow into the new channels, so painfully prepared for it by the toil of thought. Either God or an impostor. What scorn the heart, the intellect, threw on the alternative! not in the dress of speculations which represent the product of long-past, long-superseded looms of human thought, but in the guise of common manhood, laden like his fellows with the pathetic weight of human weakness and human ignorance, the master moves towards him. Like you, my son, I struggled and I prayed. Like you, I had my days of doubt and nights of wrestling. I had my dreams, my delusions, with my fellows. I was weak, I suffered, I died. But God was with me, and the courage, the patience, the love he gave to me, the scenes of the poor human life he inspired, have become by his will the world's eternal lesson, man's primer of divine things, hung high in the eyes of all, simple and wise, that all may see and all may learn. Take it to your heart again, that life, that pain of mine. Use it to new ends, apprehend it in new ways, but knowledge shall not take it from you. And love, instead of weakening or forgetting, if it be but faithful, shall find ever fresh power of realising and renewing itself. So said the vision, and carrying the passion of it deep in his heart, the rector went his way, down the long stony hill, past the solitary farm amid the trees at the foot of it, across the grassy common beyond, with its sentinel clumps of beeches, past an ethereal string of tiny lakes just touched by the moonrise beside some of the first cottages of Muirwell, up the hill, with pulse beating and step quickening, and round into the stretch of road leading to his own gate. As soon as he had passed the screen made by the shrubs on the lawn, he saw it all as he had seen it in his waking dream on the common. The lamplight, the open windows, the white muslin curtains swaying a little in the soft evening air, and Catherine's figure seen dimly through them. The noise of the gate, however, of the steps on the drive, had startled her. He saw her rise quickly from her low chair, put some work down beside her, and move in haste to the window. 
"'Robert!' she cried in amazement. "'Yes,' he answered, still some yards from her, his voice coming strangely to her out of the moonlit darkness. "'I did my errand early. I found I could get back, and here I am.' She flew to the door, opened it, and felt herself caught in his arms. "'Robert, you're quite damp,' she said, fluttering and shrinking, for all her sweet habitual gravity of manner. Was it the passion of that yearning embrace? "'Have you walked?' "'Yes, it's the dew on the common, I suppose. The grass was drenched.' "'Will you have some food? They can bring back the supper directly.' "'I don't want any food now,' he said, hanging up his hat. "'I got some lunch in town, and a cup of soup at Reading coming back. Perhaps you will give me some tea soon. Not yet.' He came up to her, pushing back the thick, disordered locks of hair from his eyes with one hand, the other held out to her. As he came under the light of the hall lamp, she was so startled by the grey pallor of the face that she caught hold of his outstretched hand with both hers. What she said he never knew. Her look was enough. He put his arm round her, and as he opened the drawing-room door, holding her pressed against him, she felt the desperate agitation in him, penetrating, beating against an almost iron self-control of manner. He shut the door behind him. "'Robert, dear Robert,' she said, clinging to him, "'there is bad news. Tell me, there is something to tell me.' "'What is it? What is it?' It was almost like a child's wail. His brow contracted still more painfully. "'My darling,' he said, "'my darling, my dear, dear wife.' And he bent his head down to her as she lay against his breast, kissing her hair with a passion of pity, of remorse, of tenderness, which seemed to rend his whole nature. "'Tell me, tell me, Robert.' He guided her gently across the room, past the sofa over which her work lay scattered, past the flower-table, now a many-coloured mass of roses which was her especial pride, past the remains of a brick castle which had delighted Mary's wandering eyes and mischievous fingers an hour or two before, to a low chair by the open window looking on the wide, moonlit expanse of cornfield. He put her into it, walked to the window on the other side of the room, shut it, and drew down the blind. Then he went back to her, and sank down beside her, kneeling, her hands in his. "'My dear wife, you have loved me. You do love me?' She could not answer. She could only press his hands with her cold fingers, with a look and gesture that implored him to speak. "'Catherine,' he said, still kneeling before her, "'you remember that night you came down to me in the study, the night I told you I was in trouble and you could not help me?' "'Did you guess, from what I said, what the trouble was?' "'Yes,' she answered, trembling. "'Yes, I did, Robert. I thought you were depressed, troubled, about religion.' "'And I know,' he said, with an outburst of feeling, kissing her hands as they lay in his, "'I know very well that you went upstairs and prayed for me, my white-souled angel.' But, Catherine, the trouble grew. It got blacker and blacker. You were there beside me. You could not help me.' I dared not tell you about it. I could only struggle on alone, so terribly alone, sometimes. And now I am beaten. Beaten. And I come to you to ask you to help me in the only thing that remains to me. Help me, Catherine, to be an honest man, to follow conscience, to say and do the truth. Robert, she said piteously, deadly pale, I don't understand. Oh, my poor darling! he cried with a kind of moan of pity and misery. Then, still holding her, he said, with strong, deliberate emphasis, looking into the grey-blue eyes, the quivering face so full of austerity and delicacy, "'For six or seven months, Catherine, really for much longer, though I never knew it, I have been fighting with doubt, doubt of orthodox Christianity, doubt of what the Church teaches, of what I have to say and preach every Sunday.' First it crept on me, I knew not how. Then the weight grew heavier, and I began to struggle with it. I felt I must struggle with it. Many men, I suppose, in my position, would have trampled on their doubts, would have regarded them as sin in themselves, would have felt it their duty to ignore them as much as possible, trusting to time and God's help. I could not ignore them. The thought of questioning the most sacred beliefs that you and I— and his voice faltered a moment— held in common was misery to me. 
On the other hand, I knew myself. I knew that I could no more go on living to any purpose, with the whole region of the mind shut up, as it were, barred away from the rest of me, than I could go on living with a secret between myself and you. I could not hold my faith by a mere tenure of tyranny and fear. Faith that is not free, that is not the faith of the whole creature, body, soul, and intellect, seemed to me a faith worthless both to God and man. Catherine looked at him, stupefied. The world seemed to be turning round her. Infinitely more terrible than his actual words was the accent running through words and tone and gesture, the accent of irreparableness, as of something dismally done and finished. What did it all mean? For what had he brought her there? She sat stunned, realising with awful force the feebleness, the inadequacy of her own fears. He, meanwhile, had paused a moment, meeting her gaze with those yearning, sunken eyes. Then he went on, his voice changing a little. But if I had wished it ever so much, I could not have helped myself. The process, so to speak, had gone too far by the time I knew where I was. I think the change must have begun before the Mile End time. Looking back, I see the foundations were laid in, in the work of last winter. She shivered. He stooped and kissed her hands again, passionately. "'Am I poisoning even the memory of our past for you?' he cried. Then, restraining himself at once, he hurried on again. "'After my end, you remember I began to see much of the squire. Oh, my wife, don't look at me so. It was not his doing in any true sense. I'm not such a weak shuttlecock as that. But being where I was before our intimacy began, his influence hastened everything. I don't wish to minimise it. I was not made to stand alone. And again that bitter, perplexed, half-scornful sense of his own pliancy at the hands of circumstances compared with the rigidity of other men descended upon him. Catherine made a faint movement, as though to draw her hands away. "'Was it well?' she said, in a voice which sounded like a harsh echo of her own. "'Was it right for a clergyman to discuss sacred things with such a man?' He let her hands go, guided for the moment by a delicate imperious instinct which bade him appeal to something else than love. Rising, he sat down opposite to her on the low window seat, while she sank back into her chair, her fingers clinging to the arm of it, the lamplight far behind deepening all the shadows of the face, the hollows in the cheeks, the line of experience and will about the mouth. The stupor in which she just listened to him was beginning to break up. Wild forces of condemnation and resistance were rising in her, and he knew it. He knew, too, that as yet she only half realised the situation, and that blow after blow still remained to him to deal. "'Was it right that I should discuss religious matters with the squire?' he repeated, his face resting on his hands. "'What are religious matters, Catherine, and what are not?' Then, still controlling himself rigidly, his eyes fixed on the shadowy face of his wife, his ear catching her quick, uneven breath. He went once more through the dismal history of the last few months, dwelling on his state of thought before the intimacy with Mr. Wendover began, on his first attempts to escape the squire's influence, on his gradual, pitiful surrender. Then he told the story of the last memorable walk before the squire's journey, of the moment in the study afterwards, and of the months of feverish reading and wrestling which had followed. Halfway through it, a new despair seized him. What was the good of all he was saying? He was speaking a language she did not really understand. What were all these critical and literary considerations to her? The rigidity of her silence showed him that her sympathy was not with him, that in comparison with the vibrating protest of her own passionate faith, which must be now ringing through her, Whatever he could urge must seem to her the merest culpable trifling with the soul's awful destinies. In an instant of tumultuous speech he could not convey to her the temper and results of his own complex training, and on that training, as he very well knew, depended the piercing, convincing force of all that he was saying. There were gulfs between them, gulfs which, as it seemed to him in a miserable insight, could never be bridged again. Oh, the frightful separateness of experience! 
Still he struggled on. He brought the story down to the conversation at the hall, described, in broken words of fire and pain, the moment of spiritual wreck which had come upon him in the August Lane, his night of struggle, his resolve to go to Mr. Gray. And all through he was not so much narrating as pleading a cause, and that not his own, but love's. Love was at the bar, and it was for love that the eloquent voice, the pale, varying face, were really pleading, through all the long story of intellectual change. At the mention of Mr. Gray, Catherine grew restless. She sat up suddenly, with a cry of bitterness. "'Robert, why did you go away from me? It was cruel. I should have known first. He had no right, no right.' She clasped her hands round her knees, her beautiful mouth set and stern. The moon had been sailing westward all this time, and as Catherine bent forward the yellow light caught her face and brought out the haggard change in it. He held out his hands to her with a low groan, helpless against her reproach, her jealousy. He dared not speak of what Mr. Gray had done for him, of the tenderness of his counsel towards her pressurely. He felt that everything he could say would but torture the wounded heart still more. But she did not notice the outstretched hands. She covered her face in silence a moment, as though trying to see her way more clearly through the mazes of disaster. And he waited. At last she looked up. "'I cannot follow all you have been saying,' she said, almost harshly. "'I know so little of books. I cannot give them the place you do. You say you have convinced yourself the Gospels are like other books, full of mistakes, and credulous, like the people of the time. And therefore you can't take what they say as you used to take it. But what did it all quite mean? Oh, I am not clever. I cannot see my way clear from thing to thing as you do. If there are mistakes, does it matter so, so terribly to you? And she faltered. Do you think nothing is true, because something may be false? Did not, did not Jesus still live and die and rise again? Can you doubt, do you doubt, that he rose, that he is God, that he is in heaven, that we shall see him? She threw an intensity into every word, which made the short, breathless questions thrill through him, through the nature saturated and steeped as hers was in Christian association, with a bitter, accusing force. But he did not flinch from them. I can believe no longer in an incarnation and resurrection, he said slowly, but with a resolute plainness. Christ is risen in our hearts in the Christian life of charity. Miracle is a natural product of human feeling and imagination. And God was in Jesus, preeminently, as he is in all great souls, but not otherwise. Not otherwise in kind than he is in me or you. His voice dropped to a whisper. She grew paler and paler. "'So to you,' she said presently, in the same strange, altered voice. "'My father, when I saw that light on his face before he died, when I heard him cry, "'Master, I come, was dying, deceived, deluded. "'Perhaps even,' and she trembled, "'you think it ends here, our life, our love?' It was agony to him to see her driving herself through this piteous catechism. The lantern of memory flashed a moment on to the immortal picture of Faust and Margaret. Was it not only that winter they had read the scene together? Forcibly he possessed himself once more of those closely locked hands, pressing their coldness on to his own burning eyes and forehead in hopeless silence. "'Do you, Robert?' she repeated insistently. "'I know nothing,' he said, his eyes still hidden. "'I know nothing, but I trust God with all that is dearest in me, with our love, with the soul that is his breath, his work in us.' The pressure of her despair seemed to be wringing his own faith out of him, forcing into definiteness things and thoughts that had been lying in an accepted, even a welcomed, obscurity. She tried again to draw her hands away, but he would not let them go. "'And the end of it all, Robert?' she said. "'The end of it?' Never did he forget the note of that question, the desolation of it, the indefinable change of accent. 
it drove him into a harsh abruptness of reply. "'The end of it, so far, must be, if I remain an honest man, that I must give up my living, that I must cease to be a minister of the Church of England. What the course of our life after that shall be is, in your hands, absolutely.' She caught her breath painfully. His heart was breaking for her, and yet there was something in her manner now which kept down caresses and repressed all words. Suddenly, however, as he sat there mutely watching her, he found her at his knees, her dear arms around him, her face against his breast. "'Robert, my husband, my darling, it cannot be. It is a madness, a delusion. God is trying you, and me. You cannot be planning so to desert him, so to deny Christ. You cannot, my husband. Come away with me, away from books and work, into some quiet place where he can make himself heard. You are overdone, overdriven. Do nothing now, say nothing, except to me. Be patient a little, and he will give you back himself. What can books and arguments matter to you or me? Have we not known and felt him as he is? Have we not, Robert? Come. She pushed herself backwards, smiling at him with an exquisite tenderness. The tears were streaming down her cheeks. They were wet on his own. Another moment, and Robert would have lost the only clue which remained to him through the mists of this bewildering world. He would have yielded again, as he had many times yielded before, for infinitely less reason, to the urgent pressure of another's individuality, and having jeopardised love for truth, he would now have murdered, or tried to murder, in himself the sense of truth for love. But he did neither. Holding her close pressed against him, he said, in breaks of intense speech, "'If you wish, Catherine, I will wait. I will wait till you bid me speak, but I warn you, there is something dead in me, something gone and broken. It can never live again, except in forms which now it would only pain you more to think of. It is not that I think differently of this point or that point, but of life and religion altogether. I see God's purposes in quite other proportions, as it were. Christianity seems to me something small and local. Behind it, around it, Including it, I see the great drama of the world sweeping on, led by God, from change to change, from act to act. It is not that Christianity is false, but that it is only an imperfect human reflection of a part of truth. Truth has never been, can never be, contained in any one creed or system. She heard, but through her exhaustion, through the bitter sinking of hope, she only half understood. Only she realised that she and he were alike helpless, both struggling in the grip of some force outside themselves, inexorable, ineluctable. Robert felt her arms relaxing, felt the dead weight of her form against him. He raised her to her feet, he half carried her to the door, and on to the stairs. She was nearly fainting, but her will held it at bay. He threw open the door of their room, led her in, lifted her, unresisting, on to the bed. Then her head fell to one side, and her lips grew ashen. In an instant or two he had done for her all that his medical knowledge could suggest with rapid, decided hands. She was not quite unconscious. She drew up round her, as though with a strong, vague sense of chill, the shawl he laid over her, and gradually the slightest shade of colour came back to her lips. But as soon as she opened her eyes and met those of Robert fixed upon her, the heavy lids dropped again. "'Would you rather be alone?' he said to her, kneeling beside her. She made a faint affirmative movement of the head, and the cold hand he'd been chafing tried feebly to withdraw itself. He rose at once, and stood a moment beside her, looking down at her. Then he went. End of Book Four Chapter 28 Book 4, Chapter 29 of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Book 4, Chapter 29 
He shut the door softly and went downstairs again. It was between ten and eleven. The lights in the lower passage were just extinguished. Everyone else in the house had gone to bed. Mechanically he stooped and put away the child's bricks. He pushed the chairs back into their places, and then he paused a while before the open window. But there was not a tremor on the set face. He felt himself capable of no more emotion. The fount of feeling, of pain, was for the moment dried up. What he was mainly noticing was the effect of some occasional gusts of night wind on the moonlit cornfield, the silver ripples they sent through it, the shadow thrown by some great trees in the western corners of the field, the glory of the moon itself in the pale immensity of the sky. Presently he turned away, leaving one lamp still burning in the room, softly unlocked the hall door, took his hat, and went out. He walked up and down the wood-path, or sat on the bench there for some time, thinking indeed, but thinking with a certain stern, practical dryness. Whenever he felt the thrill of feeling stealing over him again, he would make a sharp effort at repression. Physically he could not bear much more, and he knew it. A part remained for him to play which must be played with tact, with prudence, and with firmness. Strength and nerves had been sufficiently weakened already. For his wife's sake, his people's sake, his honourable reputation's sake, he must guard himself from a collapse which might mean far more than physical failure. So in the most patient, methodical way he began to plan out the immediate future. The matter was still in Catherine's hands, but he knew that finely tempered soul. He knew that when she had mastered her poor woman's self, as she had always mastered it from her childhood, she would not bid him wait. He hardly took the possibility into consideration. The proposal had had some reality in his eyes when he went to see Mr. Gray. Now it had none, though he could hardly have explained why. He had already made arrangements with an old Oxford friend to take his duty during his absence on the continent. It had been originally suggested that this Mr. Armistead should come to Muirwell on the Monday following the Sunday they were now approaching, spend a few days with them before their departure, and be left to his own devices in the house and parish about the Thursday or Friday. An intense desire now seized Robert to get hold of the man at once, before the next Sunday. It was strange how the interview with his wife seems to have crystallised, precipitated everything. How infinitely more real the whole matter looked to him since the afternoon. It had passed, at any rate for the time, out of the region of thought, into the hurrying evolution of action, and as soon as action began it was characteristic of Robert's rapid, energetic nature to feel this thirst, to make it as prompt as complete as possible. The fiery soul yearned for a fresh consistency, though it were a consistency of loss and renunciation. Tomorrow he must write to the bishop. The bishop's residence was only eight or ten miles from Muirwell. He supposed his interview with him would take place about Monday or Tuesday. He could see the tall, stooping figure of the kindly old man rising to meet him. He knew exactly the sort of arguments that would be brought to bear upon him, Oh, that it were done with, this wearisome dialectical necessity! His life for months had been one long argument. If he were but left free to feel and live again! The practical matter which weighed most heavily upon him was the function connected with the opening of the new institute, which had been fixed for the Saturday, the next day but one. How was he, but much more how was Catherine, to get through it? His lips would be sealed to any possible withdrawal from the living, for he could not by then have seen the bishop. He looked forward to the gathering, the crowds, the local enthusiasm, the signs of his own popularity, with a sickening distaste. The one thing real to him through it all would be Catherine's white face and their bitter joint consciousness. And then he said to himself sharply that his own feelings counted for nothing. Catherine should be tenderly shielded from all avoidable pain, but for himself there must be no flinching, no self-indulgent weakness. Did he not owe everything last hour he had to give to the people amongst whom he had planned to spend the best energies of life, and for whom his own act was about to part him in this lame, impotent fashion? Midnight. The sounds rolled silverly out, effacing the soft murmurs of the night. So the long, interminable day was over, and a new morning had begun. He rose, listening to the echoes of the bell, and as the tide of feeling surged back upon him, 
passionately commending the newborn day to God. Then he turned towards the house, put the light out in the drawing-room, and went upstairs, stepping cautiously. He opened the door of Catherine's room. The moonlight was streaming in through the white blinds. Catherine, who had undressed, was lying now with her face hidden in the pillow, and one white-sleeved arm flung across little Mary's cot. The night was hot, and the child would evidently have thrown off all its coverings had it not been for the mother's hand, which lay lightly on the tiny shoulder, keeping one thin blanket in its place. "'Catherine,' he whispered, standing beside her. She turned, and by the light of the candle he held shaded from her, he saw the austere remoteness of her look, as of one who had been going through deep waters of misery, alone with God. His heart sank. For the first time that look seemed to exclude him from her inmost life. He sank down beside her, took the hand lying on the child, and laid down his head upon it, mutely kissing it. But he said nothing. Of what further avail could words be just then to either of them? Only he felt through every fibre the coldness, the irresponsiveness of those fingers lying in his. "'Would it prevent your sleeping?' he asked her presently. "'If I came to read here, as I used to when you were ill, I could shade the light from you, of course.' She raised her head suddenly. "'But you—you you ought to sleep.' Her tone was anxious, but strangely quiet and aloof. "'Impossible,' he said, pressing his hand over his eyes as he rose. "'At any rate, I will read first. His sleeplessness at any time of excitement or strain was so inveterate and so familiar to them both by now that she could say nothing. She turned away with a long, sobbing breath, which seemed to go through her from head to foot. He stood a moment beside her, fighting strong impulses of remorse and passion, and ultimately maintaining silence and self-control. In another minute or two he was sitting beside her feet, in a low chair drawn to the edge of the bed, the light arranged so as to reach his book without touching either mother or child. He had run over the bookshelf in his own room, shrinking painfully from any of his common religious favourites, as one shrinks from touching a still sore and throbbing nerve, and had at last carried off a volume of Spencer. And so the night began to wear away. For the first hour or two, every now and then, a, a stifled sob would make itself just faintly heard. It was a sound to wring the heart, for what it meant was that not even Catherine Ellesmere's extraordinary powers of self-suppression could avail to check the outward expression of an inward torture. Each time it came and went, it seemed to Ellesmere that a fraction of his youth went with it. At last, Exhaustion brought her a restless sleep. As soon as Ellesmere caught the light breathing which told him she was not conscious of her grief or of him, his book slipped on to his knee. Open the temple gates unto my love, open them wide that she may enter in, and all the posts adorn as doth behove, and all the pillars deck with garlands trim, for to receive this saint with honour due that cometh into you, with trembling steps and humble reverence, she cometh in before the Almighty's view. The leaves fell over as the book dropped, and these lines which had been to him, as to other lovers, the utterance of his own bridal joy, emerged. They brought about him a host of images. A little grey church penetrated everywhere by the roar of a swollen river. Outside a road filled with empty farmer's carts and shouting children carrying branches of mountain ash winding on and up into the heart of wild hills, dyed with reddening fern, the sunbeam stealing from crag to crag and shoulder to shoulder. Inside, row after row of intent faces, all turned towards the central passage, and moving towards him a figure, clad all in white that seems a virgin blessed, whose every step brings nearer to him the heaven of his heart's desire. Everything is plain to him, Mrs. Thornburg's round cheeks and marvellous curls and jubilant airs, Mrs. Laban's mild and tearful pleasure, the vicar's solid satisfaction. With what confiding joy had those who loved her given her to him! And he knows well that out of all griefs, the grief he has brought upon her in two short years is the one which will seem to her hardest to bear. Very few women of the present day could feel this particular calamity, as Catherine Ellesmere must feel it. 
Was it a crime to love and win you, my darling? He cried to her in his heart. Ought I to have had more self-knowledge? Could I have guessed where I was taking you? Oh, how could I know? How could I know? But it was impossible to him to sink himself wholly in the past. Inevitably such a nature as Ellesmere's turns very quickly from despair to hope, from the sense of failure to the passionate planning of new effort. In time would he not be able to comfort her, and after a miserable moment of transition, to repair her trust in him, and make their common life once more rich towards God and man? There must be painful readjustment and friction, no doubt. He tries to see the facts as they truly are, fighting against his own optimistic tendencies, and realising as best he can all the changes which his great change must introduce into their most intimate relations. But after all, can love and honesty and a clear conscience do nothing to bridge over, nay to efface, such differences as theirs will be? Oh, to bring her to understand him! At this moment he shrinks painfully from the thought of touching her faith. His own sense of loss is too heavy, too terrible. But if she will only be still open with him, still give him her deepest heart, any lasting difference between them will surely be impossible. Each will complete the other, and love knit up the ravelled strands again into a stronger unity. Gradually he lost himself in half-articulate prayer in the solemn girding of the will to this future task of a recreating love. And by the time the morning light had well established itself, sleep had fallen on him. When he became sensible of the longed-for drowsiness, he merely stretched out a tired hand and drew over him a shawl hanging at the foot of the bed. He was too utterly worn out to think of moving. When he woke, the sun was streaming into the room, and behind him sat the tiny Mary on the edge of the bed, the rounded apple cheeks and wild bird eyes aglow with mischief and delight. She had climbed out of her cot, and finding no check to her progress had crept on, till now she sat triumphantly, with one diminutive leg and rosy foot doubled under her, and her father's thick hair at the mercy of her invading fingers, which, however, was yet touching him half timidly, as though something in his sleep had awed the baby sense. But Catherine was gone. He sprang up with a start. Mary was frightened by the abrupt movement, perhaps disappointed by the escape of her prey, and raised a sudden wail. He carried her to her nurse, even forgetting to kiss the little wet cheek, ascertained that Catherine was not in the house, and then came back, miserable, with the bewilderment of sleep still upon him. A sense of wrong rose high within him. How could she have left him thus without a word? It had been her way sometimes during the summer to go out early to one or other of the sick folk who were under her especial charge. Possibly she had gone to a woman just confined on the farther side of the village who yesterday had been in danger. But whatever explanation he could make for himself, he was none the less irrationally wretched. He bathed, dressed, and sat down to his solitary meal in a state of tension and agitation indescribable. All the exultation, the courage of the night, was gone. Nine o'clock, ten o'clock, and no sign of Catherine. Your mistress must have been detained somewhere, he said as quietly and carelessly as he could to Susan, the parlour-maid, who had been with them since their marriage. Leave breakfast things for one. Mistress took a cup of milk when she went out, cook says, observed the little maid with a consoling intention, wondering the while at the rector's haggard mien and restless movements. Nursing other people indeed, she observed severely downstairs, glad as we all are at times to pick holes in excellence which is inconveniently high. Mrs. had a deal better stay at home and nurse him. The day was excessively hot. Not a leaf moved in the garden. Over the cornfield the air danced in long vibrations of heat. The woods and hills beyond were indistinct and colourless. Their dog, Dandy, lay sleeping in the sun, waking up every now and then to avenge himself on the flies. On the far edge of the cornfield reaping was beginning. Robert stood on the edge of the sunk fence, his blind eyes resting on the line of men, his ear catching the shouts of the farmer directing operations from his grey horse. He could do nothing. The night before, in the wood-path, he had clearly mapped out the day's work, 
a mass of business was waiting, clamouring to be done. He tried to begin on this or that, and gave up everything with a groan, wandering out again to the gate onto the wood-path to sweep the distances of road or field with hungry, straining eyes. The wildest fears had taken possession of him. Running in his head was a passage from The Confessions, describing Monica's horror of her son's heretical opinions. Shrinking from and detesting the blasphemies of his error, she began to doubt whether it was right in her to allow her son to live in her house and to eat at the same table with her. And the mother's heart, he remembered, could only be convinced of the lawfulness of its own yearning by a prophetic vision of the youth's conversion. He recalled, with a shiver, how in the life of Madame Guillon, after describing the painful and agonising death of a kind but comparatively irreligious husband, she quietly adds, As soon as I heard that my husband had just expired, I said to thee, O my God, thou hadst broken my bonds, and I will offer to thee a sacrifice of praise. He thought of John Henry Newman, disowning all the ties of kinship with his younger brother because of divergent views on the question of baptismal regeneration. Of the long tragedy of Blanco White's life, caused by the slow dropping off of friend after friend on the ground of heretical belief. What right had he, or any one in such a strait as his, to assume that the faith of the present is no longer capable of the same stern, self-destructive consistency as the faith of the past? He knew that to such Christian purity, such Christian inwardness as Catherine's, the ultimate sanction and legitimacy of marriage rest, both in theory and practice, on a common acceptance of the definite commands and premises of a miraculous revelation. He had had a proof of it in Catherine's passionate repugnance to the idea of Rose's marriage with Edward Langham. Eleven o'clock striking from the distant tower. He walked desperately along the wood-path, meaning to go through the copse at the end of it towards the park and look there. He just passed into the copse, a thick, interwoven mass of young trees, when he heard the sound of the gate which on the farther side of it led on to the road. He hurried on, the trees close behind him, the grassy path broadened, and there, under an arch of young oak and hazel, stood Catherine, arrested by the sound of his step. He, too, stopped at the sight of her. He could not go on. Husband and wife looked at each other one long, quivering moment. Then Catherine sprang forward with a sob and threw herself on his breast. They clung to each other, she in a passion of tears, tears of such self-abandonment as neither Robert nor any other living soul had ever seen Catherine Ellesmere shed before. As for him, he was trembling from head to foot, his arms scarcely strong enough to hold her, his young, worn face bent down over her. "'Oh, Robert!' she sobbed at last, putting up her hand and touching his hair. "'You look so pale, so sad.' "'I have you again,' he said simply. A thrill of remorse ran through her. "'I went away,' she murmured, her face still hidden. "'I went away because when I woke up it all seemed to me suddenly too ghastly to be believed. I could not stay still and bear it. But, Robert, Robert, I kissed you as I passed. I was so thankful you could sleep a little and forget.' I hardly know where I have been most of the time. I think I have been sitting in a corner of the park, where no one ever comes. I began to think of all you said to me last night, to put it together, to try and understand it, and it seemed to be more and more horrible. I thought of what it would be like to have to hide my prayers from you, my faith in Christ, my hope of heaven. I thought of bringing up the child. All that was vital to me would be a superstition to you, which you would bear with for my sake. I thought of death, and she shuddered. Your death, or my death, and how this change in you would cleave a gulf of misery between us. And then I thought of losing my own faith, of denying Christ. It was a nightmare. I saw myself on a wrong road, escaping with Mary in my arms, escaping from you. Oh, Robert, it wasn't only for myself— and she clung to him as though she were a child, confessing, explaining away, some grievous fault hardly to be forgiven. I was agonised by the thought that I was not my own. I and my child were Christ's. Could I risk what was his? 
Other men and women had died, had given up all for his sake. Is there no one now strong enough to suffer torment, to kill even love itself, rather than deny him, rather than crucify him afresh? She paused, struggling for breath. The terrible excitement of that bygone moment had seized upon her again, and communicated itself to him. And then, and then, she said, sobbing, I don't know how it was. One moment I was sitting up looking straight before me, without a tear, thinking of what was the least I must do, even even if, if you and I stayed together, of all the hard compacts and conditions I must make, judging me all the while from a long, long distance, and feeling as though I had buried the old self, sacrificed the old heart for ever. And the next I was lying on the ground, crying for you, Robert, crying for you. Your face had come back to me as you lay there in the early morning light. I thought how I kissed you, how pale and grey and thin you looked. Oh, how I loathe myself, that I think it could be God's will that I should leave you or torture you, my poor husband. I had not only been wicked towards you, I had offended Christ. I could think of nothing as I lay there, again and again, but little children love one another. Little children love one another. Oh, my beloved! And she looked up with the solemnest, tenderest smile breaking on the marred, tear-stained face. I will never give up hope. I will pray for you, night and day. God will bring you back. You cannot lose yourself so. No, no, his grace is stronger than our wills. But I will not preach to you. I will not persecute you. I will only live beside you, in your heart, and love you, always. How could I? How could I have such thoughts? And again she broke off, weeping, as if to the tender, torn heart, the only crime that could not be forgiven was its own offence against love. As for him, he was beyond speech. If he had ever lost his vision of God, his wife's love would that moment have given it back to him. Robert, she said presently, urged on by the sacred yearning to heal, to atone, I will not complain, I will not ask you to wait. I take your word for it that it is best not, that it would do no good. The only hope is in time and prayer. I must suffer, dear, I must be weak sometimes. But, oh, I am so sorry for you. Kiss me, forgive me, Robert. I will be your faithful wife unto our lives' end. He kissed her, and in that kiss, so sad, so pitiful, so clinging, their new life was born. End of Book 4, Chapter 29《Book Four, Chapter Thirty of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Four, Chapter Thirty. But the problem of these two lives was not solved by a burst of feeling. Without that determining impulse of love and pity in Catherine's heart, the salvation of an exquisite bond might indeed have been impossible. But in spite of it, the laws of character had still to work themselves inexorably out on either side. The whole gist of the matter for Ellesmere lay really in this question. Hidden in Catherine's nature, was there, or was there not, the true stuff of fanaticism? Madame Guillon left her infant children to the mercies of chance while she followed the voice of God to the holy war with heresy. Under similar conditions, Catherine Ellesmere might have planned the same. Could she ever have carried it out? And yet the question is still ill-stated. For the influences of our modern time on religious action are so blunting and dulling, because in truth the religious motive itself is being constantly modified, whether the religious person knows it or not. Is it possible now for a good woman with a heart, in Catherine Ellesmere's position, to maintain herself against love and all those subtle forces to which such a change as Ellesmere's opens the house doors, without either hardening or greatly yielding? Let Catherine's further story give some sort of an answer. Poor soul! As they sat together in the study, after he had brought her home, Robert, with averted eyes, went through the plans he had already thought into shape. Catherine listened, saying almost nothing. 
but never, never had she loved this life of theirs so well as now that she was called on, at barely a week's notice, to give it up for ever. For Robert's scheme, in which her reason fully acquiesced, was to keep to their plan of going to Switzerland, he having first, of course, settled all things with the bishop, and having placed his living in the hands of Mowbray Ellesmere. When they left the rectory, in a week or ten days' time, he proposed, in fact, his voice almost inaudible as he did so, that Catherine should leave it for good. "'Everybody had better suppose,' he said, choking, "'that we are coming back. Of course we need say nothing. Our Miss Dead will be here for next week, certainly. Then afterwards I can come down and manage everything. I shall get it over in a day, if I can, and see nobody. I cannot say good-bye, nor can you.' "'And next Sunday, Robert?' she asked him after a pause. I shall write to Armistead this afternoon and ask him, if he possibly can, to come to-morrow afternoon instead of Monday and take the service. Catherine's hands clasped each other still more closely. So then she had heard her husband's voice for the last time in the public ministry of the church, in prayer, in exhortation, in benediction. One of the most sacred traditions of her life was struck from her at a blow. It was long before either of them spoke again. Then she ventured another question. "'And have you any idea of what we shall do next, Robert, of of our future?' "'Shall we try London for a little?' he answered, in a queer, strained voice, leaning against the window and looking out that he might not see her. "'I should find work among the poor. So would you. And I could go on with my book. And your mother and sister will probably be there part of the winter.' She acquiesced silently. How mean and shrunken a future it seemed to them both, beside the wide and honourable range of his clergyman's life as he and she had developed it. But she did not dwell long on that. Her thoughts were suddenly invaded by the memory of a cottage tragedy in which he had recently taken a prominent part. A girl, a child of fifteen, from one of the crowded Mile End hovels, had gone at Christmas to a distant farm as servant, and come back a month ago ruined, the victim of an outrage over which Ellesmere had ground his teeth in fierce and helpless anger. Catherine had found her a shelter, and was to see her through her trouble. The girl, a frail, half-witted creature who could find no words even to bewail herself, clinging to her the while with the dumbest, pitifulest tenacity. How could she leave that girl? It was as if all the fibres of life were being violently wrenched from all their natural connections. Robert, she cried at last with a start, "'Have you forgotten the Institute to-morrow?' "'No, no,' he said, with a saddest smile. "'No, I have not forgotten it. "'Don't go, Catherine, don't go. "'I must. "'But why should you go through it?' "'But there are all those flags and wreaths,' she said, "'getting up in pained bewilderment. "'I must go and look after them.' "'He caught her in his arms. "'Oh, my wife, my wife, forgive me!' "'It was a groan of misery.' She put up her hands and pressed his hair back from his temples. "'I love you, Robert,' she said simply, her face colourless but perfectly calm. Half an hour later, after he had worked through some letters, he went into the workroom and found her surrounded with flags and a vast litter of paper roses and evergreens which she and the new agent's daughters who had come up to help her were putting together for the decorations of the morrow. Mary was tottering from chair to chair in high glee, a big pink rose stuck in the belt of her pinafore. His pale wife, trying to smile and talk as usual, her lap full of evergreens, and her politeness exercised by the chatter of the two Miss Batesons, seemed to Robert one of the most pitiful spectacles he had ever seen. He fled from it out into the village, driven by a restless longing for change and movement. Here he found a large gathering round the new institute. There were carpenters at work on a triumphal arch in front, and close by an admiring circle of children and old men, huddling in the shade of a great chestnut. Ellesmere spent an hour in the building, helping and superintending, stabbed every now and then by the unsuspecting friendliness of those about him, or worried by their blunt comments on his looks. He could not bear more than a glance into the new rooms apportioned to the naturalist club. There, against the wall, stood the new glass cases he had wrung out of the square, with various new collections lying near, ready to be arranged and unpacked when time allowed. The old collections stood out bravely in the added space and light, 
The walls were hung here and there with a wonderful set of geographical pictures he carried off from a London exhibition, and fed his boys on for weeks. The floors were freshly matted. The new pine fittings gave out their pleasant, cleanly scent. The white paint of doors and windows shone in the August sun. The building had been given by the squire. The fittings and furniture had been mainly of his providing. What uses he had planned for it all? Only to see the fruits of two years' efforts out of doors and personal frugality at home handed over to some possibly unsympathetic stranger. The heart beat painfully against the iron bars of fate, rebelling against the power of a mental process so to affect a man's whole practical and social life. He went out at last, by the back of the Institute, where a little bit of garden, spoilt with building materials, led down to a lane. At the end of the garden, beside the untidy gap in the hedge made by the builder's carts, he saw a man standing, who turned away down the lane, however, as soon as the rector's figure emerged into view. Robert had recognised the slouching gait and unwieldy form of Henslow. There were at this moment all kinds of gruesome stories afloat in the village about the ex-agent. It was said that he was breaking up fast. It was known that he was extensively in debt. And the village shopkeepers already held an agitated meeting or two to decide upon the best mode of getting their money out of him, and upon a joint plan of cautious action towards his custom in future. The man indeed was sinking deeper and deeper into a pit of sordid misery, maintaining all the while a snarling, exasperating front to the world, which was rapidly converting the careless, half-malicious pity wherewith the village had till now surveyed his fall into that more active species of baiting which the human animal is never very loath to try upon the limping specimens of his race. Henslow stopped and turned as he heard the steps behind him. Six months' self-murdering had left ghastly traces. He was many degrees nearer the brute than he had ever been when Robert made his ineffectual visit. But at this actual moment Robert's practised eye, for every English parish clergyman becomes dismally expert in the pathology of drunkenness, saw that there was no fight in him. He was in one of the drunkard's periods of collapse, shivering, flabby, starting at every sound, a misery to himself and a spectacle to others. "'Mr. Henslow,' cried Robert, still pursuing him, May I speak to you a moment? The ex-agent turned, his prominent bloodshot eyes glowering at the speaker. But he had to catch at his stick for support, or at the nervous shock of Robert's summons his legs would have given way under him. Robert came up with him, and stood a second, fronting the evil silence of the other, his boyish face deeply flushed. Perhaps the grotesqueness of that former scene was in his mind. Moreover, the vestry meetings had furnished Henslow with periodical opportunities for venting his gall on the rector, and they had never been neglected. But he plunged on boldly. "'I am going away next week, Mr. Henslow. I shall be going away some considerable time. Before I go, I should like to ask you whether you do not think the feud between us had better cease. Why would you persist in making an enemy of me? If I did you an injury, it was neither wittingly nor willingly. I know you have been ill, and I gather that that you are in trouble. If I could stand between you and further mischief, I would, most gladly. If help or, or, or money... He paused. He shrewdly suspected, indeed, from the reports that reached him, that Henslow was on the brink of bankruptcy. The rector had spoken with the utmost diffidence and delicacy, but Henslow found energy in return for an outburst of quavering animosity, from which, however, physical weakness had extracted all its sting. I thank you to make your canting offers to someone else, Mr. Ellesmere. When I want your advice, I'll ask for it. Good day to you. And he turned away with as much of an attempt at dignity as his shaking limbs would allow of. Listen, Mr. Henslow, said Robert firmly, walking beside him. You know, I know, that if this goes on, in a year's time you will be in your grave, and your poor wife and children struggling to keep themselves from the workhouse. You may think that I have no right to preach to you, that you are the older man, that it is an intrusion. But what is the good of blinking facts that you must know all the world knows? Come now, Mr. Henslow, let us behave for a moment as though this were our last meeting. Who knows? The chances of life are many. Lay down your grudge against me, and let me speak to you as one struggling human being to another. The fact that you have, as you say, become less prosperous, 
in some sort through me, seems to give me a right to make it a duty for me, if you will, to help you if I can. Let me send a good doctor to see you. Let me implore you as a last chance to put yourself into his hands and to obey him and your wife, and let me... The rector hesitated. Let me make things pecuniarily easier for Mrs. Henslow till you pulled yourself out of the hole in which, by common report at least, you are now. Henslow stared at him, divided between anger caused by the sore stirring of his old self-importance and a tumultuous flood of self-pity, roused irresistibly in him by Robert's piercing frankness, and aided by his own more or less maudlin condition. The latter sensation quickly undermined the former. He turned his back on the rector and leant over the railings of the lane, shaken by something it is hardly worth while to dignify by the name of emotion. Robert stood by, a pale embodiment of mingled judgment and compassion. He gave the man a few moments to recover himself, and then, as Henslow turned round again, he silently and appealingly held out his hand, the hand of the good man, which it was an honour for such as Henslow to touch. Constrained by the moral force radiating from his look, the other took it with a kind of helpless sullenness. Then, seizing at once on the slight concession, with that complete lack of inconvenient self-consciousness, or hindering indecision, which was one of the chief causes of his effect on men and women, Robert began to sound the broken, repulsive creature as to his affairs. Bit by bit, compelled by a will and nervous strength far superior to his own, Henslow was led into abrupt and blurted confidences, which surprised no one so much as himself. Robert's quick sense possessed itself of point after point, seeing presently ways of escape and relief, which the besotted brain beside him had been quite incapable of devising for itself. They walked on into the open country, and what with the discipline of the rector's presence, the sobering effects wrought by the shock to pride and habit, and the unwonted brain exercise of the conversation, the demon in Henslow had been for the moment most strangely tamed after half an hour's talk. Actually, some reminiscences of his old ways of speech and thought, the ways of the once prosperous and self-reliant man of business, had reappeared in him before the end of it, called out by the subtle influence of a manner which always attracted to the surface whatever decent element there might be left in a man, and then instantly gave it a recognition which was more redeeming than either counsel or denunciation. By the time they parted, Robert had arranged with his old enemy that he should become his surety with a rich cousin in Churton, who, always supposing there were no risk in the matter, and that benevolence ran on all fours with security of investment, was prepared to shield the credit of the family by the advance of a sufficient sum of money to rescue the ex-agent from his most pressing difficulties. He had also wrung from him the promise to see a specialist in London, Robert writing that evening to make the appointment. How had it been done? Neither Robert nor Henslow ever quite knew. Henslow walked home in a bewilderment which for once had nothing to do with brandy, but was simply the result of a moral shock acting on what was still human in the man's debased consciousness, just as electricity acts on the bodily frame. Robert, on the other hand, saw him depart with a singular lightning of mood. What he seemed to have achieved might turn out to be the merest moonshine, at any rate, the incident had appeased in him a kind of spiritual hunger, the hunger to escape a while from that incessant process of destructive analysis with which the mind was still beset, into some use of energy, more positive, human, and beneficent. The following day was one long trial of endurance for Ellesmere and for Catherine. She pleaded to go, promising quietly to keep out of his sight, and they started together, a miserable pair. Crowds, heat, decorations, the grandees on the platform, and conspicuous among them the squire's slouching frame and striking head, side by side with the white and radiant Lady Helen. The outer success, the inner revolt and pain, and the constant seeking of his truant eyes for a face that hid itself as much as possible in dark corners, but was in truth the one thing sharply present to him. These were the sort of impressions that remained with Ellesmere afterwards of this last meeting with his people. He made a speech, of which he never could remember a word. As he sat down there had been a slight flutter of surprise in the sympathetic looks of those about him, 
as though the turn of it had been somewhat unexpected and disproportionate to the occasion. Had he betrayed himself in any way? He looked for Catherine, but she was nowhere to be seen. Only in his search he caught the squire's ironical glance, and wondered, with quick shame, what sort of nonsense he had been talking. Then a neighbouring clergyman, who had been his warm supporter at Admira from the beginning, sprang up and made a rambling panegyric on him and on his work, which Elsmere writhed under. His work! Absurdity! What could be done in two years? He saw it all as the merest nothing, a ragged beginning which might do more harm than good. But the cheering was incessant, the popular feeling intense. There was old Milsom waving a feeble arm, John Allwood, gaunt but radiant, Mary Charland, white still as the ribbons on her bonnet, egging on her flushed and cheering husband, and the club boys grinning and shouting, partly for love of Ellesmere, mostly because to the young human animal mere noise is heaven. In front was an old hedger and ditcher, who came round the parish periodically, and never failed to take Ellesmere's opinion as to a bit of property, he and two other brothers, as ancient as himself, had been quarrelling over for twenty years, and were likely to go on quarrelling over, till all three litigants had closed their eyes on a mortal scene which had afforded them on the whole vast entertainment, though little pelf. Next him was a bowed and twisted old tramp who had been shepherd in the districts in his youth, had then gone through the Crimea and the mutiny, and was now living among the commons, welcome to feed here and sleep there for the sake of his stories, and his queer, innocuous wit. Robert had had many a gay, argumentative walk with him, and he and his companion had tramped miles to see the function, to rattle their sticks on the floor in Ellesmere's honour, and satiate their curious gaze on the squire. When all was over, Ellesmere, with his wife on his arm, mounted the hill to the rectory, leaving the green behind them still crowded with folk. Once inside the shelter of their own trees, Husband and wife turned instinctively and caught each other's hands. A low groan broke from Ellesmere's lips. Catherine looked at him one moment, then fell weeping on his breast. The first chapter of their common life was closed. One thing more, however, of a private nature remained for Ellesmere to do. Late in the afternoon he walked over to the hall. He found the squire in the inner library among his German books, his pipe in his mouth, his old smoking coat and slippers bearing witness to the rapidity and joy with which he had shut the world out again after the futilities of the morning. His mood was more accessible than Ellesmere had yet found it since his return. "'Well, have you done with all those tomfooleries, Ellesmere? Precious elegant speech you made. When I see you and people like you throwing yourselves at the heads of the people, I always think of Skellinger's remark about the Basques. They say they understand one another. I don't believe a word of it. All that the lower class wants to understand, at any rate, is the shortest way to the pockets of you and me. All that you and I need understand, according to me, is how to keep them off. There you have the sum and substance of my political philosophy. You remind me, said Robert dryly, sitting down on one of the library stools, of some of those sentiments you expressed so forcibly on the first evening of our acquaintance. The squire received the shaft with equanimity. "'I was not amiable, I remember, on that occasion,' he said coolly, his thin old man's fingers moving the while among the shelves of books, nor on several subsequent ones. I'd been made a fool of, and you were not particularly adroit. But of course you won't acknowledge it. Whoever yet got a parson to confess himself?' "'Strangely enough, Mr. Wendover,' said Robert, fixing him with a pair of deliberate, feverish eyes. I am here at this moment for that very purpose. Go on, said the squire, turning, however, to meet the rector's look, his gold spectacles falling forward over his long hooked nose, his attitude one of sudden attention. Go on. All his grievances against Ellesmere returned to him. He stood aggressively waiting. Robert paused a moment, and then said abruptly, Perhaps even you will agree, Mr. Wendover, that I had some reason for sentiment this morning. Unless I read the lessons to-morrow, which is possible, to-day has been my last public appearance as a rector of this parish. The squire looked at him, dumbfounded. And your reasons? 
he said, with quick imperativeness. Robert gave them. He admitted, as plainly and bluntly as he had done to Grey, the squire's own part in the matter. But here a note of antagonism, almost of defiance, crept even to his confession of wide and illimitable defeat. He was there, so to speak, to hand over his sword. But to the squire his surrender had all the pride of victory. "'Why should you give up your living?' asked the squire, after several minutes' complete silence. He too had sat down, and was now bending forward, his sharp, small eyes peering at his companion. "'Simply because I prefer to feel myself an honest man. However, I have not acted without advice. Grey of St. Anselm's, you know him, of course, was a very close personal friend of mine at Oxford. I have been to see him, and we agreed it was the only thing to do.' "'No, Grey,' exclaimed the squire, with a movement of impatience. "'Grey, of course, wanted you to set up a church of your own, or to join his. "'He's like all idealists. "'He has the usual foolish contempt for the compromise of institutions.' "'Not at all,' said Robert calmly. "'You are mistaken. "'He has the most sacred respect for institutions. "'He only thinks it well, and I agree with him, "'that with regard to a man's public profession and practice, "'he should recognise that two and two makes four. It was clear to him, from the squire's tone and manner, that Mr. Wendover's instincts on the point were very much what he had expected, the instincts of the philosophical man of the world, who scorns the notion of taking popular belief seriously, whether for protest or for sympathy. But he was too weary to argue. The squire, however, rose hastily, and began to walk up and down in a gathering storm of irritation. The triumph gained for his own side, the tribute to his life's work, were at the moment absolutely indifferent to him. They were effaced by something else much harder to analyse. Whatever it was, it drove him to throw himself upon Robert's position with a perverse, bewildering bitterness. "'Why should you break up your life in this wanton way? Who in God's name is injured if you keep your living? It is the business of the thinker and the scholar to clear his mind of cobwebs. Granted, you have done it. But it is also the business of the practical man to live.' If I had your altruist, emotional temperament, I should not hesitate for a moment. I should regard the historical expressions of an external tendency in men as wholly indifferent to me. If I understand you right, you have flung away the sanctions of orthodoxy. There is no other in the way. Treat words as they deserve. You, and the speaker laid an emphasis on the pronoun, which for the life of me he could not help making sarcastic, you will always have gospel enough to preach. "'I cannot,' Robert repeated quietly, unmoved by the taunt, if it was one. "'I am in a different stage, I imagine, from you. "'Words, that is to say the specific Christian formulae, may be indifferent to you, "'though a month or two ago I should hardly have guessed it. "'They are just now anything but indifferent to me.' "'The squire's brow grew darker. "'He took up the argument again, more pugnaciously than ever.' It was the strangest attempt ever made to jibe and flout a wandering shepherd back into the fold. Robert's resentment was roused at last. The squire's temper seemed to him totally inexplicable, his arguments contradictory, the conversation useless and irritating. He got up to take his leave. "'What are you about to do, Ellesmere?' the squire wound up with saturnine emphasis. "'Is a piece of cowardice!' You will live bitterly to regret the haste and the unreason of it. "'There has been no haste,' exclaimed Robert, in the low tone of passionate emotion. "'I have not rooted up the most sacred growths of life as a careless child devastates its garden. There are some things which a man only does because he must.' There was a pause. Robert held out his hand. The squire would hardly touch it. Outwardly his mood was one of the strangest eccentricity and anger, and as to what was beneath it, Ellsmere's quick divination was dulled by worry and fatigue. It only served him so far that at the door he turned back, hat in hand, and said, looking lingeringly the while at the solitary sombre figure, at the great library, with all its suggestive and exquisite detail, "'If Bundy is fine, squire, will you walk?' The squire made no reply except by another question. "'Do you still keep to your swish plans for next week?' he asked sharply. 
"'Certainly. The plant, as it happens, is a godsend. "'But there,' said Robert, with a sigh, "'let me explain the details of this dismal business to you on Monday. "'I've hardly the courage for it now.' "'The curtain dropped behind him. "'Mr. Wendover stood a moment, looking after him, "'then, with some vehement expletive or other, "'walked up to his writing-table, "'drew some folios that were lying on it towards him, "'with hasty, maladroit movements "'which sent his papers flying over the floor, and plunged doggedly into work. He and Mrs. Darcy dined alone. After dinner the squire leant against the mantelpiece, sipping his coffee, more gloomily silent than even his sister had seen him for weeks. And as always happened when he became more difficult and morose, she became more childish. She was now wholly absorbed with a little electric toy she had just bought for Mary Ellesmere, a number of infinitesimal little figures dancing fantastically under the stimulus of an electric current generated by the simplest means. She hung over it, absorbed, calling to her brother every now and then, as though by sheer perversity, to come and look whenever the pink or the blue danseurs executed a more surprising somersault than usual. He took not the smallest spoken notice of her, though his eyes followed her contemptuously as she moved from window to window with her toy, in pursuit of the fading light. "'Oh, Roger!' she called presently, still throwing herself to this side and that, to catch new views of her pith puppets. "'I've got something to show you. You must admire them. You shall. I've been drawing them all day, and they are nearly done. You remember what I told you once about my imps? I've seen them all my life, since I was a child in France with Papa, and I've never been able to draw them till the last few weeks. They're such dears, such darlings!' Every one will know them when he sees them. There is the Chinese imp, the low, smirking creature you know that sits on the edge of your cup of tea. There is the flippity floppity creature that flies out at you when you open a drawer. There is the twisty twirly person that sits cheering on the edge of your hat when it blows away from you. And, her voice dropped, that ugly, ugly thing I always see waiting for me on the top of a gate. They've teased me all my life, and now at last I've drawn them. If they were to take offence to-morrow, I should have them, the beauties, all safe. She came towards him, her bizarre little figure swaying from side to side, her eyes glittering, her restless hands pulling at the lace round her blanched head and face. The squire, his hands behind him, looked at her frowning, an involuntary horror dawning on his dark countenance, turned abruptly, and left the room. Mr. Wendover worked till midnight. Then, tired out, he turned to the bit of fire, to which, in spite of the oppressiveness of the weather, the chilliness of age and nervous strain had led him to set alight. He sat there for long, sunk in the blackest reverie. He was the only living creature in the great library wing which spread around and above him, the only waking creature in the whole vast pile of Murmel. The silver lamps shone with a steady melancholy light on the chequered walls of books. The silence was a silence that could be felt, and the gleaming Artemis, the tortured frowning Medusa, were hardly stiller in their frozen calm than the crouching figure of the squire. So Ellesmere was going. In a few weeks the rectory would be once more tenanted by one of those non-entities the squire had either patronised or scorned all his life. The park, the lanes, the room in which he sits, will know that spare young figure, that animated voice, no more. The outlet which had brought so much relief and stimulus to his own mental powers is closed. The friendship on which he had unconsciously come to depend so much is broken before it had well begun. All sorts of strange, thwarted instincts made themselves felt in the squire. The wife he had once thought to marry, the children he might have had, come to sit with ghosts with him beside the fire. He had never, like Augustine, loved to love. He had only loved to know. But none of us escapes to the last the yearnings which make us men. The squire becomes conscious that certain fibres he had thought long since dead in him had been all the while twining themselves silently around the disciple who had shown him in many respects such a filial consideration and confidence. That young man might have become to him the son of his old age, the one human being from whom, as weakness of mind and body break him down, even his indomitable spirit might have accepted the sweetness of human pity, the comfort of human help. 
and it is his own hand which has done most to break the nascent, slowly-forming tie. He is bereft himself. With what incredible recklessness had he been acting all these months? It was the levity of his own proceeding which stared him in the face. His rough hand had closed on the delicate wings of a soul as a boy crushes the butterfly he pursues. As Ellesmere had stood looking back at him from the library door, the suffering which spoke in every line of that changed face had stirred a sudden troubled remorse in Roger Wendover. It was mere justice that one result of that suffering should be to leave himself forlorn. He had been thinking and writing of religion, of the history of ideas, all his life. Had he ever yet grasped the meaning of religion to the religious man? God and faith. What have these venerable ideas ever mattered to him personally, except to the subjects of the most ingenious analysis, the most delicate historical inductions? Not only sceptical to the core, but constitutionally indifferent, the squire had always found enough to make life amply worth living in the mere dissection of other men's beliefs. But to-night, the unexpected shock of feeling mingled with the terrible sense, periodically alive in him, of physical doom, seems to have stripped from the thorny soul its outer defences of mental habit. She sees once more the hideous spectacle of his father's death, his own black, half-remembered moments of warning, the teasing horror of his sister's increasing weakness of brain. Life has been, on the whole, a burden, though there has been a certain joy, no doubt, in the fierce intellectual struggle of it. And tonight, it seems so nearly over. A cold presence of death creeps over the squire as he sits in the lamplit silence. His eye seems to be actually penetrating the eternal vastness which lies about our life. He feels himself old, feeble, alone. The awe, the terror which are at the root of all religions, have fallen even upon him at last. The fire burns lower. The night wears on. Outside, an airless, misty moonlight lies over park and field. Hark, was that a sound upstairs in one of those silent, empty rooms? The squire half rises, one hand on his chair, his blanched face strained, listening. Again? Is it a footstep, or simply a delusion of the ear? He rises, pushing aside the curtains into the inner library, where the lamps have almost burnt away, creeps up the wooden stair, and into the deserted upper story. Why was that door into the end room, his father's room, open? He'd seen it closed that afternoon. No one had been there since. He stepped nearer. Was that simply a gleam of moonlight on the polished floor, confused lines of shadow thrown by the vine outside, and was that sound nothing but the stirring of the rising wind of dawn against the open casement window, or— My God! The squire fled downstairs. He gained his chair again. He sat upright an instant, impressing on himself with sardonic, vindictive force some of those truisms as to the action of mind on body, of brain process on sensation, which had been part of his life's work to illustrate. The philosopher had time to realise a shuddering fellowship of weakness with his kind, to see himself as a helpless instance of an inexorable law, before he fell back in his chair, a swoon, born of pitiful human terror, terror of things unseen, creeping over heart and brain. End of Book 4 Chapter 30book 5 chapter 31 of robert ellesmere by mary augusta ward this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by simon evers book 5 rose chapter 31 it was a november afternoon london lay wrapped in rainy fog the atmosphere was such as only a londoner can breathe with equanimity and the gloom was indescribable meanwhile in defiance of the inferno outside Festal preparations were being made in a little house on Camden Hill. Lamps were lit. In the drawing-room chairs were pushed back. The piano was open, and a violin stand towered beside it. Chrysanthemums were everywhere. An invalid lady in a best cap occupied the sofa, 
and two girls were flitting about, clearly making the last arrangements necessary for a musical afternoon. The invalid was Mrs. Laban. The girls, of course, Rose and Agnes. Rose at last was safely settled in her longed-for London, and an artistic company of the sort her soul loved was coming to tea with her. Of Rose's summer at Burwood, very little need to be said. She was conscious that she had not borne it very well. She had been off-hand with Mrs. Thornburg, and enjoyed one or two open skirmishes with Mrs. Seaton. Her whole temper had been irritating and irritable. She was perfectly aware of it. Towards her sick mother, indeed, she had controlled herself. Nor, for such a restless creature, had she made a bad nurse. But Agnes had endured much, and found it all the harder because she was so totally in the dark as to the whys and wherefores of her sister's moods. Rose herself would have scornfully denied that any whys and wherefores, beyond her rigid dislike of Windale, existed. Since her return from Berlin, and especially since that moment when, as she was certain, Mr. Langham had avoided her and Catherine at the National Gallery, she had been calmly certain of her own heart wholeness. Berlin had developed her precisely as she had desired that it might. The necessities of the bohemian student's life had trained her to a new independence and shrewdness, and in her own opinion she was now a woman of the world, judging all things by pure reasons. Oh, of course she understood him perfectly. In the first place, at the time of their first meeting she had been a mere bread-and-butter miss, the easiest of praise for any one who might wish to get a few hours' amusement and distraction out of her temper and caprices. In the next place, even supposing he had been ever inclined to fall in love with her, which her new sardonic fairness of mind obliged her to regard as entirely doubtful, he was a man to whom marriage was impossible. How could anyone expect such a superfine dreamer to turn breadwinner for a wife and household? Imagine Mr. Langham interviewed by a rate-collector, or troubled about coals. As to her, simply, she had misunderstood the laws of the game. It was a little bitter to have to confess it, a little bitter that he should have seen it, and have felt reluctantly compelled to recall the facts to her. But after all, most girls have some young follies to blush over. So far the little cynic would get, becoming rather more scarlet, however, over the process of reflection that was quite compatible with the ostentatious worldly wisdom of it. Then a suddenly inward restlessness would break through, and she would spend a passionate hour pacing up and down, and hungering for the moment when she might avenge upon herself and him the week of silly friendship he had found it necessary, as her elder and monitor, to cut short. In September came the news of Robert's resignation of his living. Mother and daughters sat looking at each other over the letter, stupefied. That this calamity of all others should have fallen on Catherine of all women! Rose said very little, and presently jumped up with shining, excited eyes, and ran out for a walk with Bob, leaving Agnes to console their tearful and agitated mother. When she came in, she went singing about the house as usual. Agnes, who was moved by the news out of all her ordinary sang-froid, was outraged by what seemed to her Rose's callousness. She wrote a letter to Catherine, which Catherine put among her treasures, so strangely unlike it was to the quiet, indifferent Agnes of every day. Rose spent a morning over an attempt at a letter, which, when it reached its destination, only wounded Catherine by its constraint and convention. And yet that same night, when the child was alone, suddenly some phrase of Catherine's letter recurred to her. She saw, as any imaginative people see, with every detail visualised, her sister's suffering, her sister's struggle that was to be. She jumped into bed, and stifling all sounds under the clothes, cried herself to sleep, which did not prevent her next morning from harbouring somewhere at the bottom of her a wicked and furtive satisfaction that Catherine might now learn there were more opinions in the world than one. As for the rest of the valley, Mrs. Leyburn soon passed from bewailing to a plaintive indignation with Robert, which was a relief to her daughters. It seemed to her a reflection on Richard that Robert should have behaved so. Church opinions have been good enough for Richard. The young men seem to think, my dears, their fathers were all fools. The vicar, good man, was sincerely distressed, but sincerely confident also, that in time Ellesmere would find his way back into the fold. In Mrs. Thornburg's dismay, 
there was a secret, superstitious pang. Perhaps she had better not have meddled. Perhaps it was never well to meddle. One event bears many readings, and the tragedy of Catherine Ellesmere's life took shape in the uneasy consciousness of the vicar's spouse as a more or less sharp admonition against wilfulness in matchmaking. Of course, Rose had her way as to wintering in London. They came up in the middle of October, while the Ellesmeres were still abroad, and settled into a small house in Lerwick Gardens, Camden Hill, which Catherine had secured for them on her way through town to the continent. As soon as Mrs. Leyburn had been made comfortable, Rose set to work to look up her friends. She owed her acquaintance in London hitherto mainly to Mr. and Mrs. Pearson, the young barrister and his aesthetic wife whom she had originally met and made friends with in a railway carriage. Mr. Pearson was bustling and shrewd, not made of the finest clay, but yet not at all a bad fellow. His wife, the daughter of a famous Mrs. Leo Hunter of a bygone generation, was small, untidy, and in all matters of religious or political opinion, emancipated to an extreme. She had also a strong vein of inherited social ambition, and she and her husband welcomed Rose with greater effusion than ever, in proportion as she was more beautiful and more indisputably gifted than ever. They placed themselves and their house at the girl's service, partly out of genuine admiration and good nature, partly also because they divined in her a profitable social appendage. For the Pearsons socially were still climbing, and had by no means attained. Their world so far consisted too much of the odds and ends of most other worlds. They were not satisfied with it, and the friendship of the girl violinist, whose vivacious beauty and artistic gift made a stir wherever she went, was a very welcome addition to their resources. They fated her in their own house. They took her to the houses of other people. Society smiled on Miss Laban's protectors more than it had ever smiled on Mr. and Mrs. Pearson taken alone. And meanwhile Rose, flushed, excited, and totally unsuspicious, thought the world a fairy tale, and lived from morning till night in a perpetual din of music, compliments, and bravos, which seemed to her life indeed, life at last. With the beginning of November the Ellesmeres returned, and about the same time Rose began to project tea-parties of her own, to which Mrs. Laban gave a flurried assent. When the invitations were written, Rose sat staring at them a little, pen in hand. "'I wonder what Catherine will say to some of these people,' she remarked in a dubious voice to Agnes. "'Some of them are queer, I admit, but after all those two superior persons will have to get used to my friends some time, and they may as well begin.' "'You cannot expect poor Cathy to come.' said Agnes, with sudden energy. Rose's eyebrows went up. Agnes resented her ironical expression, and with a word or two of quite unusual sharpness, got up and went. Rose, left alone, sprang up suddenly, and clasped her white fingers above her head with a long breath. "'Where my heart used to be there is now just a black, cold cinder,' she remarked with sarcastic emphasis. "'I am sure I used to be a nice girl once.' but it is so long ago I can't remember it. She stayed so a minute or more, then two tears suddenly broke and fell. She dashed them angrily away, and sat down again to her note-writing. Amongst the cards she had still to fill up was one of which the envelope was addressed to the Honourable Hugo Flaxman, Ninety St. James's Place. Lady Charlotte, though she had afterwards again left town, had been in Martin Street at the end of October. The Laburns had lunched there, and had been introduced by her to her nephew and Lady Helen's brother, Mr. Flaxman. The girls had found him agreeable. He had called the week afterwards when they were not at home, and Rose now carelessly sent him a card, with the inward reflection that he was much too great a man to come, and was probably enjoy himself at country houses, as every aristocrat should in November. The following day the two girls made their way over to Bedford Square, while the Ellesmeres had taken a house in order to be near the British Museum. They pushed their way upstairs through a medley of packing-cases and a sickening smell of paint. There was a sound of an opening door, and a gentleman stepped out of the back room, which was to be Ellesmere's study, on to the landing. It was Edward Langham. He and Rose stood and stared at each other a moment. Then Rose, in the coolest, lightest voice, introduced him to Agnes. Agnes, with one curious glance, 
took in her sister's defiant, smiling ease and the stranger's embarrassment. Then she went on to find Catherine. The two left behind exchanged a few banal questions and answers. Langham had only allowed himself one look at the dazzling face and eyes framed in fur cap and boa. Afterwards he stood making a study of the ground and answering her remarks in his usual stumbling fashion. What was it had gone out of her voice? Simply the soft, callow sounds of first youth? And what a personage she had grown in these twelve months! How formidably, consciously brilliant in look and dress and manner! Yes, he was still in town, settled there indeed for some time. And she, was there any special day on which Mrs. Laban received visitors? He asked the question, of course, with various hesitations and circumlocutions. Oh, dear, yes. Would you come next Wednesday, for instance, and inspect a musical menagerie? The animals will go through their performances from four till seven. And I can answer for it that some of the specimens will be entirely new to you. What prospect offered could hardly be more repellent to him, but he got out an acceptance somehow. She nodded lightly to him, and passed on, and he went downstairs, his head in a whirl. Where had the crude, pretty child of yesteryear departed to, impulsive, conceited, readily offended, easily touched, sensitive as to what all the world might think of her and her performances? The girl he had just left had counted all her resources, tried the edge of all her weapons, and knew her own place too well to ask for anybody else's appraisement. What beauty! Good heavens, what a plomb! The rich husband Elsmere talked of would hardly take much waiting for. So cogitating, Langham took his way westward to his Beaumont Street rooms. They were on the second floor, small, dingy, choked with books. Ordinarily, he shut the door behind him with a sigh of content. This evening they seemed to him intolerably confined and stuffy. He thought of going out to his club and a concert, but did nothing, after all, but sit brooding over the fire till midnight, alternately hugging and hating his solitude. And so we return to the Wednesday following this unexpected meeting. The drawing-room at number 27 was beginning to fill. Rose stood at the door receiving the guests as they flowed in, while Agnes, in the background, dispensed tea. She was discussing with herself the probability of Langham's appearance. "'Whom shall I introduce him to first? she pondered while she shook hands. "'The poet? I see Mamma is now struggling with him. "'The cellist with the hair? Or the lady in Greek dress? Or the esoteric Buddhist? What a fascinating selection! I had really no notion we should be quite so curious.' Mitros, they wait for you,' said a charming, golden-bearded young German, viola in hand, bowing before her. He and his kind were most of them in love with her already, and them all the more so because she knew so well how to keep them at a distance. She went off, beckoning to Agnes to take her place, and the quartet began. The young German aforesaid played the viola, while the cello was divinely played by a Hungarian, of whose outer man it need only be said that in wild profusion of much tortured hair, in Hebraism of feature, and sparthy smoothness of cheek, he belonged to that type which nature would seem to have already used to excess in the production of the continental musician. Rose herself was violinist, and the instruments dashed into the opening allegro with a precision and an entrain that took the room by storm. In the middle of it, Langham pushed his way into the crowd round the drawing-room door. Through the heads about him he could see her standing a little in advance of the others, her head turned to one side, really in the natural attitude of violin playing, but, as it seemed to him, in a kind of ravishment of listening, cheeks flushed, eyes shining, and the right arm and high curved wrist managing the bow with a grace born of knowledge and fine training. "'Very much improved, eh?' says an English professional to a German neighbour, lifting his eyebrows interrogatively. The other nodded with the business-like air of one who knows. Joachim, they say, war durabau entzugt, and did his best with her, and now a dame has got her, naming a famous violinist. She will make fast progress. He will stamp upon her tricks. But will she ever be more than a very clever amateur? Too pretty, eh? And the questioner nudged his companion, dropping his voice. Langham would have given worlds to get on into the room, over the prostrate body of the speaker by preference, but the laws of mass and weight had him at their mercy, 
and he was rooted to the spot. The other shrugged his shoulders. "'Well, with a pretty woman, or behaupt, it doesn't mean business. It's society, the dukes and the duchesses, the ruins or the young talents.' This whispered conversation went on during the andante. With the scherzo, the two hirsute faces broke into broad smiles. The artist behind each woke up, and Langham heard no more except guttural sounds of delight and quick notes of technical criticism. How that scherzo danced and coquetted, and how the presto flew as though all the winds were behind it, chasing its mad eddies of notes through listening space. At the end, amid a wild storm of applause, she laid down her violin, and proudly smiling, her breast still heaving with excitement and exertion, received the praises of those crowding round her. The group round the door was precipitated forward, and Langham with it. She saw him in a moment. Her white brow contracted, and she gave him a quick but hardly smiling glance of recognition through the crowd. He thought there was no chance of getting at her, and moved aside amid the general hubbub to look at a picture. "'Mr. Langham, how do you do?' He turned sharply and found her beside him. She had come to him with malice in her heart, malice born of smart and long, smouldering pain. But as she caught his look, the look of the nervous, short-sighted scholar and recluse, as her glance swept over the delicate refinement of the face, a sudden softness quivered in her own. The game was so defenceless. "'You will find nobody here, you know,' she said abruptly, a little under her breath. "'I am morally certain you never saw a single person in the room before.' "'Shall I introduce you?' "'Delighted, of course, but don't disturb yourself about me, Miss Laban. "'I come out of my hole so seldom, everything amuses me, "'but especially looking and listening.' "'Which means,' she said with frank audacity, "'that you dislike new people.' "'His eye kindled at once. "'Say, rather, that it means a preference for the people that are not new. "'There is such a thing as concentrating one's attention. "'I came to hear you play, Miss Laban.' "'Well?' She glanced at him from under her long lashes, one hand playing with the rings on the other. He thought suddenly, with a sting of regret, of the confiding child who had flushed under his praise that Sunday evening at Muirwell. "'Superb,' he said, but half mechanically. "'I had no notion a winter's work would have done so much for you. Was Berlin as stimulating as you expected? When I heard you had gone, I said to myself, "'Well, at least now there is one completely happy person in Europe.' "'Did you? How easily we all dogmatise about each other,' she said scornfully. Her manner was by no means simple. He did not feel himself at all at ease with her. His very embarrassment, however, drove him into rashness, as often happens. "'I thought I had enough to go upon,' he said in another tone, and his black eyes, sparkling as though a film had dropped from them, supplied the reference his words forbore. She turned away from him with a perceptible drawing up of the whole figure. "'Will you come and be introduced?' she asked him coldly. He bowed as coldly, and followed her. Wholesome resentment of her manner was denied him. He had asked for her friendship, and had then gone away and forgotten her. Clearly what she meant him to see now was that they were strangers again. Well, she was amply in her right— he suspected that his allusion to their first talk over the fire had not been unwelcome to her as an opportunity. And he had actually debated whether he should come, lest in spite of himself she might beguile him once more into those old lapses of will and common sense. Coxcomb! He made a few spasmodic efforts of conversation with the lady to whom she had introduced him, then awkwardly disengaged himself and went to stand in a corner and study his neighbours. Close to him, he found, was the poet of the party, got up in the most correct professional costume. Long hair, velvet coat, eyeglass, and all. His extravagance, however, was of the most conventional type. Only his vanity had a touch of the sublime. Langham, who possessed a sort of fine-ear gift for catching conversation, heard him saying to an open-eyed ingenue beside him, oh, "'My literary baggage is small as yet. I've only done perhaps three things that will live.' "'Oh, Mr. Wood,' said the maiden, mildly protesting against so much modesty. He smiled, thrusting his hand into the breast of the velvet coat. "'But then,' he said in a tone of the purest candour, "'at my age I don't think Shelley had done more.' Langham, who, like all shy men, 
was liable to occasional explosions, was seized with a convulsive fit of coughing, and had to retire from the neighbourhood of the bard, who looked round him, disturbed and slightly frowning. At last he discovered a point of view in the back room, whence he could watch the humours of the crowd without coming too closely in contact with them. What a miscellaneous collection it was! He began to be irritably jealous for Rose's place in the world. She ought to be more adequately surrounded than this. What was Mrs. Laban? What were the Ellesmeres about? He rebelled against the thought of her living perpetually among her inferiors, the centre of a vulgar publicity, queen of the second rate. It provoked him that she should be amusing herself so well. Her laughter, every now and then, came ringing into the back room, and presently there was a general hubbub. Langham craned his neck forward and saw a struggle going on over a roll of music between Rose and the long-haired, long-nosed violoncellist. Evidently she did not want to play some particular piece and wished to put it out of sight, whereupon the Hungarian, who had been clamouring for it, rushed to its rescue, and there was a mock fight over it. At last, amid the applause of the room, Rose was beaten, and her conqueror, flourishing the music on high, executed a kind of parcel of triumph. Victoria, he cried, now then for the conditions of peace. Miss Rose, will you kindly tune up? You are as mock beaten as the French at Sedan. Not a stone of my fortress, not an inch of my territory, said Rose with fine emphasis, crossing her white wrists behind her. The Hungarian looked at her, the wild poetic strain in him which was the strain of race asserting itself. But if de victor bows, he said, dropping on one knee before her, if force lay down his spoils at defeat of beauty? The circle round them applauded hotly, the touch of theatricality finding immediate response. Langham was remorselessly conscious of the man's absurd chevelure and ill-fitting clothes. But Rose herself had evidently nothing but relish for the scene. Proudly smiling, she held out her hand for her property, and as soon as she had it safe, she whisked it into the open drawer of a cabinet standing near, and drawing out the key, held it up a moment in her taper fingers, and then, depositing it in a little velvet bag hanging at her girdle, she closed the snap upon it with a little vindictive wave of triumph. Every movement was graceful, rapid, effective. Half a dozen German throats broke into guttural protest. Amid the storm of laughter and remonstrance, the door suddenly opened. The fluttered parlour-maid mumbled a long name, and with a port of soldierly uprightness there advanced behind her a large fair-haired woman followed by a gentleman, and in the distance by another figure. Rose drew back a moment astounded, one hand on the piano, her dress sweeping round her. An awkward silence fell on the chattering circle of musicians. "'Good heavens!' said Langham to himself. "'Lady Charlotte Winstay!' "'How do you do, Miss Laban?' said one of the most piercing of voices. "'Are you surprised to see me? You didn't ask me. Perhaps you don't want me. But I have come, you see, partly because my nephew was coming.' And she pointed to the gentleman behind her. "'Partly because I meant to punish you for not having come to see me last Thursday. Why didn't you?' "'Because we thought you were still away,' said Rose, who had by this time recovered her self-possession. "'But if you meant to punish me, Lady Charlotte, you've done it badly. I'm delighted to see you. May I introduce my sister? Agnes, will you find Lady Charlotte Winstay a chair by Mamma? "'Oh, you wish I see to dispose of me at once?' said the other imperturbably. "'What is happening? Is it music?' "'Aunt Charlotte, that is most disingenuous on your part. I gave you ample warning.' Rose turned a smiling face towards the speaker. It was Mr. Flaxman, Lady Charlotte's companion. "'You need not have drawn the picture too black, Mr. Flaxman. There is an escape. If Lady Charlotte will only let my sister take her into the next room, she will find herself well out of the clutches of the music. Oh, Robert, here you are at last. Lady Charlotte, you remember my brother-in-law? Robert, will you get Lady Charlotte some tea?' "'I am not going to be banished,' said Mr. Flaxman, looking down upon her, his well-bred, slightly worn face aglow with animation and pleasure. "'Then you will be deafened,' said Rose, laughing, as she escaped from him a moment, to arrange for a song from a tall, formidable maiden, built off the fashion of Mr. Gilbert's contralto heroines, with a voice which bore out the ample promise of her frame. 
"'Your sister is a terribly self-possessed young person, Mr. Ellesmere,' said Lady Charlotte, as Robert piloted her across the room. "'Does that imply praise or blame on your part, Lady Charlotte?' asked Robert, smiling. "'Neither at present. I don't know Miss Laban well enough. I merely state a fact. No tea, Mr. Ellesmere. I have had three teas already, and I am not like the American woman who could always worry down another cup.' She was introduced to Mrs. Laban, but the plaintive invalid was immediately seized with terror of her voice and appearance, and was infinitely grateful to Robert for removing her as promptly as possible to a chair on the border of the two rooms, where she could talk or listen as she pleased. For a few moments she listened to Fräulein Adelman's veiled, unmanageable contralto. Then she turned magisterially to Robert, standing behind her. "'The art of singing has gone out,' she declared, since the Germans have been allowed to meddle in it. "'By the way, Mr. Ellesmere, how do you manage to be here? Are you taking a holiday?' Robert looked at her with a start. "'I have left Muirwell, Lady Charlotte.' "'Left Muirwell?' she said in astonishment, turning round to look at him, her eyeglass in her eye. "'Why has Helen told me nothing about it? Have you got another living?' "'No, my wife and I are settling in London. We only told Lady Helen of our intention a few weeks ago.' To which it may be added that Lady Helen, touched and dismayed by Earlsmere's letter to her, had not been very eager to hand over the woes of her friends to her aunt's cool and irresponsible comments. Lady Charlotte deliberately looked at him a minute longer through her glass. Then she let it fall. "'You don't mean to tell me any more, I can see, Mr. Ellesmere. But you will allow me to be astonished.' "'Certainly,' he said, smiling sadly, and immediately afterwards relapsing into silence. "'Have you heard of the squire lately?' he asked her, after a pause. "'Not from him. We are excellent friends when we meet, but he doesn't consider me worth writing to. His sister, little idiot, writes to me every now and then, but she has not vouchsafed me a letter since the summer. I should say from the last accounts that he was breaking.' "'He had a mysterious attack of illness just before I left,' said Robert gravely. "'It made one anxious.' "'Oh, it is the old story. All the Wendovers have died of weak hearts or queer brains, generally of both together. I imagine you had some experience of the squire's queerness at one time, Mr. Ellesmere. I can't say you and he seemed to be on particularly good terms on the only occasion I ever had the pleasure of meeting you at Muirwell. She looked up at him, smiling grimly. She had a curiously exact memory for the unpleasant scenes of life. Oh, you remember that unlucky evening, said Robert, reddening a little. We soon got over that. We became great friends. Again, however, Lady Charlotte was struck by the quiet melancholy of his tone. How strangely the look of youth, which had been so attractive in him the year before, had ebbed from the man's face, from complexion, eyes, expression. She stared at him, full of a brusque, tormenting curiosity as to the how and why. "'I hope there is someone among you strong enough to manage Miss Rose,' she said presently, with an abrupt change of subject. "'That little sister-in-law of yours is going to be the rage.' "'Heaven forbid!' cried Robert fervently. "'Heaven will do nothing of the kind. She is twice as pretty as she was last year. I am told she plays twice as well. She had always the sort of manner that provoked people one moment and charmed them the next. And, to judge by my few words with her just now, I should say she had developed it finely. Well, now, Mr. Ellesmere, who is going to take care of her?' "'I suppose we shall all have a try at it, Lady Charlotte.' "'Her mother doesn't look to me a person of nerve enough,' said Lady Charlotte coolly. "'She is a girl certain, absolutely certain, to have adventures, and you may as well be prepared for them.' "'I can only trust that she will disappoint your expectations, Lady Charlotte,' said Robert, with a slightly sarcastic emphasis. "'Elsmere, who is that man talking to Miss Laban?' asked Langham, as the two friends stood side by side, a little later, watching the spectacle. A certain Mr. Flaxman, brother to a pretty little neighbour of ours in Surrey, Lady Helen Varley, a nephew to Lady Charlotte. I've not seen him here before, but I think the girls like him. Is he the Flaxman who got the mathematical prize at Berlin last year? Yes, I believe so. A striking person altogether. He's enormously rich, Lady Helen tells me, in spite of an elder brother. All the money in his mother's family has come to him, and he's the heir to Lord Daniel's great Derbyshire property. 
Twelve years ago I used to hear him talked about incessantly by the Cambridge men one met. Citizen Flaxman, they called him, for his opinion's sake. He would ask his scout to dinner, and insist on dining with his own servants and shaking hands with his friend's butlers. The scouts and the butlers put an end to that, and altogether, I imagine, the world disappointed him. He has a story, poor fellow, too, a young wife who died with her first baby ten years ago. The world supposes him never to have got over it, which makes him all the more interesting. A distinguished face, don't you think? The good type of English aristocrat. Langham assented, but his attention was fixed on the group in which Rose's bright hair was conspicuous. And when Robert left him and went to amuse Mrs. Laban, he still stood rooted to the same spot, watching. Rose was leaning against the piano, one hand behind her, her whole attitude full of a young, easy, self-confident grace. Mr. Flaxman was standing beside her, and they were deep in talk. Serious talk, apparently, to judge by her quiet manner and the charmed, attentive interest of his look. Occasionally, however, there was a sally on her part, and an answering flash of laughter on his. But the stream of conversation closed immediately over the interruption, and flowed on as evenly as before. Unconsciously, Langham retreated farther and farther into the comparative darkness of the inner room. He felt himself singularly insignificant and out of place, and he made no more efforts to talk. Rose played a violin solo, and played it with astonishing delicacy and fire. When it was over, Langham saw her turn from the applauding circle crowding in upon her, and throw a smiling, interrogative look over her shoulder at Mr. Flaxman. Mr. Flaxman bent over her, and as he spoke, Langham caught her flush and the excited sparkle of her eyes. Was this the someone in the stream? No doubt, no doubt. When the party broke up, Langham found himself borne towards the outer room, and before he knew where he was going, he was standing beside her. "'Are you here still?' she said to him, startled, as he held out his hand. He replied by some comments on the music, a little lumbering and infelicitous, as all his small talk was. She hardly listened, but presently she looked up nervously, compelled, as it were, by the great melancholy eyes above her. "'We are not always in this turmoil, Mr. Langham. Perhaps some other day you will come and make friends with my mother?' End a Book 5, Chapter 31 Book 5, Chapter 32 of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Book 5, Chapter 32 Naturally, it was during their two months of autumn travel that Ellesmere and Catherine first realised in detail what Ellesmere's act was to mean to them, as husband and wife, in the future. Each left England with the most tender and heroic resolves, and no one who knows anything of life will need to be told that even for these two finely-natured people such resolves were infinitely easier to make than to carry out. "'I will not preach to you. I will not persecute you,' Catherine had said to her husband at the moment of her first shock and anguish. And she did her utmost, poor thing, to keep her word." All through the innumerable bitternesses which accompanied Ellesmere's withdrawal from Muirwell, the letters which followed them, the remonstrances of public and private friends, the paragraphs which found their way do what they would into the newspapers, the pain of deserting, as it seemed to her, certain poor and helpless folk who had been taught to look to her and Robert, and whose bewildered lamentations came to them through young Armistead. Through all this she held her peace. She did her best to soften Robert's grief. She never once reproached him with her own. But at the same time the inevitable separation of their inmost hopes and beliefs had thrown her back on herself, had immensely strengthened that Puritan independent fibre in her which her youth had developed and which her happy marriage had only temporarily masked, not weakened. Never had Catherine believed so strongly and intensely as now, when the husband, who had been the guide and inspirer of her religious life, had given up the old faith and practices. By virtue of a kind of nervous instinctive dread, his relaxations bred increased rigidity in her. Often, when she was alone, or at night, she was seized with a lonely and awful sense of responsibility. 
Oh, let her guard her faith, not only for her own sake, her child's, her lord's, but for his, that it might be given to her patience at last to lead him back. And the only way in which it seemed to her possible to guard it was to set up certain barriers of silence. She feared that fiery, persuasive quality in Robert she had so often seen at work on other people. With him, conviction was life. It was the man himself, to an extraordinary degree. How was she to resist the pressure of those new ardours with which his mind was filling? She who loved him, except by building, at any rate for the time, an enclosure of silence round her Christian beliefs. It was in some ways a pathetic repetition of the situation between Robert and the squire in the early days of their friendship. But in Catherine's mind there was no troubling presence of new knowledge conspiring from within with the forces without. At this moment of her life she was more passionately convinced than ever that the only knowledge truly worth having in this world was the knowledge of God's mercies in Christ. So, gradually, with a gentle persistency, she withdrew certain parts of herself from Robert's ken. She avoided certain subjects, or anything that might lead to them. She ignored the religious and philosophical books he was constantly reading. She prayed and thought alone, always for him, of him, but still resolutely alone. It was impossible, however, that so great a change in their life could be effected without a perpetual sense of breaking links, a perpetual series of dumb wounds and griefs on both sides. There came a moment when, as he sat alone one evening in a pine wood above the lake of Geneva, Elsmere suddenly awoke to the conviction that in spite of all his efforts and illusions, their relation to each other was altering, dwindling, impoverishing. The terror of that summer night at Muirwell was being dismally justified. His own mind during this time was in a state of perpetual discovery, sailing the seas where there was never sand, the vast shadowy seas of speculative thought. All his life, reserved to those nearest to him, had been pain and grief to him. He was one of those people, as we know, who throw off readily, to whom sympathy, expansion, are indispensable, who suffer physically and mentally from anything cold and rigid beside them. And now, at every turn, in their talk, their reading, in many of the smallest details of their common existence, Elsmere began to feel the presence of this cold and rigid something. He was ever conscious of self-defence on her side, of pains drawing back on his. And with every succeeding effort of his at self-repression, it seemed to him as though fresh nails were driven into the coffin of that old free habit of perfect confidence which had made the heaven of their life since they had been man and wife. He sat on for long, through the September evening, pondering, wrestling. Was it simply inevitable, the natural result of his own act, and of her antecedents, to which he must submit himself, as to any mutilation or loss of power in the body? The young lover and husband rebelled, the believer rebelled, against the admission. Probably, if his change had left him ankleless and forsaken, as it leaves many men, he would have been ready enough to submit, in terror lest his own forlornness should bring about hers. But in spite of the intellectual confusion which inevitably attends any wholesale reconstruction of man's platform of action, he had never been more sure of God, or the divine aims of the world, than now, never more open than now, amid this exquisite alpine world, to those passionate moments of religious trust which are man's eternal defiance to the iron silences about him. Originally, as we know, he had shrunk from the thought of change in her corresponding to his own. Now that his own foothold was strengthening, his longing for a new union was overpowering that old dread. The proselytizing instinct may be never quite morally defensible, even as between husband and wife. Nevertheless, in all strong, convinced and ardent souls, it exists, and must be reckoned with. At last, one evening, he was overcome by a sudden impulse which neutralised for the moment his nervous dread of hurting her. Some little incident of their day together was rankling, and it was borne in upon him that almost any violent protest on her part would have been preferable to this constant soft evasion of hers, which was gradually, imperceptibly, dividing heart from heart. They were in a bare attic room at the very top of one of the huge newly built hotels which during the last twenty years have invaded all the high places of Switzerland. The August, which had been so hot in England, had been rainy and broken in Switzerland. But it had been followed by a warm and mellow September, 
and the favourite hotels below a certain height were still full. When the Ellesmeres arrived at Les Avons, this scantily furnished garret, out of which some servants had been hurried to make room for them, was all that could be found. They, however, liked it for its space and its view. They looked sideways from their windows on to the upper end of the lake, three thousand feet below them. Opposite, across the blue water, rose a grandiose rampart of mountains, the stage on which from morn till night the sun went through a long transformation scene of beauty. The water was marked every now and then by passing boats and steamers, tiny specks which served to measure the vastness of all around them. To right and left, spurs of green mountains shut out alike the lower lake and the icy splendours of the valet depth profound. What made the charm of the narrow prospect was, first, the sense it produced in the spectator of hanging dizzily above the lake, with infinite air below them, and, then, the magical effects of dawn and evening, when the wreaths of mist would blot out the valley and the lake, and leave the eye of the watcher face to face across the fathomless abyss with the majestic mountain mass, and its attendant retinue of clouds, as though they and he were alone in the universe. It was a peaceful September night. From the open window beside him, Robert could see a world of high moonlight, limited and invaded on all sides by sharp black masses of shade. A few rare lights glimmered on the spreading alp below, and every now and then a breath of music came to them, wafted from a military band playing a mile or two away. They had been climbing most of the afternoon, and Catherine was lying down, her brown hair loose about her, the thin oval of her face and clear line of brow just visible in the dim candlelight. Suddenly he stretched out his hand for his Greek testament, which was always near him, though there had been no common reading since that bitter day of his confession to her. The mark still lay in the well-worn volume at the point reached in their last reading at Muirwell. He opened upon it, and began the eleventh chapter of St. John. Catherine trembled when she saw him take up the book. He began without preface, treating the passage before him in his usual way, that is to say, taking verse after verse in the Greek, translating and commenting. She never spoke all through, and at last he closed the little testament, and bent towards her, his look full of feeling. "'Catherine, can't you let me—will you never let me tell you how now, how that story, how the old things affect me, from the new point of view? You always stop me when I try. I believe you think of me as having thrown it all away. Would it not comfort you sometimes if you knew that, although much of the Gospels, this very raising of Lazarus, for instance, seem to me no longer true in the historical sense, still they are always full to me of an ideal, a poetical truth. Lazarus may not have died and come to life, may never have existed, but still to me, now as always, love for Jesus of Nazareth is resurrection and life. He spoke with the most painful diffidence the most wistful tenderness. There was a pause. Then Catherine said in a rigid, constrained voice, "'If the Gospels are not true in fact, as history, as reality, I cannot see how they are true at all, or, or of any value.' The next minute she rose, and going to the little wooden dressing-table, she began to brush out and plait for the night her straight, silky veil of hair. As she passed him, Robert saw her face pale and set. He sat quiet another moment or two, and then he went towards her and took her in his arms. "'Catherine,' he said to her, his lips trembling, "'am I never to speak my mind to you any more? Do you mean always to hold me at arm's length, to refuse always to hear what I have to say, in defence of the change which has cost us both so much?' She hesitated, trying hard to restrain herself but it was of no use. She broke into tears, quiet but most bitter tears. "'Robert, I cannot. Oh, you must see I cannot. It is not because I am hard, but because I am weak. How can I stand up against you? I dare not. I dare not. If you were not yourself, not my husband—' Her voice dropped. Robert guessed that at the bottom of her resistance there was an intolerable fear of what love might do with her if she once gave it an opening. He felt himself cruel, brutal, 
and yet an urgent sense of all that was at stake drove him on. "'I would not press or worry you, God knows,' he said, almost piteously, kissing her forehead as she lay against him. "'But remember, Catherine, I, I cannot put these things aside. I once thought I could, that I could fall back on my historical work and leave religious matters alone as far as criticism was concerned. But I cannot. They fill my mind more and more. I feel more and more impelled to search them out and to put my conclusions about them into shape. And all the time this is going on, are you and I to remain strangers to one another in all that concerns our truest life? Are we, Catherine?' He spoke in a low voice of intense feeling. She turned her face and pressed her lips to his hand. Both had the scene in the woodpath after her flight and return in their minds, and both were filled with the despairing sense of the difficulty of living, not through great crises, but through the detail of every day. "'Could you not work at other things?' she whispered. He was silent looking straight before him into the moonlit shimmer and white spectral hazes of the valley, his arms still round her. "'No,' he burst out at last, "'not till I have satisfied myself. I feel it burning within me, like a command from God, to work out the problem, to make it clearer to myself, and to others,' he added deliberately. Her heart sank within her. The last words called up before her a dismal future of controversy and publicity, in which at every step she would be condemning her husband. "'And all this time, all these years, perhaps,' he went on, before in her perplexity she could find words, "'is my wife never going to let me speak freely to her? Am I to act, think, judge without her knowledge? Is she to know less of me than a friend, less even than the public for whom I write or speak?' It seemed intolerable to him, all the more that every moment they stood there together it was being impressed upon him that in fact this was what she meant, what she had contemplated from the beginning. "'Robert, I cannot defend myself against you,' she cried, again clinging to him. "'Oh, think for me. You know what I feel, that I dare not risk what is not mine.' He kissed her again, and then moved away from her to the window. It began to be plain to him that his effort was merely futile, and had better not have been made. But his heart was very sore. "'Do you ever ask yourself?' he said presently, looking steadily into the night. "'No, I don't think you can, Catherine. What part, the reasoning faculty, that faculty which marks us out from the animal, was meant to play in life? Did God give it us simply that you might trample upon it and ignore it?' both in yourself and me?' She had dropped into a chair, and sat with clasped hands, her hair falling about her white dressing-gown, and framing the noble-featured face blanched by the moonlight. She did not attempt a reply, but the melancholy of an invincible resolution, which was, so to speak, not her own doing, but rather was like a necessity imposed upon her from outside, breathed through her silence. He turned and looked at her. She raised her arms, and the gesture reminded him for a moment of the Donatello figure in the Muirwell Library, the same delicate, austere beauty, the same tenderness, the same underlying reserve. He took her outstretched hands and held them against his breast. His hotly beating heart told him that he was perfectly right, and that to accept the barriers she was setting up would impoverish all their future life together but he could not struggle with the woman on whom he had already inflicted so severe a practical trial. Moreover, he felt strangely, as he stood there, the danger of rousing in her those illimitable possibilities of the religious temper, the dread of which had once before risen spectre-like in his heart. So, once more, he yielded. She rewarded him with all the charm, all the delightfulness, of which under the circumstances she was mistress. They wandered up the Rhone Valley, through the St. Gotthard, and spent a fortnight between Como and Lugano. During these days her one thought was to revive and refresh him, and he let her tend him, and lent himself to the various heroic futilities by which she would try, as part of her nursing mission, to make the future look less empty, and their distress less real. Of course, under all this delicate give and take, 
both suffered. Both felt that the promise of their marriage had failed them, and that they had come dismally down to a second best. But after all they were young, and the autumn was beautiful, and though they hurt each other, they were alone together, and constantly, passionately interested in each other. Italy, too, softened all things, even Catherine's English tone and temper. As long as the delicious luxury of the Italian autumn, with all its primitive pagan suggestiveness, was still round them, as long as they were still among the cities of the Lombard Plain, that battleground and highway of nations which roused all Robert's historical enthusiasm and set him reading, discussing, thinking in his old impetuous way about something else than minute problems of Christian evidence. The newborn friction between them was necessarily reduced to a minimum. But, with their return home, with their plunge into London life, the difficulties of the situation began to define themselves more sharply. In after years, one of Catherine's dreariest memories was the memory of their first instalment in the Bedford Square house. Robert's anxiety to make it pleasant and homelike was pitiful to watch. He had none of the modern passion for upholstery, and probably the vaguest notions of what was aesthetically correct. But during their furnishing days he was never tired of wandering about in search of pretty things, a rug, a screen, an engraving, which might brighten the rooms in which Catherine was to live. He would put everything in its place with a restless eagerness, and then Catherine would be called in and would play her part bravely. She would smile and ask questions and admire, and then, when Robert had gone, she would move slowly to the window and look out at the great mass of the British Museum frowning beyond the little dingy strip of garden, with a sick longing in her heart for the Muirwell cornfield, the wood-path, the village, the free air-bathed spaces of heath and common. Oh, this huge London with its unfathomable poverty and its heartless wealth! How it oppressed and bewildered her! Its mere grime and squalor, its murky, poisoned atmosphere, were a perpetual trial to the countrywoman brought up amid the dash of mountain streams and the scents of mountain pastures. She drooped physically for a time, as did the child. But morally? With Catherine everything really depended on the moral state. She could have followed Robert to a London living with a joy and hope which would have completely deadened all these repulsions of the senses now so active in her. But without this inner glow, in the presence of the profound spiritual difference circumstance had developed between her and the man she loved, everything was a burden. Even her religion, though she clung to it with an ever-increasing tenacity, failed at this period to bring her much comfort. Every night it seemed to her that the day had been one long and dreary struggle to make something out of nothing, and in the morning the night too seemed to have been alive with conflict. All thy waves and thy storms have gone over me. Robert guessed it all, and whatever remorseful love could do to soften such a strain and burden, he tried to, to do. He encouraged her to find work among the poor. He tried in the tenderest ways to interest her in the great spectacle of London life, which was already, in spite of yearning and regret, beginning to fascinate and absorb himself. But their standards were now so different that she was constantly shrinking from what attracted him, or painfully judging what was to him merely curious and interesting. He was really more and more impressed by her intellectual limitations, though never consciously would he have allowed himself to admit them, and she was more and more bewildered by what constantly seemed to her a breaking up of principle, a relaxation of moral fibre. And the work among the poor was difficult. Robert instinctively felt that for him to offer his services in charitable work to the narrow evangelical whose church Catherine had joined would be merely to invite rebuff. So that even in the love and care of the unfortunate they were separated. For he had not yet found a sphere of work, and if he had, Catherine's invincible impulse in these matters was always to attach herself to the authorities and powers that be. He could only acquiesce when she suggested applying to Mr. Clarendon for some charitable occupation for herself. After her letter to him, Catherine had an interview with the vicar at his home. She was puzzled by the start and sudden pause for recollection with which he received her name, 
the tone of compassion which crept into his talk with her, the pitying look and grasp of the hand with which he dismissed her. Then, as she walked home, it flashed upon her that she had seen a copy, some weeks old, of The Record, lying on the good man's table, the very copy which contained Robert's name among the lists of men who, during the last ten years, had thrown up the Anglican ministry. The delicate face flushed miserably from brow to chin. Pitied for being Robert's wife. Oh, monstrous! Incredible! Meanwhile, Robert, manlike, in spite of all the griefs and sorenesses of the position, had immeasurably the best of it. In the first place, such incessant activity of mind as his is in itself both tonic and narcotic. It was constantly generating in him fresh purposes and hopes, constantly deadening regret, and pushing the old things out of sight. He was full of many projects, literary and social, but they were all in truth the fruits of one long experimental process, the passionate attempt of the reason to justify to itself the God in whom the heart believed. Abstract thought, as Mr. Gray saw, had had comparatively little to do with the Ellesmere's relinquishment of the Church of England. But as soon as the Christian bases of faith were overthrown, that faith had naturally to find for itself other supports and attachments. For faith itself, in God and a spiritual order, had been so wrought into the nature by years of reverent and adoring living that nothing could destroy it. With Ellesmere, as with all men of religious temperament, belief in Christianity and faith in God had not at the outset been a matter of reasoning at all, but of sympathy, feeling, association, daily experience. Then the intellect had broken in and destroyed or transformed the belief in Christianity. But after the crash, faith emerged as strong as ever, only craving and eager to make a fresh peace, a fresh compact with the reason. Ellesmere had heard Gray say long ago in one of the few moments of real intimacy he had enjoyed with him at Oxford, my interest in philosophy springs solely from the chance it offers me of knowing something more of God. Driven by the same thirst, he too threw himself into the same quest, pushing his way laboriously through the philosophical borderlands of science, through the ethical speculation of the day, through the history of man's moral and religious past. And while on the one hand the intellect was able to contribute an ever stronger support to the faith which was the man, on the other, the sphere in him of a patient ignorance which abstains from all attempt at knowing what man cannot know and substitutes trust for either knowledge or despair, was perpetually widening. I take my stand on conscience and the moral life, was the upshot of it all. In them I find my God. As for all these various problems, ethical and scientific, which you press upon me, my pessimist friend, I too am bewildered. I too have no explanation to offer but I trust and wait. In spite of them, beyond them, I have abundantly enough for faith, for hope, for action. We may quote a passage or two from some letters of his, written at this time to the young Armitstead, who had taken his place at Muirwell, and was still there till Mowbray Ellesmere should appoint a new man. Armitstead had been a college friend of Ellesmere's. He was a high churchman of a singularly gentle and delicate type, and the manner in which he had received Ellesmere's story on the day of his arrival at Muirwell had permanently endeared himself to the teller of it. At the same time, the defection from Christianity of a man who at Oxford had been to him the object of much hero-worship, and, since Oxford, an example of pastoral efficiency, had painfully affected young Armistead, and he began a correspondence with Robert which was in many ways a relief to both. In Switzerland and Italy, when his wife's gentle, inexorable silence became too oppressive to him, Robert would pour himself out in letters to Armitstead, and the correspondence did not altogether cease with his return to London. To the squire, during the same period, Ellesmere also wrote frequently, but rarely or never on religious matters. On one occasion, Armitstead had been pressing the favourite Christian dilemma, Christianity or nothing. Inside Christianity, light and certainty, outside it, chaos. If it were not for the Gospels of the Church, I should be a positivist tomorrow. Your theism is a mere arbitrary hypothesis, at the mercy of any rival philosophical theory. How, regarding our position as precarious, you should come to regard your own as stable, is to me incomprehensible. 
what I conceive to, to be the vital difference between theism and Christianity, wrote Ellesmere in reply, is that as an explanation of things, theism can never be disproved. At the worst, it must always remain in the position of an alternative hypothesis, which the hostile man of science cannot destroy, though he is under no obligation to adopt it. Broadly speaking, it is not the facts which are in dispute, but the inference to be drawn from them. Now, considering the enormous complication of the facts, the theistic inference will, to put it at the lowest, always have its place, always command respect. The man of science may not adopt it, but by no advance of science that I, at any rate, can foresee, can it be driven out of the field. Christianity is in a totally different position. Its grounds are not philosophical, but literary and historical. It rests not upon all fact, but upon a special group of facts. It is, and will always remain, a great literary and historical problem, a question of documents and testimony. Hence, the Christian explanation is vulnerable in a way in which the theistic explanation can never be vulnerable. The contention, at any rate, of persons in my position is that to a man who has had the special training required, and in whom this training has not been neutralised by any overwhelming bias of temperament, it can be as clearly demonstrated that the miraculous Christian story rests on a tissue of mistake, as it can be demonstrated that the Isidorian decretals were a forgery, or the correspondence of Paul and Seneca a pious fraud, or that the medieval belief in witchcraft was the product of physical ignorance and superstition. You say, he wrote again in another connection to Armistead from Milan, you say you think my later letters have been far too aggressive and positive. I too am astonished at myself. I do not know my own mood. It is so clear, so sharp, so combative. Is it the spectacle of Italy, I wonder? of a country practically without religion, the spectacle, in fact, of Latin Europe as a whole, and the practical atheism in which it is engulfed? My dear friend, the problem of the world at this moment is how to find a religion. Some great conception which shall be once more capable, as the old were capable, of welding societies and keeping man's brutish elements in check. Surely Christianity of the traditional sort is failing everywhere, less obviously with us, and in Teutonic Europe generally, but egregiously, notoriously, in all the Catholic countries. We talk complacently of the decline of Buddhism, but what have we to say of the decline of Christianity? And yet this last is infinitely more striking and more tragic, inasmuch as it affects a more important section of mankind. I, at any rate, am not one of those who would seek to minimise the results of this decline for human life, nor can I bring myself to believe that positivism or evolution or morality will ever satisfy the race. In the period of social struggle which undeniably lies before us, both in the old and the new world, are we then to witness a war of classes, unsoftened by the ideal hopes, the ideal law of faith? It looks like it. What does the artisan class, what does the town democracy throughout Europe, care any longer for Christian checks or Christian sanctions, as they have been taught to understand them. Superstition, in certain parts of rural Europe, there is in plenty, but wherever you get intelligence, and therefore movement, you get at once either indifference to, or a passionate break with, Christianity. And consider what it means, what it will mean, this atheism of the great democracies which are to be our masters. The world has never seen anything like it. Such spiritual anarchy and poverty combined with such material power and resource. Every society, Christian and non-Christian, has always till now had its ideal of greater or less ethical value, its appeal to something beyond man. Has Christianity brought us to this, that the Christian nations are to be the first in the world's history to try the experiment of a life without faith, that life which you and I, at any rate, are agreed in thinking a life worthy only of the brute? Oh, forgive me. These things must hurt you. They would have hurt me in old days but they burn within me, and you bid me speak out. What if it be God himself who is driving his painful lesson home to me, to you, to the world? What does it mean, this gradual growth of what we call infidelity, of criticism and science on the one hand, this gradual death of the old traditions on the other? Sin, you answer, the enmity of the human mind against God, the momentary triumph of Satan. And so you acquiesce, heavy-hearted, in God's present defeat, 
looking for vengeance and requital hereafter. Well, I am not so ready to believe in man's capacity to rebel against his Maker. Where you see ruin and sin, I see the urgent process of divine education, God's steady, ineluctable command to put away childish things, the pressure of His Spirit on ours towards new ways of worship and new forms of love. And after a while, it was with these new ways of worship and new forms of love that the mind began to be perpetually occupied. The break with the old things was no sooner complete than the eager soul, incapable then as always of resting in negation or opposition, pressed passionately forward to a new synthesis, not only speculative but practical. Before it rose perpetually, the haunting vision of another palace of faith, another church or company of the faithful, which was to become the shelter of human aspiration amid the desolation and anarchy caused by the crashing of the old. How many men and women must have gone through the same strait as itself? How many must be watching with it through the darkness for the rising of a new city of God? One afternoon, close upon Christmas, he found himself in Parliament Square, on his way towards Westminster Bridge and the Embankment. The beauty of a sunset sky behind the Abbey arrested him, and he stood leaning over the railings beside the Peel statue to look. The day before he had passed the same spot with a German friend. His companion, a man of influence and mark in his own country, who had been brought up, however, in England and knew it well, had stopped before the Abbey and had said to him with emphasis, I never find myself in this particular spot of London without a sense of emotion and reverence. Other people feel that in treading the Forum of Rome they are at the centre of human things. I am more thrilled by Westminster than Rome. Your venerable abbey is to me the symbol of a nationality to which the modern world owes obligations it could never repay. You are rooted deep in the past. You have also a future of infinite expansiveness stretching before you. Among European nations at this moment, you alone have freedom in the true sense. You alone have religion. I would give a year of life to know what you will have made of your freedom and your religion two hundred years hence. As Robert recalled the words, the abbey lay before him, wrapped in the bluish haze of the winter afternoon. Only the towers rose out of the mist, grey and black against the red bands of cloud. A pair of pigeons circled round them, as careless and free in flight as though they were alone with the towers and the sunset. Below, the streets were full of people. The omnibuses rolled to and fro. The lamps were just lit. Lines of struggling figures, dark in the half-light, were crossing the street here and there. And to all the human rush and swell below, the quiet of the abbey and the infinite red distances of sky gave a peculiar pathos and significance. Robert filled his eye and sense, and then walked quickly away towards the embankment. Carrying the poetry and grandeur of England's past with him, he turned his face eastward to the great new-made London on the other side of St Paul's, the London of the democracy, of the nineteenth century, and of the future. He was wrestling with himself, a prey to one of those critical moments of life when circumstance seems once more to restore to us the power of choice, of distributing it, yes or no, among the great solicitations which meet the human spirit on its path from silence to silence. The thought of his friend's reverence, and of his own personal debt towards the country to whose long travail of centuries he owed all his own joys and faculties, was hot within him. Here and here did England help me, how can I help England, say? Ah, oh, that vast, chaotic London south and east of the great church! He already knew something of it. A liberal clergyman there, set in the very blackest, busiest heart of it, had already made him welcome on Mr. Gray's introduction. He had gone with this good man on several occasions through some little fraction of that teeming world, now so hidden and peaceful between the murky river mists and the cleaner, light-filled greys of the sky. He had heard much and pondered a good deal, the quick mind caught at once by the differences, some tragic, some merely curious and stimulating, between the monotonous life of his own rural folk, and the mad rush, the voracious hurry, the bewildering appearances and disappearances, the sudden engulfments of working London. Moreover, 
he had spent a Sunday or two wandering among the East End churches. There, rather than among the streets and courts outside, as it had seemed to him, lay the tragedy of the city. Such emptiness, such desertion, such a hopeless breach between the great craving need outside and the boon offered it within. Here and there, indeed, a patch of bright-coloured success, as it claimed to be, where the primitive tendency of man towards the organised excitement of religious ritual, visible in all nations and civilizations, had been appealed to with more energy and more results than usual. But in general, blank failure, or rather obvious want of success, as the devoted men now beating the void there were themselves the first to admit, with pain and patient submission to the inscrutable will of God. But is it not time we assured ourselves, he was always asking, whether God is still in truth behind the offer man is perpetually making to his brother man on his behalf? He was behind it once, and it had efficacy, had power. But now, what if all these processes of so-called destruction and decay were but the mere workings of that divine plastic force which is for ever moulding human society? What if these beautiful, venerable things which had fallen from him, as from thousands of his fellows, represented, in the present stage of the world's history, not the props, but the hindrances of man? And if all these large things were true, as he believed, what should be the individual's part in this transition England? Surely the least a part of plain sincerity of act and speech, a correspondence as perfect as could be reached between the inner faith and the outer word and deed. So much, at the least, was clearly required of him. Do not imagine, he said to himself, as though with a fierce dread of possible self-delusion, that it is in you to play any great, any commanding part. Shun the thought of it, if it were possible. But let me do what is given me to do. Here, in this human wilderness, may I spend whatever of time or energy or faculty may be mine, in the faithful attempt to help forward the new house of faith that is to be, though my utmost efforts should but succeed in laying some obscure stone in still unseen foundations. Let me try and hand on to some other human soul, or souls, before I die, the truth which has freed, and which is now sustaining, my own heart. Can any man do more? Is not every man who feels any certainty in him, whatever, bound to do as much? What matter if the wise folks scoff, if even at times, and in a certain sense, one seems to one's self ridiculous, absurdly lonely and powerless. All great changes are preceded by numbers of sporadic, and as the bystander thinks, impotent efforts. But while the individual effort sinks, drowned perhaps in mockery, the general movement quickens, gathers force, we know not how, and, while the tired wave vainly breaking seems here no painful inch to gain, far back through creeks and inlets making, comes silent, flooding in the main. Darkness sank over the river. All the grey and purple distance with its dim edge of spires and domes against the sky, all the vague interweaving blacknesses of street or bridge or railway station were starred and patterned with lights. The vastness, the beauty of the city, filled him with a sense of mysterious attraction, and as he walked on with his face uplifted to it, it was as though he took his life in his hand and flung it afresh into the human gulf. What does it matter if one's work be raw and uncomely? All that lies outside the great organised traditions of an age must always look so. Let me bear my witness bravely, not spending life in speech, but not undervaluing speech. Above all, not being ashamed or afraid of it, because otherwise people may prefer a policy of silence. A man has but the one puny life, the one tiny spark of faith. Better be venturesome with both, for God's sake, than over-cautious, over-thrifty. And to his own master he standeth or faileth. Plenty of work of all kinds, literary and practical, thoughts of preaching in some bare hidden room to men and women orphaned and stranded like himself, began to crowd upon him. The old clerical instinct in him winced at some of them, Robert had nothing of the sectary about him by nature. He was always too deeply and easily affected by the great historic existences about him. But when the Oxford man, 
or the ex-official of one of the most venerable and decorous of societies protested, the believer, or if you will the enthusiast, put the protest by. And so the dream gathered substance and stayed with him, till at last he found himself at his own door. As he closed it behind him, Catherine came out into the pretty old hall from the dining-room. "'Robert, have you walked all the way?' "'Yes, I came along the embankment. Such a beautiful evening.' He slipped his arm inside hers, and they mounted the stairs together. She glanced at him wistfully. She was perfectly aware that these months were to him months of incessant travail of spirit, and she caught at this moment the old strenuous look of eye and brow she knew so well. A year ago, and every thought of his mind had been open to her, and now she herself had shut them out, but her heart sank within her. She turned and kissed him. He bent his head fondly over her, but inwardly all the ardour of his mood collapsed at the touch of her. For the protests of a world in arms can be withstood with joy, but the protest that steals into your heart, that takes love's garb and uses love's ways, there is the difficulty. End of Book 5, Chapter 32Book 5, Chapter 33 of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book 5, Chapter 33. But Robert was for some time in finding his opening, in realising any fraction of his dream. At first he tried work under the broad church vicar to whom Gray had introduced him. He undertook some rent collecting and some evening lectures on elementary science to boys and men. But after a while he began to feel his position false and unsatisfactory. In truth, his opinions were in the main identical with those of the vicar under whom he was acting. But Mr. Vernon was a broad churchman, belonged to the church reform movement, and thought it absolutely necessary to keep things going, and by a policy of prudent silence and gradual expansion from within, to save the great plant of the establishment from falling wholesale into the hands of the high churchman. In consequence, he was involved, as Robert held, in endless contradictions and practical falsities of speech and action. His large church was attended by a handful of some fifty to a hundred persons. Vernon could not preach what he did believe, and would not preach, more than what was absolutely necessary, what he did not believe. He was hard-working and kind-hearted, but the perpetual divorce between thought and action which his position made inevitable was constantly blunting and weakening all he did. His whole life, indeed, was one long waste of power, simply for lack of an elementary frankness. But if these became Robert's views as to Vernon, Vernon's feelings towards Ellesmere after six weeks' acquaintance was not less decided. He was constitutionally timid, and he probably divined in his new helper a man of no ordinary calibre, whose influence might very well turn out some day to be of the incalculably diffusive kind. He grew uncomfortable, begged Ellesmere to beware of any direct religious teaching, talked in warm praise of a policy of omissions, an equally warm denunciation of anything like a policy of attack. In short, it became plain that two men, so much alike and yet so different, could not long cooperate. However, just as the fact was being brought home to Ellesmere, a friendly chance intervened. Hugh Flaxman, the Leyburn's new acquaintance and Lady Helen's brother, had been drawn to Ellesmere at first sight, and a meeting or two, now at Lady Charlotte's, now at the Leyburn's, had led both men far on the way to a friendship, a few Flaxman himself more hereafter. At present, all that need be recorded is that it was at Mr. Flaxman's house, overlooking St. James's Park, Robert first met a man who was to give him the opening for which he was looking. Mr. Flaxman was fond of breakfast parties a la Rogers, and on the first occasion when Robert could be induced to attend one of these functions, he saw opposite to him what he supposed to be a lad of twenty, a young slip of a fellow, whose sallies of fun and invincible good humour attracted him greatly. Sparkling brown eyes, full lips rich in humour and pugnacity, lock as cruel as they were laid in presser, the same look of wonderly activity too, in spite of his short stature and dainty make, as Chaucer lends his squire. The type was so fresh and pleasing 
that Robert was more and more held by it, especially when he discovered to his bewilderment that the supposed stripling must be from his talk a man quite as old as himself, an official besides, filling what was clearly some important place in the world. He took his full share in the politics and literature started at the table, and presently, when conversation fell on the proposed municipality of for London, said things to which the whole party listened. Robert's curiosity was aroused, and after breakfast he questioned his host and was promptly introduced to Mr. Murray Edwards. Whereupon it turned out that this baby-faced sage was filling a post in the work of which perhaps few people in London could have taken so much interest as Robert Ellesmere. Fifty years before, a wealthy merchant who had been one of the chief pillars of London Unitarianism had made his will and died. His great warehouses lay in one of the eastern riverside districts of the city, and in his will he endeavoured to do something according to his lights for the place in which he had amassed his money. He left a fairly large bequest wherewith to build and endow a Unitarian chapel and found certain Unitarian charities, in the heart of what was even then one of the densest and most poverty-stricken of London parishes. For a long time, however, chapel and charities seemed likely to rank as one of the idle freaks of religious wealth and nothing more. Unitarianism of the old sort is perhaps the most illogical creed that exists, and certainly it has never been the creed of the poor. In old days it required the presence of a certain arid stratum of the middle classes to live and thrive at all. The stratum was not to be found in R, which rejoiced instead in the most squalid types of poverty and crime, types wherewith the mild, shrivelled Unitarian minister had about as much power of grappling as a poet laureate with a Trafalgar Square socialist. Soon after the erection of the chapel, there arose that shaking of the dry bones of religious England which we call the Tractarian Movement. For many years the new force left R quite undisturbed. The parish church droned away. The Unitarian minister preached decorously to empty benches, knowing nothing of the agitations outside. At last, however, towards the end of the old minister's life, a powerful church of the new type, staffed by friends and pupils of Pusey, rose in the centre of R, and the little Unitarian chapel was for a time more snuffed out than ever, a fate which this time it shared dismally with the parish church. As generally happened, however, in those days, the proceedings at this new and splendid St. Wilfrid's was not long in stirring up the Protestantism of the British rough, the said Protestantism being always one of the finest excuses for brickbats of which the modern Cockney is master. The parish lapsed into a state of private war, hectic clergy heading exasperating processions of intoning defiant litanies on the one side, mobs, rotten eggs, dead cats, and blatant Protestant orators on the other. The war went on practically for years, and while it was still raging, the minister of the Unitarian Chapel died, and the authorities concerned chose in his place a young fellow, the son of a Bristol minister, a Cambridge man besides, as chance would have it, of brilliant attainments, and unusually commended from many quarters, even including some church ones of the liberal kind. This curly-haired youth, as he was then in reality, and as to his own quaint vexation he went on seeming to be up to quite middle age, had the wit to perceive at the moment of his entry on the troubled scene that behind all the mere brutal opposition to the new church, and in contrast with the sheer indifference of three-fourths of the district, there was a small party consisting of an aristocracy of the artisans, whose protest against the Puseyite doings was of a much quieter, sterner sort, and amongst whom the uproar had merely roused a certain crude power of thinking. He threw himself upon this element, which he rather divined than discovered, and it responded. He preached a simple creed, drove it home by pure and generous living. He lectured, taught, brought down workers from the West End, and before he had been five years in a harness, and not only made himself a par in R, but was beginning to be heard of and watched with no small interest by many outsiders. This was the man on whom Robert had now stumbled. Before they had talked twenty minutes, each was fascinated by the other. They said good-bye to their host, and wandered out together into St. James's Park, where the trees were white with frost, and an orange sun was struggling through the fog. Here Murray Edwards poured out the whole story of his ministry to attentive ears. Robert listened eagerly. Unitarianism was not a familiar subject of thought to him. He never dreamt of joining the Unitarians, 
and was indeed long ago convinced that in the beliefs of a Channing no one once fairly started on the critical road could rationally stop. That common thinness and aridity, too, of the Unitarian temper had weighed with him. But here, in the person of Murray Edwards, it was as though he saw something old and threadbare revivified. The young man's creed, as he presented it, had grace, persuasiveness, even unction, and there was something in his tone of mind which was like a fresh wind blowing over the fevered places of the other's heart. They talked long and earnestly, Edwards describing his own work and the changes creeping over the modern Unitarian body, Elsmere saying little, asking much. At last the young man looked at Elsmere with eyes of bright decision. "'You cannot work with the church,' he said. "'It is impossible. You will only wear yourself out in efforts to restrain what you could do infinitely more good, as things stand now, by pouring out. Come to us. I'll put you in the way. You should be hampered by no pledges of any sort. Come and take the direction of some of my workers. We've all got our hands more than full. Your knowledge, your experience, would be invaluable. There's no other opening like it in England just now for men of your way of thinking, and mine. Come. Who knows what we may be putting our hands to, what fruit may grow from the smallest seed. The two men stopped beside the lightly frozen water. Robert gathered that in this soul, too, there had risen the same large, intoxicating dream of a reorganised Christendom, a new, wide-spreading shelter of faith for discouraged, browbeaten men, as in his own. "'I will,' he said briefly, after a pause, his own look kindling. "'It is the opening I have been pining for. I will give you all I can, and bless you for the chance.' That evening Robert got home late, after a busy day full of various engagements. Mary, after some waiting for Father, had just been carrying, protesting, red lips pouting, and fat legs kicking, off to bed. Catherine was straightening the room, which had been thrown into confusion by the child's romps. It was with an effort, for he knew it would be a shock to her, that he began to talk to her about the breakfast party at Mr. Flaxman's, and his talk with Murray Edwards but he had made it a rule with himself to tell her everything that he was doing, or meant to do. She would not let him tell her what he was thinking. But as much openness as there could be between them, there should be. Catherine listened, still moving about the while, the thin, beautiful lips becoming more and more compressed. Yes, it was hard to her, very hard. The people among whom she had been brought up, her father especially, would have held out the hand of fellowship to anybody of Christian people, but not to the Unitarian. No real barrier of feeling divided them from any orthodox dissenter, but the gulf between them and the Unitarian had been dug very deep by various forces, forces of thought originally, a strong habit and prejudice in the course of time. "'He's going to work with them now,' she thought bitterly. "'Soon he will be one of them, perhaps a Unitarian minister himself.' and for the life of her, as he told his tale, she could find nothing but embarrassed monosyllables, and still more embarrassed silences, wherewith to answer him. Till at last he too fell silent, feeling once more the sting of a now habitual discomfort. Presently, however, Catherine came to sit down beside him. She laid her head against his knee, saying nothing, but gathering his hand closely in both of her own. Poor woman's heart! one moment in rebellion, the next a suppliant. He bent down quickly and kissed her. "'Would you like,' he said presently, after both had sat silent a while in the firelight, "'would you care to go to Madame de Netfield's to-night?' "'By all means,' said Catherine, with a sort of eagerness. "'It was Friday she asked us for, wasn't it? We will be quick over dinner, and I will go and dress.' In the last ten minutes which Robert had spent with the squire in his bedroom on the Monday afternoon, when they were to have walked, Mr. Wendover had dryly recommended Elsmere to cultivate Madame de Netteville. He sat propped up in his chair, white, gaunt, and cynical, and this remark of his was almost the only reference he would allow to the Elsmere move. "'You better go there,' he said huskily. "'It'll do you good. She gets the first-rate people, and she makes them talk, which Lady Charlotte can't. Too many fools at Lady Charlotte's. She waters the wine too much. And he had persisted with the subject, using it, as Ellesmere thought, as a means of warding off other conversation. He would not ask Ellesmere's plans, and he would not allow a word about himself. 
There had been a heart attack, old Merrick thought, coupled with signs of nervous strain and excitement. It was the last ailment which evidently troubled the doctor most. But behind the physical breakdown, there was, to Robert's sense, something else, a spiritual something, infinitely forlorn and piteous, which revealed itself wholly against the older man's will, and filled the younger with a dumb, helpless rush of sympathy. Since his departure, Robert had made the keeping up of his correspondence with the squire a binding obligation, and he was to-night chiefly anxious to go to Madame de Netville's that he might write an account of it to Muirwell. Still, the squire's talk, and his own glimpse of her at Muirwell, had made him curious to see more of the woman herself. The squire's way of describing her was always half approving, half sarcastic. Robert sometimes imagined that he himself had been at one time more under her spell than he cared to confess. If so, it must have been when she was still in Paris, the young English widow of a man of old French family, rich, fascinating, distinguished, and the centre of a small salon, admission to which was one of the social blue ribbons of Paris. Since the war of 1870, Madame de Netteville had fixed her headquarters in London, and it was to her house in Hans Place that the squire wrote to her about the Ellesmeres. She owed Roger Wendover debts of various kinds, and she had an encouraging memory of the young clergyman on the terrace at Muirwell. So she promptly left her cards, together with the intimation that she was at home always on Friday evenings. "'I have never seen the wife,' she meditated, as her delicate jewelled hand drew up the window of the broom in front of the Ellesmere's lodgings. "'But if she is the ordinary country clergyman's spouse, the squire, of course, would have given the young man a hint. But whether from oblivion, or from some instinct of grim humour towards Catherine, whom she had always vaguely disliked, the squire said not one word about his wife to Robert in the course of their talk of Madame de Netteville. Catherine took pains with her dress, sorely wishing to do Robert credit. She put on one of the gowns she had taken to Muirwell when she married. It was black, simply made, and had been a favourite with both of them in the old surroundings. So they drove off to Madame de Netteville's. Catherine's heart was beating faster than usual as she mounted the twisting stairs of the luxurious little house. All these new social experiences were a trial to her. But she had the vaguest, most unsuspicious ideas of what she was to see in this particular house. A long, low room was thrown open to them. Unlike most English rooms, it was barely, though richly, furnished. A Persian carpet of a self-coloured greyish-blue threw the gilt French chairs and the various figures sitting upon them into delicate relief. The walls were painted white, and had a few French mirrors and girandoles upon them, half a dozen fine French portraits, too, here and there, let into the wall in oval frames. The subdued light came from the white sides of the room, and seemed to be there solely for social purposes. You could hardly have read or written in the room, but you could see a beautiful woman in a beautiful dress there, and you could talk there, either tete-a-tete, -tete, or to the assembled company, to perfection. So cunningly was it all devised. When the Ellesmeres entered, there were about a dozen people present, ten gentlemen and two ladies. One of the ladies, Madame de Netteville, was lying back in the corner of a velvet divan placed against the wall, a screen between her and a splendid fire that threw its blaze out into the room. The other, a slim woman with closely curled fair hair and a neck abnormally long and white, sat near her, and the circle of men was talking indiscriminately to both. As the footman announced Mr. and Mrs. Ellesmere, there was a general stir of surprise. The men looked round. Madame de Netteville half rose with a puzzled look. It was more than a month since she had dropped her invitation. Then a flash, not altogether of pleasure, passed over her face, and she said a few hasty words to the woman near her, advancing the moment afterwards to give her hand to Catherine. "'This is very kind of you, Mrs. Ellesmere, to remember me so soon. I had imagined you were hardly settled enough yet to give me the pleasure of seeing you.' But the eyes fixed on Catherine, eyes which took in everything, were not cordial for all their smile. Catherine, looking up at her, was overpowered by her excessive manner, and by the woman's look of conscious sarcastic strength, struggling through all the outer softness of beauty and exquisite dress. "'Mr. Ellesmere, you will find this room almost as hot, I am afraid, as that afternoon on which we met last. Let me introduce you to Count Villat, Mr. Ellesmere. Mrs. Ellesmere, will you come over here beside Lady Aubrey Willett?' 
Robert found himself bowing to a young diplomatist, who seemed to him to look at him very much as he himself might have scrutinised an inhabitant of New Guinea. Lady Aubrey made an imperceptible movement of her head as Catherine was presented to her, and Madame de Netteville, smiling and biting her lip a little, fell back into her seat. There was a faint odour of smoke in the room. As Catherine sat down, a young exquisite, a few yards from her, threw the end of a cigarette into the fire with a little sharp, decided gesture. Lady Aubrey also pushed away a cigarette case which lay beside her hand. Everybody there had the air, more or less, of an habitué of the house, and when the conversation began again, the Earl's Mayors found it very hard, in spite of certain perfunctory efforts on the part of Madame de Netville, to take any share in it. "'Well, I believe the story about De Foray is true,' said the fair-haired young Apollo, who had thrown away his cigarette, lolling back in his chair. Catherine started, the little scene with Rose and Langham in the English rectory garden flashing incongruously back upon her. "'If you get it from the ferry, my dear Evershed,' said the ex-Tory minister, Lord Rupert, "'you may put it down as a safe lie. As for me, I believe she has a much shrewder eye to the main chance.' "'What do you mean?' said the other, raising astonished eyebrows. "'Well, it doesn't pay, you know, to write yourself down a fiend. Not quite.' "'What? You think it will affect her audiences? Well, that is a good joke,' said the young man, laughing immoderately, joined by several of the other guests. "'I don't imagine it will make any difference to you, my good friend,' returned Lord Rupert imperturbably. "'But the British public haven't got your nerve. They may take it awkwardly, but I don't say they will, when a woman who has turned her own young sister out of doors at night in St. Petersburg, so that ultimately, as a consequence, the girl dies—' comes to ask them to clap her touching impersonations of injured virtue. "'What has one to do with an actress's private life, my dear Lord Rupert?' asked Madame de Netville, her voice slipping with a smooth clearness into the conversation, her eyes darting light from under straight black brows. "'What indeed?' said the young man, who had begun the conversation with a disagreeable enigmatical smile, stretching out his hand for another cigarette, and drawing it back with a look under his drooped eyelids a look of cold, impertinent scrutiny, at Catherine Ellesmere. "'Ah, oh, well, I don't want to be obtrusively moral, heaven forbid, but there is such a thing as destroying the illusion to such an extent that you injure your pocket. De Foray is doing it, doing it actually in Paris, too!' There was a ripple of laughter. "'Paris and illusions? Oh, mon Dieu!' groaned young Evershed, when he had done laughing, laying meditative hands on his knees and gazing into the fire. "'I tell you, I've seen it,' said Lord Rupert, waxing combative, and slapping the leg he was nursing with emphasis. "'The last time I went to see De Foray in Paris, the theatre was crammed, and the house, theatrically speaking, ice. They received her in dead silence. They gave her not one single recall, and they only gave her a clap that I can remember, and those two or three points in the play were clap they positively must or burst. They go to see her, but they loathe her, and they let her know it.' Bah said his opponent. It is only because they are tired of her. Her vagaries don't amuse them any longer. They know them by heart. And by George, she has some pretty rivals too now, he added, reflectively, not to speak of the Bernhardt. Well, as the Parisians can be shocked, said Count Villant, in excellent English, bending forward so as to get a good view of his hostess. They are just now especially shocked by the condition of English morals. The twinkle in his eye was irresistible. The men, understanding his reference to the avidity with which certain English aristocratic scandals had been lately seized upon by the French papers, laughed out. So did Lady Aubrey. Madame de Netteville contented herself with a smile. "'They professed to be shocked, too, by Reynolds's last book,' said the editor from the other side of the room. "'Dear me,' said Lady Aubrey, with meditative scorn, fanning herself lightly the while, her thin but extraordinarily graceful head and neck thrown out against the golden brocade of the cushion behind her. Uh, "'What so many of them feel in Renault's case, of course,' said Madame de Netville, "'is that every book he writes now gives a fresh opening to the enemy to blaspheme. Your eminent three-thinker can't afford just yet, in the present state of the world, to make himself socially ridiculous. The cause suffers.' "'Just my feeling,' said young Evershed calmly. Though I mayn't care a rap about him personally, I prefer that a man on my own front bed shouldn't make a public ass of himself if he can help it. Not for his sake, of course, but for mine. 
Robert looked at Catherine. She sat upright by the side of Lady Albury. Her face, of which the beauty to-night seemed lost in rigidity, pale and stiff. With a contradiction of heart, he plunged himself into the conversation. On his road home that evening he had found an important foreign telegram posted up at the small literary club to which he belonged since Oxford days. He made a remark about it now to Count Vielant, and the diplomatist, turning rather unwillingly to face his questioner, recognised that the remark was a shrewd one. Presently the young man's frank intelligence had told. On his way to and from the Holy Land three years before Robert had seen something of the East, and it so happened that he remembered the name of Count Vielant as one of the foreign secretaries of legation present at an official party given by the English ambassador at Constantinople, which he and his mother had attended on their return journey, in virtue of a family connection with the ambassador. All that he could glean from memory he made quick use of now, urged at first by the remorseful wish to make this new world into which he had brought Catherine less difficult than he knew it must have been during the last quarter of an hour. But after a while he found himself leading the talk of a section of the room, and getting excitement and pleasure out of the talk itself. Ever since that eastern journey he kept an eye on the subjects which had interested him then, reading in his rapid, voracious way all that came across him at Muirwell, especially in the squire's foreign newspapers and reviews, and storing it, when read, in a remarkable memory. Catherine, after the failure of some conversational attempts between her and Madame de Netteville, fell to watching her husband with a start of strangeness and surprise. She had scarcely seen him at Oxford among his eagles, and she had very rarely been present at his talks with the squire. In some ways, and owing to the instinctive reserves set up between them for so long, her intellectual knowledge of him was very imperfect. His ease, his resource among these men of the world, for whom, independent of all else, she felt a countrywoman's dislike, filled her with a kind of bewilderment. "'Are you new to London?' Lady Albury asked her presently, in that tone of absolute detachment from the person addressed which certain women manage to perfection. She too had been watching the husband, and the sight had impressed her with a momentary curiosity to know what the stiff, handsome, dowdily dressed wife was made of. "'We've been two months here,' said Catherine, her large grey eyes taking in her companion's very bare shoulders, the costly fantastic dress, and the diamond flashing against the white skin. "'In what part?' "'In Bedford Square.' Lady Aubrey was silent. She had no ideas on the subject of Bedford Square to command. "'We are very central,' said Catherine, feeling desperately that she was doing Robert no credit at all, and anxious to talk if only something could be found to talk about. "'Oh, yes, you are near the theatres,' said the other indifferently. This was hardly an aspect of the matter which had yet occurred to Catherine. A flash of bitterness ran through her. Had they left their mule life to be near the theatres, and kept at arm's length by supercilious great ladies? "'We are very far from the park,' she answered with an effort. "'I wish we weren't, for my little girl's sake.' "'Oh, you have a little girl. How old?' Sixteen months. Oh, too young to be a nuisance yet. Mine are just old enough to be in everybody's way. Children are out of place in London. I always wanted to leave mine in the country, but my husband objects, said Lady Aubrey coolly. There was a certain piquancy in saying frank things to this stiff, Madonna-faced woman. Madame de Netteville, meanwhile, was keeping up a conversation in an undertone with young Evershed, who had come to sit on a stool beside her and was gazing up at her with eyes of which the expression was perfectly understood by several persons present. The handsome, dissipated, ill-conditioned youth had been her slave and shadow for the last two years. His devotion now no longer amused her, and she was endeavouring to get rid of it, and of him. But the process was a difficult one, and took both time and finesse. She kept her eye, notwithstanding, on the newcomers whom the squire's introduction had brought to her that night. When the Ellesmeres rose to go, she said good-bye to Catherine with an excessive politeness, under which her poor guest, conscious of her own gaucherie during the evening, felt the touch of satire she was perhaps meant to feel. But when Catherine was well ahead, Madame de Netteville gave Robert one of her most brilliant smiles. "'Friday evening, Mr. Ellesmere. Always Fridays. You will remember?' 
the naivety of Robert's social view, and the mobility of his temper made him easily responsive. He just enjoyed half an hour's brilliant talk with two or three of the keenest and most accomplished men in Europe. Catherine had slipped out of his sight, meanwhile, and the impression of their entree had been effaced. He made Madame de Netteville, therefore, a cordial, smiling reply, before his tall, slender form disappeared after that of his wife. "'Agreeable, rather an acquisition,' said Madame de Netteville to Lady Aubrey, with a light motion of the head towards Robert's retreating figure. "'But the wife! Good heavens! I owe Robert Rendover a grudge. I think he might have made it plain to those good people that I didn't want strange women at my Friday evenings.' Lady Aubrey laughed. "'No doubt she's a genius, or a saint, in Mufti. She might be handsome, too, if someone would dress her.' Madame de Nitville shrugged her shoulders. "'Oh, life is not long enough to penetrate that kind of person,' she said. Meanwhile, the person was driving homeward, very sad and ill at ease. She was vexed that she had not done better, and yet she was wounded by Robert's enjoyment. The Puritan in her blood was all aflame. As she sat looking into the motley lamp-lit night, she could have testified like any prophetess of old. Robert, meanwhile, his hand slipped into hers, was thinking of Vielant's talk, and of some racy stories of Berlin celebrities told by a young attaché who had joined their group. His lips were lightly smiling, his brow serene. But as he helped her down from the cab, and they stood in the hall together, he noticed the pale discomposure of her looks. Instantly the familiar dread and pain returned upon him. "'Did you like it, Catherine?' he asked her, with something like timidity, as they stood together by their bedroom fire. She sank into a low chair, and sat a moment staring at the blaze. He was startled by her look of suffering, and kneeling he put his arms tenderly round her. "'Oh, Robert, Robert!' she cried, falling on his neck. "'What is it?' he asked, kissing her hair. "'I seem all at sea,' she said in a choked voice, her face hidden. "'The old landmark's swallowed up. I'm always judging and condemning, always protesting. What am I that I should judge? But how, how can I help it?' She drew herself away from him, once more looking into the fire with drawn brows. "'Darling, the world is full of difference. Men and women take life in different ways. Don't be so sure yours is the only right one.' He spoke with a moved gentleness, taking her hand the while. "'This is the way. Walk ye in it,' she said presently, with strong, almost stern emphasis. "'Oh, those women and that talk! Hateful!' He rose, and looked down at her from the mantelpiece. Within him was a movement of impatience, repressed almost at once by the thought of that long night at Muirwall, when he vowed to himself to make amends and if that memory had not intervened, she would still have disarmed him wholly. "'Listen,' she said to him suddenly, her eyes kindling with a strange, childish pleasure. "'Do you hear the wind, the west wind? Do you remember how it used to shake the house, how it used to come sweeping through the trees and the wood-path? It must be trying the study window now, blowing the vine against it.' A yearning passion breathed through every feature, it seemed to him she saw nothing before her. Her longing soul was back in the old haunts, surrounded by the old loved forms and sounds. It went to his heart. He tried to soothe her with the tenderest words remorseful love could find. But the conflict of feeling, grief, rebellion, doubt, self-judgment, would not be soothed. And long after she had made him leave her and he had fallen asleep, she knelt on, a white and rigid figure in the dying firelight, the wind shaking the old house, the eternal murmur of London booming outside. End of Book 5, Chapter 33book 5 chapter 34 of robert ellesmere by mary augusta ward this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by simon evers book 5 chapter 34 meanwhile as if to complete the circle of pain with which poor catherine's life was compassed it began to be plain to her 
that in spite of the hard and mocking tone Rose generally adopted with regard to him, Edward Langham was constantly at the house in Lerbeck Gardens, and that it was impossible he should be there so much unless in some way or other Rose encouraged it. The idea of such a marriage, nay, of such a friendship, was naturally as repugnant as ever to her. It had been one of the bitterest moments of a bitter time, when, at their first meeting after the crisis in her life, Langham, conscious of a sudden movement of pity for a woman he disliked, had pressed the hand she held out to him in a way which clearly showed her what was in his mind, and had then passed on to chat and smoke with Robert in the study, leaving her behind to realise the gulf that lay between the present and that visit of his to Muirwell, when Robert and she had felt in unison towards him, his opinions and his conduct to Rose, as towards everything else of importance in their life. Now, it seemed to her, Robert must necessarily look at the matter differently, and she could not make up her mind to talk to him about it. In reality, his objections had never had the same basis as hers, and he would have given her as strong a support as ever if she had asked for it. But she held her peace, and he, absorbed in other things, took no notice. Besides, he knew Langham too well. He had never been able to take Catherine's alarms seriously. An attentive onlooker, however, would have admitted that this time, at any rate, they had their justification. Why Langham was so much in the Leyburn's drawing-room during these winter months was a question that several people asked, himself not least. He had not only pretended to forget Rose Leyburn during the eighteen months which had passed since their first acquaintance at Muirwell, he had, for all practical purposes, forgotten her. It is only a small proportion of men and women who are capable of passion on the great scale at all and certainly, as we have tried to show, Langham was not among them. He had a passing moment of excitement at Muirwell, soon put down, and followed by a week of extremely pleasant sensations, which, like most of his pleasures, had ended in reaction and self-abhorrence. He had left Muirwell remorseful, melancholy, and ill at ease, but conscious, certainly, of a great relief that he and Rose Laban were not likely to meet again for long. Then his settlement in London had absorbed him, as all such matters absorb men who have become the slaves of their own solitary habits, and in the joy of his new freedom and the fresh zest for learning it had aroused in him, the beautiful, unmanageable child who had disturbed his peace at Muirwell was not likely to be more, but less, remembered. When he stumbled across her unexpectedly in the National Gallery, his determining impulse had been merely one of flight. However, as he had written to Robert towards the beginning of his London residence, there was no doubt that his migration had made him, for the time, much more human, observant, and accessible. Oxford had become to him an oppression and a nightmare, and as soon as he had turned his back on it, his mental lungs seemed once more to fill with air. He took his modest part in the life of the capital, happy in the obscurity afforded him by the crowd, rejoicing in the thought that his life and his affairs were once more his own, and the academical yoke had been slipped for ever. It was in this mood of greater cheerfulness and energy that his fresh sight of Rose found him. For the moment he was perhaps more susceptible than he ever could have been before to her young perfections, her beauty, her brilliancy, her provoking, stimulating ways. Certainly, from that first afternoon onwards, he became more and more restless to watch her, to be near her, to see what she made of herself and her gifts. In general, though it was certainly owing to her that he came so much, she took small notice of him. He regarded, or chose to regard, himself as a mere item, something systematically overlooked and forgotten in the bustle of her days and nights. He saw that she thought badly of him, that the friendship he might have had was now proudly refused him, that their first week together had left a deep impression of resentment and hostility in her mind. And all the same he came, and she asked him. And sometimes, after an hour when she had been more difficult or more satirical than usual, ending notwithstanding with a little change of tone, a careless, "'You will find us next Wednesday, as usual. So-and-so is coming to play.' Langham would walk home in a state of feeling he did not care to analyse, but which certainly quickened the pace of life a good deal. She would not let him try his luck at friendship again, but in the strangest, slightest ways did she not make him suspect every now and then that he was, in some sort, important to her, that he sometimes preoccupied her against her will?' that her will, indeed, sometimes escaped her, and failed to control her manner to him. It was not only his relations to the beauty, however, his interest in her career, 
or his perpetual consciousness of Mrs. Ellesmere's cold dislike and disapproval of his presence in her mother's drawing-room, that accounted for Langham's heightened mental temperature this winter. The existence and the proceedings of Mr. Hugh Flaxman had a very considerable share in it. "'Tell me about Mr. Langham,' said Mr. Flaxman once to Agnes Laban, in the early days of his acquaintance with the family. "'Is he an old friend?' "'Of Robert's,' replied Agnes, her cheerful, impenetrable look fixed upon the speaker. "'My sister met him once for a week in the country of the Ellesmeres. My mother and I have been only just introduced to him.' Hugh Flaxman pondered the information a little. "'Does he strike you as, well, what shall we say, unusual?' His smile struck one out of her. "'Even Robert might admit that,' she said demurely. "'Is Ellesmere so attached to him? I own I was provoked just now by his tone about Ellesmere. I was remarking on the evident physical and mental strain your brother-in-law had gone through, and he said with a nonchalance I cannot convey, "'Yes, it is astonishing Ellesmere should have ventured it. I confess I often wonder whether it was worth while.' "'Why?' said I, perhaps a little hotly. "'Well, he didn't know, wouldn't say.' But I gather that, according to him, Ellesmere is still swathed in such an unconscionable amount of religion that the few rags and patches he has got rid of are hardly worth the discomfort of the change. It seemed to me the tone of the very cool spectator, rather than the friend. However, does your sister like him? I don't know, said Agnes, looking her questioner full in the face. Hugh Flaxman's fair complexion flushed a little. He got up to go. "'He is one of the most extraordinarily handsome persons I ever met,' he remarked, as he buttoned up his coat. "'Don't you think so?' "'Yes,' said Agnes dubiously, "'if he didn't stoop, and if he didn't in general look half asleep.' Hugh Flaxman departed, more puzzled than ever, as to the reason for the constant attendance of this uncomfortable antisocial person at the Laban's house. Being himself a man of very subtle and fastidious tastes, he could imagine that so original a suitor, with such eyes, such an intellectual reputation so well sustained by scantiness of speech and the most picturesque capacity for silence, might have attractions for a romantic and wilful girl. But where were the signs of it? Rose rarely talked to him, and was always ready to make him the target of a sub-acid raillery. Agnes was clearly indifferent to him, and Mrs. Leyburn equally clearly afraid of him. Mrs. Ellesmere, too, seemed to dislike him, and yet there he was, week after week. Flaxman could not make it out. Then he tried to explore the man himself. He started various topics with him. University reform, politics, music. In vain. In his most characteristic Oxford days, Langham had never assumed a more wholesale ignorance of all subjects in heaven and earth, and never stuck more pertinaciously to the flattest forms of commonplace. Flaxman walked away at last, boiling over. The man of parts masquerading as the fool is perhaps at least as exasperating as the fool playing at wisdom. However, he was not the only person irritated. After one of these fragments of conversation, Langham also walked rapidly home in a state of most irrational petulance, his hands thrust with energy deep into the pockets of his overcoat. "'No, my successful aristocrat, you shall not have everything your own way so easily with me or with her. You may break me, but you shall not play upon me. And as for her, I'll see it out. I will see it out.' And he stiffened himself as he walked, feeling life electric all about him, and a strange new force tingling in every vein. Meanwhile, however, Mr. Flaxman was certainly having a good deal of his own way. Since the moment when his aunt, Lady Charlotte, had introduced him to Miss Laban, watching him the while with a half-smile which soon broadened into one of sly triumph, Hugh Flaxman had persuaded himself that country houses are intolerable even in the shooting season, and that London is the only place of residence during the winter for the man who aspires to govern his life on principles of reason. Through his influence and that of his aunt, Rose and Agnes, Mrs. Laban never went out, were being carried into all the high life that London can supply in November and January. Wealthy, high-born and popular, he was gradually devoting his advantages in the freest way to Rose's service. He was an excellent musical amateur, and he was always proud to play with her. He had a fine country house, and the little rooms on Campton Hill were almost always filled with flowers from his gardens. He had a famous musical library, and its treasures were lavished on the girl violinist. 
he had a singularly wide circle of friends, and with his whimsical energy he was soon inclined to make kindness to the two sisters the one test of a friend's good will. He was clearly touched by Rose, and what was to prevent his making an impression on her? To her sex he had always been singularly attractive. Like his sister, he had all sorts of bright impulses and audacities flashing and darting about him. He had a certain hauteur with men, and could play the aristocrat when he pleased, for all his philosophical radicalism. But with women he was the most delightful mixture of deference and high spirits. He loved the grace of them, the daintiness of their dress, the softness of their voices. He would have done anything to please them, anything to save them pain. At twenty-five, when he was still citizen flaxman to his college friends, and in the first fervours of a poetic defiance of prejudice and convention, he had married a gamekeeper's pretty daughter. She had died with her child, died almost, poor thing, of happiness and excitement, of the over-greatness of heaven's boon to her. Flaxman had adored her, and death had tenderly embalmed a sentiment to which life might possibly have been less kind. Since then he had lived in music, letters, and society, refusing, out of a certain fastidiousness, to enter politics, but welcomed and considered wherever he went, tall, good-looking, distinguished, one of the most agreeable and courted of men, and perhaps the richest parti in London. Still, in spite of it all, Langham held his ground. Langham would see it out. And indeed Flaxman's footing with the beauty was by no means clear, least of all to himself. She evidently liked him, but she bantered him a good deal. She would not be the least subdued or dazzled by his birth and wealth, or by those of his friends. And if she allowed him to provide her with pleasures, she would hardly ever take his advice, or knowingly consult his tastes. Meanwhile, she tormented them both a good deal by the artistic acquaintance she gathered about her. Mrs. Pearson's world, as we have said, contained a good many dubious odds and ends, and she had handed them all over to Rose. The Laban's growing intimacy with Mr. Flaxman and his circle, and through them with the finer types of the artistic life, would naturally, and by degrees, have carried them away somewhat from this earlier circle, if Rose had allowed it. But she clung persistently to its most unpromising specimens, partly out of a natural generosity of feeling, but partly also for the sake of that opposition her soul loved, her poor prickly soul, full under all her gaiety and indifference of the most desperate doubt and soreness, opposition to Catherine, opposition to Mr. Flaxman, but above all, opposition to Langham. Flaxman could often avenge himself on her, or rather on the more obnoxious members of her following, by dint of a faculty for light and stinging repartee which would send her flushed and biting her lip to have her laugh out in private. But Langham, for a long time, was defenceless. Many of her friends, in his opinion, were simply pathological curiosities. Their vanity was so frenzied, their sensibilities so morbidly developed. He felt a doctor's interest in them, coupled with more than a doctor's scepticism as to all they had to say about themselves. But Rose would invite them, would assume a quasi-intimacy with them, and Langham, as well as everybody else, had to put up with it. Even the trodden worm, however, and there came a time when the concentration of a good many different lines of feeling in Langham's mind betrayed himself at last in a sharp and sudden openness. It began to seem to him that she was specially bent often on tormenting him by these caprices of hers, and he vowed to himself finally, with an outburst of irritation due in reality to a hundred causes, that he would assert himself that he would make an effort at any rate to save her from her own follies. One afternoon, at a crowded musical party to which he had come much against his will, and only in obedience to a compulsion he dared not analyse, she asked him in passing if he would kindly find Mr. McFadden, a bass-singer, whose name stood next on the programme, and who was not to be seen in the drawing-room. Langham searched the dining-room and the hall, and at last found Mr. McFadden, a fair, flabby, unwholesome youth, in the little study or cloak-room in a state of collapse, flanked by whisky and water, and attended by two frightened maids, who handed over their charge to Langham and fled. Then it appeared that the great man had been offended by a change in the programme which hurt his vanity, had withdrawn from the drawing-room on the brink of hysterics, had 
called for spirits, which had been provided for him with great difficulty by Mrs. Laban's maids, and was there drinking himself into a state of rage and rampant dignity, which would soon have shown itself in a melodramatic return to the drawing-room, and a public refusal to sing at all in a house where art had been outraged in his person. Some of the old disciplinary instincts of the Oxford tutor awoke in Langham at the sight of the creature, and with a prompt sternness which amazed himself, and nearly set Macfadden whimpering, he got rid of the man, shut the hall door on him, and went back to the drawing-room. "'Well,' said Rose in anxiety, coming up to him. "'I have sent him away,' he said briefly, an eye of unusual quickness and brightness looking down upon her. He was in no condition to sing. He chose to be offended, apparently, because he was put out of his turn, and has been giving the servants trouble. Rose flushed deeply, and drew herself up with a look half trouble, half defiant, at Langham. "'I trust you will not ask him again,' he said, with the same decision. "'And if I might say so, there are one or two people still here whom I should like to see you exclude at the same time.' They had withdrawn into the bow window out of earshot for the rest of the room. Langham's look turned significantly towards a group near the piano. It contained one or two men whom he regarded as belonging to a low type, men who, if it suited their purpose, would be quite ready to tell or invent malicious stories of the girl they were now flattering, and whose standards and instincts represented a coarser world than Rose in reality knew anything about. Her eyes followed his. "'I know,' she said petulantly, "'that you dislike artists. They're not your world. They are mine.' "'I dislike artists. What nonsense, too. To me, personally, these men's ways don't matter in the least. They go their road, and I go mine. But I deeply resent any danger of discomfort and annoyance to you.' He still stood, frowning, a glow of indignant energy showing itself in his attitude, his glance. She could not know that he was at that moment vividly realising the drunken scene that might have taken place in her presence if he had not succeeded in getting that man safely out of the house. But she felt that he was angry, and mostly angry with her, and there was something so piquant and unexpected in his anger. "'I am afraid,' she said, with a queer, sudden submissiveness, "'you've been going through something very disagreeable. I'm very sorry. Is it my fault?' she added, with a whimsical flash of eye, half fun, half serious. He could hardly believe his ears. "'Yes, it is your fault, I think,' he answered her, amazed at his own boldness. "'Not that I was annoyed. Heavens, what does that matter? But that you and your mother and sister were very near an unpleasant scene. You will not take advice, Miss Laban. You will take your own way, in spite of what anyone else can say or hint to you. And some day you will expose yourself to annoyance when there is no one near to protect you.' "'Well, if so, it won't be for want of a mentor,' she said, dropping him a mock curtsy but her lip trembled under its smile, and her tone had not lost its gentleness. At this moment Mr. Flaxman, who gradually established himself as the joint leader of these musical afternoons, came forward to summon Rose to a quartet. He looked from one to the other, a little surprise penetrating through his suavity of manner. "'Am I interrupting you?' "'Not at all,' said Rose. Then turning back to Langham, she said in a hurried whisper, don't say anything about the wretched man. It would make Mamma nervous. He shan't come here again. Mr. Flaxman waited till the whisper was over, and then led her off, with a change of manner which she immediately perceived, and which lasted for the rest of the evening. Langham went home, and sat brooding over the fire. Her voice had not been so kind, her look so womanly, for months. Had she been reading Shirley, and would she have liked him to play Louis Mor? He went into a fit of silent, convulsive laughter as the idea occurred to him. Some secret instinct made him keep away from her for a time. At last, one Friday afternoon, as he emerged from the museum, where he had been collating the manuscript of some obscure Alexandrian, the old craving returned with added strength, and he turned involuntarily westward. An acquaintance of his, recently made in the course of work at the museum, a young Russian professor, ran after him and walked with him. Presently they passed a poster on the wall, which contained, in enormous letters, the announcement of Madame de Forêt's approaching visit to London, a list of plays and the dates of performances. 
The young Russian suddenly stopped and stood pointing at the advertisement with shaking, derisive finger, his eyes aflame, the whole man quivering with what looked like antagonism and hate. Then he broke into a fierce flood of French. Langham listened till they passed Piccadilly, passed the park, until the young savant turned southwards towards his Brompton lodgings. Then Langham slowly climbed Camden Hill, meditating. His thoughts were an odd mixture of the things he had just heard, and of a scene at Muirwall long ago, when a girl had denounced him for calumny. At the door of Lerwick Gardens he was informed that Mrs. Laban was upstairs with an attack of bronchitis, but the servant thought the young ladies were at home. Would he come in? He stood irresolute a moment, then went in on a pretext of inquiry. The maid threw open the drawing-room door, and there was Rose sitting well into the fire, for it was a raw February afternoon, with a book. She received him with all her old, hard brightness. He was indeed instantly sorry that he had made his way in. Tyrant! Was she displeased because he had slipped his chain for rather longer than usual? However, he sat down, delivered his book, and they talked first about her mother's illness. They had been anxious, she said, but the doctor, who had just taken his departure, had now completely reassured them. "'Then you will be able, probably, after all, to put in an appearance at Lady Charlotte's this evening?' he asked her. The omnivorous Lady Charlotte, of course, had made acquaintance with him in the Laban's drawing-room, as she did with everybody who crossed her path, and three days before he had received a card from her for this evening. "'Oh, yes, but I've had to miss a rehearsal this afternoon. That concert at Searle House is becoming a great nuisance.' "'It will be a brilliant affair, I suppose. Princes on one side of you, and Albani on the other. I see they have given you the most conspicuous part as violinist.' "'Yes,' she said, with a little satirical tightening of the lip. "'Yes, I suppose I ought to be much flattered.' "'Of course,' he said, smiling, but embarrassed. "'To many people you must be at this moment one of the most enviable persons in the world. A delightful art, and every opportunity to make it tell.' There was a pause. She looked into the fire. "'I don't know whether it is a delightful art,' she said presently, stifling a little yawn. "'I believe I'm getting very tired of London. Sometimes I think I shouldn't be very sorry to find myself suddenly spirited back to Burwood.' Langham gave vent to some incredulous interjection. He'd apparently surprised her in a fit of ennui, which was rare with her. "'Oh, no, not yet,' she said suddenly, with a return of animation. Madame de Foray comes next week, and I am to see her. She drew herself up, and turned a beaming face upon him. Was there a shaft of mischief in her eye? He could not tell. The firelight was perplexing. You are to see her, he said slowly. Is she coming here? I hope so. Mrs. Pearson is to bring her. I want Mamma to have the amusement of seeing her. My artistic friends are a kind of tonic to her. They excite her so much. She regards them as a sort of show, much as you do, in fact, only in a more charitable fashion. But he took no notice of what she was saying. "'Madame de Foray is coming here?' he sharply repeated, bending forward, a curious accent in his tone. "'Yes,' she replied, with apparent surprise. Then, with a careless smile, "'Oh, I remember when we were at Muirwell you were exercised that we should know her. Well, Mr. Langham, I told you then that you were only echoing unworthy gossip.' I am in the same mind still. I have seen her, and you haven't. To me she is the greatest actress in the world, and an ill-used woman to boot." Her tone had warmed with every sentence. It struck him that she had wilfully brought up the topic, that it gave her pleasure to quarrel with him. He put down his hat deliberately, got up, and stood with his back to the fire. She looked up at him curiously, but the dark, regular face was almost hidden from her. "'It is strange,' he said slowly, "'very strange, that you should have told me at this moment. "'Miss Laban, a great deal of the truth about Madame de Foray "'I could neither tell, nor could you hear. "'There are charges against her proved in open court, again and again, "'which I could not even mention in your presence. "'But one thing I can speak of. "'Do you know the story of the sister at St. Petersburg?' "'I know no stories against Madame de Foray, said Rose loftily, her quickened breath responding to the energy of his tone. "'I have always chosen not to know them. "'The newspapers were full of this particular story just before Christmas. "'I should have thought it must have reached you.' 
"'I did not see it,' she replied stiffly, "'and I cannot see what good purpose is to be served by your repeating it to me, Mr. Langham.' Langham could have smiled at her petulance, if he had not for once been determined and in earnest. "'You will let me tell it, I hope,' he said quietly. "'I will tell it so that it shall not offend your ears. As it happens, I myself thought it incredible at the time. But by an odd coincidence it has just this afternoon been repeated to me by a man who was an eye-witness of part of it.' Rose was silent. Her attitude was hauteur itself, but she made no further active opposition. Three months ago,' he began, speaking with some difficulty, but still with the suppressed force of feeling which amazed his hearer, Madame de Foray was acting in St. Petersburg. She had with her a large company, and amongst them her own young sister, Elise Romy, a girl of eighteen. This girl had been always kept away from Madame de Foray by her parents, who had never been sufficiently consoled by their eldest daughter's artistic success for the infamy of her life.' Rose started indignantly. Langham gave her no time to speak. Elise Romy, however, had developed a passion for the stage. Her parents were respectable, and you know young girls in France are brought up strictly. She knew next to nothing of her sister's escapades, but she knew that she was held to be the greatest actress in Europe. The photographs in the shops told her that she was beautiful. She conceived a romantic passion for the woman whom she had last seen when she was a child of five, and actuated partly by this hungry affection, partly by her own longing wish to become an actress, she escaped from home and joined Madame de Foray in the south of France. Madame de Foray seems at first to have been pleased to have her. The girl's adoration pleased her vanity. Her presence with her gave her new opportunities of posing. I believe, and Langan gave a little dry laugh, <laughs> they were photographed together at Marseille with their arms round each other's necks, and the photograph had an immense success. However, on the way to St. Petersburg, difficulties arose. Elise was pretty in a blonde, childish way, and she caught the attention of the jeune premier of the company, a man, the speaker became somewhat embarrassed, whom Madame de Foray seems to have regarded as her particular property. There were scenes at different times on the journey. Elise became frightened, wanted to go home, but the elder sister, having begun tormenting her, seemed to have determined to keep her hold on her, as a cat keeps and tortures a mouse, mainly for the sake of annoying the man of whom she was jealous. They arrived at St. Petersburg in the depth of winter. The girl was worn out with travelling, unhappy and ill. One night in Madame de Foray's apartments there was a supper-party, and after it a horrible quarrel. No one exactly knows what happened. But towards twelve o'clock that night, Madame de Foray turned her young sister in evening dress, a light shawl round her, out into the snowy streets of St. Petersburg, barred the door behind her, and, revolver in hand, dared the wretched man who had caused the fracas to follow her. Rose sat immovable. She had grown pale, but the firelight was not revealing. Langham turned away from her towards the blaze, holding out his hands to it mechanically. The poor child! he said, after a pause, in a lower voice, and wandered about for some hours. It was a frightful night. The great capital was quite strange to her. She was insulted, fled this way and that, grew benumbed with cold and terror, and was found unconscious in the early morning under the archway of a house some two miles from her sister's lodgings. There was a dead silence. Then Rose drew a long, quivering breath. "'I do not believe it,' she said passionately. I cannot believe it. It was amply proved at the time, said Langham dryly, though of course Madame de Foray tried to put her own colour on it. But I told you I had private information. On one of the floors of the house where Elise Romy was picked up lived a young university professor. He was editing an important Greek text, and has lately had business at the museum. I made friends with him there. He walked home with me this afternoon, saw the announcement of Madame de Foray's coming, and poured out the story. He and his wife nursed the unfortunate girl with a devotion. She lived just a week, and died of inflammation of the lungs. I never in my life heard anything so pitiful as his description of her delirium, her terror, her appeals, her shivering misery of cold. There was a pause. She is not a woman, he said presently, between his teeth. She is a wild beast. 
Still there was silence, and still he held out his hand to the flame which Rose, too, was staring at. At last he turned round. "'I've told you a shocking story,' he said hurriedly. "'Perhaps I ought not to have done it. But as you sat there talking so lightly, so gaily, it suddenly became to me utterly intolerable that that woman should ever sit here in this room, talk to you, call you by your name, laugh with you, touch your hand. Not even your wilfulness shall carry you so far. You shall not do it.' He hardly knew what he said. He was driven on by a passionate sense of physical repulsion to the notion of any contact between her pure, fair youth and something malodorous and corrupt. And there was, besides, a wild, unique excitement in claiming for once to stay, to control her. Rose lifted her head slowly. The fire was bright. He saw the tears in her eyes, tears of intolerable pity for another girl's awful story. But through the tears something gleamed, a kind of exultation, the exultation which the magician feels when he has called spirits from the vasty deep, and after long doubt and difficult invocation they rise at last before his eyes. "'I will never see her again,' she said in a low, wavering voice, but she too was hardly conscious of her own words. Their looks were on each other, the ruddy, capricious light touching her glowing his cheeks, her straight-lined grace, her white hand. Suddenly, from the gulf of another's misery into which they had both been looking, there had sprung up, by the strange contrariety of home and things, a heat and intoxication of feeling, wrapping them round, blotting out the rest of the world from them like a golden mist. Be always thus, her parted lips, her liquid eyes were saying to him. His breath seemed to fail him. He was lost in bewilderment. There were sounds outside, Catherine's voice. He roused himself with a supreme effort. "'Tonight, uh, at Lady Charlotte's?' "'Tonight,' she said, and held out her hand. A sudden madness seized him. He stooped, his lips touched it. It was hastily drawn away, and the door opened. End of Book 5, Chapter 34 Book Five, Chapter Thirty Five of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Five, Chapter Thirty Five. In the first place, my dear aunt, said Mr. Flaxman, throwing himself back in his chair in front of Lady Charlotte's drawing room fire, you may spare your admonitions, because it is becoming more and more clear to me that whatever my sentiments may be, Miss Labour never gives a serious thought to me. He turned to look at his companion over his shoulder. His tone and manner were perfectly gay, and Lady Charlotte was puzzled by him. Stuff and nonsense, replied the lady, with her usual emphasis. I never flatter you, Hugh, and I don't mean to begin now, but it would be mere folly not to recognise that you have advantages which must tell on the mind of any girl in Miss Labour's position. Hugh Flaxman rose and, standing before the fire with his hands in his pocket, made what seemed to be a close inspection of his irreproachable trouser-knees. "'I'm sorry for your theory, Aunt Charlotte,' he said, still stooping, "'but Miss Labour doesn't care tuppence about my advantages.' "'Very proper of you to say so,' returned Lady Charlotte sharply. "'The remark, however, my good sir, does more credit to your heart than your head.' "'In the next place,' he went on, undisturbed, why you should have done your best this whole winter to throw Miss Laban and me together, if you meant in the end to oppose my marrying her, I don't quite see. He looked up, smiling. Lady Charlotte reddened ever so slightly. You know my weaknesses, she said presently, with an effrontery which delighted her nephew. She is my latest novelty. She excites me. I can't do without her. As to you, I can't remember that you wanted much encouragement. But I acknowledge, after all these years of resistance— resistance to my most legitimate efforts to dispose of you, there was a certain piquancy in seeing you caught at last. "'Pon my word,' he said, throwing back his head with a not very cordial laugh, in which, however, his aunt joined. She was sitting opposite to him, her powerful, loosely-gloved hands crossed over the rich velvet of her dress, her fair, large face and greyish hair surmounted by a mighty cap as vigorous, shrewd, and individual a type of English middle age as could be found. 
The room behind her, and the second and third drawing-rooms, were brilliantly lighted. Mr. Winstay was enjoying a cigar in peace in the smoking-room, while his wife and nephew were awaiting the arrival of the evening's guests upstairs. Lady Charlotte's mind had been evidently much perturbed by the conversation with her nephew, of which we are merely describing the latter half. She was labouring under an uncomfortable sense of being hoist with her own petard, an uncomfortable memory of a certain warning of her husband's, delivered at Muirwell. "'And now,' said Mr. Flaxman, "'having confessed in so many words that you have done your best to bring me up to the fence, will you kindly re recapitulate the arguments why, in your opinion, I should not jump it?' "'Society, amusement, flirtation are one thing,' she replied with judicial imperativeness. "'Marriage is another. In these democratic days we must know everybody. We should only marry our equals.' The instant, however, the words were out of her mouth, she regretted them. Mr. Flaxman's expression changed. "'I do not agree with you,' he said calmly. "'And you know I do not. You could not, I imagine, have relied much upon that argument.' "'Good gracious, Hugh!' cried Lady Charlotte crossly. "'You talk as if I were really the old campaigner some people suppose me to be. "'I have been amusing myself. I have liked to see you amused. "'And it is only the last few weeks since you have begun to devote yourself so tremendously "'that I have come to take the thing seriously at all. "'I confess, if you like, that I have got you into the scrape. "'Now I want to get you out of it. "'I am not thin-skinned, but I hate family unpleasantnesses. "'And you know what the Duke will say.' "'The Duke be translated,' said Flaxman coolly. "'Nothing of what you have said or could say on this point, my dear aunt, has the smallest weight with me. But Providence has been kinder to you and the Duke than you deserve. Miss Leyburn does not care for me, and she does care, or I am very much mistaken, for somebody else.' He pronounced the words deliberately, watching their effect upon her. "'What, that Oxford non-entity, Mr. Langham, the Ellesmere's friend? Ridiculous!' What attraction could a man of that type have for a girl of hers? I am not bound to supply an answer to that question, replied her nephew. However, he is not a non-entity, far from it. Ten years ago, when I was leaving Cambridge, he was certainly one of the most distinguished of the young Oxford tutors. Another instance of what university reputation is worth, said Lady Charlotte scornfully. It was clear that even in the case of a beauty whom she thought it beneath him to marry, she was not pleased to see her nephew ousted by the force majeure of a rival, and that a rival whom she regarded as an utter nobody, having neither marketable eccentricity, nor family, nor social brilliance to recommend him. Flaxman understood her perplexity, and watched her with critical, amused eyes. "'I should like to know,' he said presently, with a curious slowness and suavity, "'I should greatly like to know,' "'Why you asked him here to-night?' "'You know perfectly well that I should ask anybody, a convict, a crossing-sweeper, "'if I happened to be half an hour in the same room with him.' Flaxman laughed. "'Well, it may be convenient to-night,' he said reflectively. "'What are we to do? Some thought-reading?' "'Yes, it isn't a crush. I've only asked about thirty or forty people. "'Mr. Denman is to manage it.' She mentioned an amateur thought-reader greatly in request at the moment. Flaxman cogitated for a while, and then propounded a little plan to his aunt, to which she, after some demure, agreed. "'I want to make a few notes,' he said dryly, when it was arranged. "'I should be glad to satisfy myself.' When the Mrs. Laban were announced, Rose, though the younger, came in first. She always took the lead by a sort of natural right— and Agnes never dreamt of protesting. To-night the sisters were in white. Some soft, creamy stuff was folded and draped about Rose's slim, shapely figure, in such a way as to bring out all its charming roundness and grace. Her neck and arms bore the challenge of the dress victoriously. Her red-gold hair gleamed in the light of Lady Charlotte's innumerable candles. A knot of dusky blue feathers on her shoulder, and a Japanese fan of the same colour, gave just that touch of purpose and art which the spectator seems to claim as the tribute answering to his praise in the dress of a young girl. She moved with perfect self-possession, distributing a few smiling looks to the people she knew as she advanced towards Lady Charlotte. 
Anyone with a discerning eye could have seen that she was in that stage of youth when a beautiful woman is like a statue to which the master is giving the finishing touches. Life, the sculptor, had been at work upon her, refining here, softening there, planing away awkwardness, emphasising grace, disengaging, as it were, week by week and month by month, all the beauty of which the original conception was capable. And the process is one attended always by a glow and sparkle, a kind of effluence of youth and pleasure, which makes beauty more beautiful and grace more graceful. The little murmur and rustle of persons turning to look, which had already begun to mark her entrance into a room, surrounded Rose as she walked up to Lady Charlotte. Mr. Flaxman, who had been standing absolutely silent, woke up directly she appeared, and went to greet her before his aunt. "'You failed us at rehearsal,' he said, with smiling reproach. "'We were all at sixes and sevens. "'I had a sick mother, unfortunately, who kept me at home. "'Lady Charlotte, Catherine couldn't come. "'Agnes and I are alone in the world. "'Will you chaperone us?' "'I don't know whether I will accept the responsibility tonight in that new gown,' replied Lady Charlotte grimly, putting up her eyeglass to look at it and the wearer. Rose bore the scrutiny with a light, smiling silence, even though she knew Mr. Flaxman was looking too. "'On the contrary,' she said, "'one always feels so particularly good and prim in a new frock.' "'Really? I shouldn't have thought it one of Satan's likeliest moments,' said Flaxman, laughing his eyes, however, the while saying quite other things to her, as they finished their inspection of her dress. Lady Charlotte threw a sharp glance, first at him, and then at Rose's smiling ease, before she hurried off to other guests. "'I made a marble of myself as usual,' she said to herself in disgust, "'perhaps even a worse one than I thought.' Whatever might be Hugh Flaxman's state of mind, however, he never showed greater self-possession than on this particular evening. A few minutes after Rose's entry, he introduced her for the first time to his sister, Lady Helen. The Varleys had only just come up to town for the opening of Parliament, and Lady Helen had come to-night to Martin Street, all ardour to see Hugh's new adoration, and the girl whom all the world was beginning to talk about, both as a beauty and as an artist. She rushed at Rose, if any word so violent can be applied to anything so light and airy as Lady Helen's movements, caught the girl's hands in both hers, and gazing up at her with undisguised admiration, said to her the prettiest, daintiest, most effusive things possible. Rose, who with all her lithe shapeliness, looked over tall and even a trifle stiff beside the tiny, bird-like Lady Helen, took the advances of Hugh Flaxman's sister with a pretty flush of flattered pride. She looked down at the small, radiant creature with soft and friendly eyes, and Hugh Flaxman stood by, so far well pleased. Then he went off to fetch Mr. Denman, the hero of the evening, to be introduced to her. While he was away, Agnes, who was behind her sister, saw Rose's eyes wandering from Lady Helen to the door, restlessly searching and then returning. Presently, through the growing crowd round the entrance, Agnes spied a well-known form emerging. "'Mr. Langham! But Rose never told me he was to be here to-night. And how dreadful he looks!' Agnes was so startled that her eyes followed Langlam closely across the room. Rose had seen him at once, and they greeted each other across the crowd. Agnes was absorbed, trying to analyse what had struck her so. The face was always melancholy, always pale, but to-night it was ghastly, and from the whiteness of cheek and brow, the eyes, the jet-black hair, stood out in an intense and disagreeable relief. She would have remarked on it to Rose, but that Rose's attention was claimed by the young thought-reader, Mr. Denman, whom Mr. Flaxman had brought up. Mr. Denman was a fair-haired young Hercules, whose tremulous, agitated manner contrasted oddly with his athlete's looks. Among other magnetisms, he was clearly open to the magnetism of women, and he stayed talking to Rose, staring furtively at her the while from under his heavy lids, much longer than the girl thought fair. "'Have you seen any experiments in the working of this new force before?' he asked her, with a solemnity which sat oddly on his commonplace bearded face. "'Oh, yes,' she said flippantly. "'We've tried it sometimes. It's very good fun.' He drew himself up. "'Not fun,' he said impressively. "'Not fun. Thought-reading wants seriousness. The most tremendous things depend upon it. If established, it will revolutionise our whole views of life.' 
Even a Huxley could not deny that. She studied him with mocking eyes. Do you imagine this party tonight looks very serious? His face fell. One can seldom get people to take it scientifically, he admitted, sighing. Rose, impatiently, thought him a most preposterous young man. Why was he not cricketing, or shooting, or exploring, or using the muscles nature had given him so amply, to some decent practical purpose, instead of making a business out of ruining his own nerves and other people's night after night in hot drawing-rooms? And when would he go away? "'Come, Mr. Denman,' said Flaxman, laying hands upon him. "'The audience is about collected, I think. Ah, oh, there you are.' and he gave Langham a cool greeting. "'Have you seen anything yet of these fashionable dealings with the devil?' "'Nothing. Are you a believer?' Flaxman shrugged his shoulders. "'I never refuse an experiment of any kind,' he added, with an odd change of voice. "'Come, Denman.' And the two went off. Langham came to a stand beside Rose, while old Lord Rupert, as jovial as ever, and bubbling over with gossip about the Queen's speech, appropriated Lady Helen, who was the darling of all elderly men. They did not speak. Rose sent him a ray from eyes full of a new divine shyness. He smiled gently in answer to it, and, full of her own young emotion, and of the effort to conceal it from all the world, she noticed none of that change which had struck Agnes. And all the while, if she could have penetrated the man's silence! An hour before this moment, Langham had vowed that nothing should take him to Lady Charlotte's that night, and yet here he was, riveted to her side, alive like any normal human being to every detail of her loveliness, shaken to his inmost being by the intoxicating message of her look, of the transformation which had passed in an instant over the teasing, difficult creature of the last few months. At Muirwell his chagrin had been not to feel, not to struggle, to have been cheated out of experience. Well, here is the experience in good earnest and Langham is wrestling with it for dear life. And how little the exquisite child beside him knows of it, or of the man on whom she is spending her first wilful passion. She stands strangely exulting in her own strange victory over a life, a heart, which has defied and eluded her. The world throbs and thrills about her. The crowd beside her is all unreal. The air is full of whisper, of romance. The thought-reading followed its usual course. A murder and its detection were given in dumb show. Then it was the turn of card-guessing, bank-note-finding, and the various other forms of telepathic hide-and-seek. Mr. Flaxman superintended them all, his restless eye wandering every other minute to the farther drawing-room in which the lights had been lured, catching there always the same patch of black and white, Rose's dress and the dark form beside her. "'Are you convinced? Do you believe?' said Rose, merrily looking up at her companion. "'In telepathy? Well, so far, I have not got beyond the delicacy and perfection of Mr. Denman's muscular sensation. So much, I am sure of.' "'Oh, but your scepticism is ridiculous,' she said gaily. "'We know that some people have an extraordinary power over others.' "'Yes, that certainly we know,' he answered, his voice dropping, an odd, strained note in it. "'I grant you that.' She trembled deliciously. Her eyelids fell. They stood together, conscious only of each other. Now, said Mr. Denman, advancing to the doorway between the two drawing-rooms, I have done all I can. I am exhausted. But let me beg of you all to go on with some experiments amongst yourselves. Every fresh discovery of this power in a new individual is a gain to science. I believe about one in ten has some share of it. Mr. Flaxman and I will arrange everything, if anyone will volunteer. The audience broke up into groups, laughing, chatting, suggesting this and that. Presently Lady Charlotte's loud dictatorial voice made itself heard, as she stood, eyeglass in hand, looking round the circle of her guests. Somebody must venture. We are losing time. Then the eyeglass stopped at Rose, who was now sitting tall and radiant on the sofa, her blue fan across her white knees. "'Miss Laban, you are always public-spirited. Will you be victimised for the good of science?' The girl got up with a smile. "'And Mr. Langham, will you see what you can do with Miss Laban? "'You, we all choose her task, don't we? Then Mr. Langham wills.' Flaxman came up to explain. 
Langham had turned to Rose, a wild fury with Lady Charlotte of the whole affair sweeping through him. But there was no time to demur. That judicial eye was on them. The large figure and towering cap bent towards them. Refusal was impossible. "'Command me,' he said, with a sudden straightening of the form and a flush on the pale cheek. "'I'm afraid Miss Laban will find me a very bad partner.' "'Well, now, then,' said Flaxman, "'Miss Laban, will you please go down into the library while we settle what you are to do?' She went, and he held the door open for her. But she passed out unconscious of him, rosy, confused, her eyes bent on the ground. "'Now, then, what shall Miss Laban do?' asked Lady Charlotte in the same loud, emphatic tone. "'If I might suggest something quite different from anything that has been yet tried,' said Mr. Flaxman, "'suppose we require Miss Laban to kiss the hand of the little marble statue of Hope in the far drawing-room. What do you say, Langham?' "'What do you please?' said Langham, moving up to him. A glance passed between the two men. In Langham's there was a hardly sane antagonism and resentment. In Flaxman's, an excited intelligence. "'Now, then,' said Flaxman coolly, "'fix your mind steadily on what Miss Laban is to do. You must take her hand, but except in thought you must carefully follow and not lead her. Shall I call her?' Langham abruptly assented. He had a passionate sense of being watched, tricked. Why were he and she to be made a spectacle for this man and his friends? A mad, irrational indignation surged through him. Then she was led in blindfolded, one hand stretched out, feeling the air in front of her. The circle of people drew back. Mr. Flaxman and Mr. Denman prepared, notebook in hand, to watch the experiment. Langham moved desperately forward. But the instant her soft, trembling hand touched his, as though by enchantment, the surrounding scene, the faces, the lights, were blotted out from him. He forgot his anger. He forgot everything but her, and this thing she was to do. He had her in his grasp. He was the man, the master. And what enchanting readiness to yield in the swaying, pliant form! In the distance, far away, gleamed the statue of Hope, a child on tiptoe, one outstretched arm just visible from where he stood. There was a moment's silent expectation. Every eye was riveted on the two figures, on the dark, handsome man, on the blindfolded girl. At last Rose began to move gently forward. It was a strange, wavering motion. The breath came quickly through her slightly parted lips. Her bright colour was ebbing. She was conscious of nothing but the grasp in which her hand was held. Otherwise her mind seemed a blank. Her state during the next few seconds was not unlike the state of someone under the partial influence of an anaesthetic. A benumbing grip was laid on all her faculties, and she knew nothing of how she moved or where she was going. Suddenly the trance cleared away. It might have lasted half an hour or five seconds, for all she knew. But she was standing beside a small marble statue in the farthest drawing-room, and her lips had on them a slight sense of chill, as though they had just been laid to something cold. She pulled off the handkerchief from her eyes. Above her was Langham's face, a marvellous glow and animation in every line of it. "'Have I done it?' she asked in a tremulous whisper. For the moment her self-control was gone. She was still bewildered. He nodded, smiling. "'I'm so glad,' she said, still in the same quick whisper, gazing at him. There was a most adorable abandon in her whole look and attitude. He could but just restrain himself from taking her in his arms, and for one bright flashing instant each saw nothing but the other. The heavy curtain which had partially hidden the door of the little old-fashioned powder-closet as they approached it, and through which they had swept without heeding, was drawn back with a rattle. "'She has done it! Hurrah!' cried Mr. Flaxman. "'What a rush that last was, Miss Laban! You left us all behind!' Rose turned to him, still dazed, drawing her hand across her eyes. A rush? She had known nothing about it. Mr. Flaxman turned and walked back, apparently to report to his aunt, who, with Lady Helen, had been watching the experiment from the main drawing-room. His face was a curious mixture of gravity and the keenest excitement. 
the gravity was mostly sharp compunction. He had satisfied a passionate curiosity, but in the doing of it he had outraged certain instincts of breeding and refinement, which were now revenging themselves. "'Did she do it exactly?' said Lady Helen eagerly. "'Exactly,' he said, standing still. Lady Charlotte looked at him significantly, but he would not see her look. "'Lady Charlotte, where is my sister?' said Rose, coming up from the back room, looking now nearly as white as her dress. It appeared that Agnes had just been carried off by a lady who lived on Campton Hill close to the Leyburns, and who had been obliged to go at the beginning of the last experiment. Agnes, torn between her interest in what was going on, and her desire to get back to her mother, had at last hurriedly accepted this Mrs. Sherwood's offer of a seat in her carriage, imagining that her sister would want to stay at a good deal later, and relying on Lady Charlotte's promise that she should be safely put into a hansom. "'I must go,' said Rose, putting her hands to her head. "'How tiring this is! How long did it take, Mr. Flaxman?' "'Exactly three minutes,' he said, his gaze fixed upon her with an expression that only Lady Helen noticed. "'So little. Good night, Lady Charlotte.' and giving her hand first to her hostess, then to Mr. Flaxman's bewildered sister, she moved away into the crowd. "'You! Of course you are going down with her!' exclaimed Lady Charlotte under her breath. "'You must! I promised to see her safely off the premises!' He stood immovable. Lady Helen, with a reproachful look, made a step forward, but he caught her arm. "'Don't spoil sport,' he said in a tone which, amid the hum of discussion caused by the experiment, was heard only by his aunt and sister. They looked at him, the one amazed, the other grimly observant, and caught a slight significant motion of the head towards Langham's distant figure. Langham came up and made his farewells. As he turned his back, Lady Helen's large, astonished eyes followed him to the door. "'Oh, Hugh!' was all she could say as they came back to her brother. "'Never mind, Nelly,' he whispered touched by the bewildered sympathy of her look. "'I will tell you all about it to-morrow. I have not been behaving well, and am not particularly pleased with myself. But for her it's all right. Poor, pretty little thing!' And he walked away into the thick of the conversation. Downstairs the hall was already full of people waiting for their carriages. Langham, hurrying down, saw Rose coming out of the cloak-room, muffled up in brown furs, a pale, childlike fatigue in her looks, which set his heart beating faster than ever. "'Miss Raven, how are you going home?' "'Will you ask for a hansom, please?' "'Take my arm,' he said, and she clung to him through the crush till they reached the door. Nothing but private carriages were in sight. The street seemed blocked, a noisy tumult of horses and footmen and shouting men with lanterns. Which of them suggested, "'Shall we walk a few steps?' At any rate, here they were, out in the wind and the darkness, every step carrying them farther away from that moving patch of noise and light behind. "'We shall find a cab at once in Park Lane,' he said. "'Are you warm?' "'Perfectly.' A full hood fitted round her face, to which the colour was coming back. She held her cloak tightly round her, and her little feet, fairly well shod, slipped in and out on the dry, frosty pavement. Suddenly they passed a huge, unfinished house, the building of which was being pushed on by electric light. The great walls, ivory white in the glare, rose into the purply blue of the starry February sky, and as they passed within the power of the lamps, each saw with noonday distinctness every line and feature in the other's face. They swept on, the night with its alternations of flame and shadow, an unreal and enchanted world about them. A space of darkness succeeded the space of daylight. Behind them in the distance was the sound of hammers and workmen's voices. Before them the dim trees of the park. Not a human being was in sight. London seemed to exist to be the mere dark, friendly shelter of this wandering of theirs. A blast of wind blew her cloak out of her grasp, but before she could close it again an arm was flung around her. She could not speak or move. She stood passive, conscious only of the strangeness of the wintry wind, and of this warm breast against which her cheek was laid. "'Oh, stay there,' a voice said, close to her ear. "'Rest there, pale, tired child.' 
pale, tired little child. That moment seemed to last an eternity. He held her close, cherishing and protecting her from the cold, not kissing her, till at length she looked up with bright eyes, shining through happy tears. "'Are you sure at last?' she said, strangely enough, speaking out of the far depths of her own thought to his. "'Sure?' he said, his expression changing. "'What can I be sure of? I am sure that I am not worth your loving, sure that I am poor, insignificant, obscure, that if you give yourself to me you will be miserably throwing yourself away.' She looked at him, still smiling, a white sorceress weaving spells about him in the darkness. He drew her lightly gloved hand through his arm, holding the fragile fingers close in his, and they moved on. "'Do you know,' he repeated, a tone of intense melancholy replacing the tone of passion, "'how little I have to give you?' "'I know,' she answered, her face turned shyly away from him, her words coming from under the fur hood which had fallen forward a little. "'I know that you are not rich, that you distrust yourself, that—' "'Oh, hush!' he said, and his voice was full of pain. "'You know so little. Let me paint myself. I have lived alone for myself, in myself, till sometimes there seems to be hardly anything left in me to love or be loved. Nothing but a brain, a machine that exists only for certain selfish ends.' My habits are the tyrants of years, and at Mule, though I loved you there, they were strong enough to carry me away from you. There is something paralysing in me which is always forbidding me to feel, to will. Sometimes I think it is an actual physical disability, the horror that is in me of change, of movement, of effort. Can you bear with me? Can you be poor? Can you live a life of monotony? Oh, impossible! he broke out almost putting her hand away from him. "'You, who ought to be a queen of this world, for whom everything bright and brilliant is waiting, if you will but stretch out your hand to it. It is a crime and an infamy that I should be speaking to you like this.' Rose raised her head. A passing light shone upon her. She was trembling and pale again, but her eyes were unchanged. "'No, no,' she said wistfully. Not if you love me. He hung above her, an agony of feeling in the fine, rigid face, of which the beautiful features and surfaces were already worn and blanched by the life of thought. What possessed him was not so much distrust of circumstance as doubt, hideous doubt, of himself, of this very passion beating within him. She saw nothing, meanwhile, but the self-depreciation which she knew so well in him and against which her love in its rash ignorance and generosity cried out. "'You will not say you love me,' she cried with hurrying breath. "'But I know, I know, you do.' Then her courage sinking, ashamed, blushing, once more turning away from him. "'At least, if you don't, I am very, very unhappy.' The soft words flew through his blood. For an instant he felt himself saved, like Faust, saved by the surpassing moral beauty of one moment's impression. That she should need him, that his life should matter to hers. They were passing the garden wall of a great house. In the deepest shadow of it, he stooped suddenly and kissed her. End of Book 5, Chapter 35« Book Five, Chapter Thirty Six of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Five, Chapter Thirty Six. Langham parted with Rose at the corner of Martin Street. She would not let him take her any farther. I will say nothing, she whispered to him as he put her into a passing hansom, wrapping her cloak warmly round her. Till I see you again. To morrow? "'Tomorrow morning,' he said, waving his hand to her, and in another instant he was facing the north wind alone. He walked on fast towards Beaumont Street, but by the time he reached his destination midnight had struck. He made his way into his room, where the fire was still smouldering, and striking a light sank into his large reading-chair,
beside which the volumes used in the afternoon lay littered on the floor. He was suddenly penetrated with the cold of the night, and hung shivering over the few embers which still glowed. What had happened to him? In this room, in this chair, the self-forgetting excitement of that walk, scarcely half an hour old, seems to him already long past, incredible almost. And yet the brain was still full of images, the mind still full of a hundred new impressions. That fair head against his breast, those soft confiding words, those yielding lips. Ah, it is the poor, silent, insignificant student that has conquered. It is he, not the successful man of the world, that has held that young and beautiful girl in his arms, and heard from her the sweetest and humblest confession of love. Fate can have neither wit nor conscience to have ordained it so, but fate has so ordained it. Langham takes note of his victory, takes dismal note also that the satisfaction of it has already half departed. So the great moment has come and gone. The one supreme experience which life and his own will had so far rigidly denied him is his. He has felt the torturing thrill of passion. He has evoked such an answer as all men might envy him. And, fresh from Rose's kiss, from Rose's beauty, the strange, maimed soul falls to a pitiless analysis of his passion, her response. One moment he is at her feet in a voiceless trance of gratitude and tenderness. The next is nothing what it promises to be, and has the boon already, now that he has it in his grasp, lost some of its beauty, just as the seashell drawn out of the water, where its lovely iridescence tempted eye and hand, loses half its fairy charm. The night wore on. Outside an occasional cab or cart would rattle over the stones of the street, an occasional voice or step would penetrate the thin walls of the house, bringing a shock of sound into that silent upper room. Nothing caught Langham's ear. He was absorbed in the dialogue which was to decide his life. Opposite to him, as it seemed, there sat a spectral reproduction of himself, his true self, with whom he held a long and ghastly argument. "'But I love her! I love her! A little courage, a little effort, and I too can achieve what other men achieve. I have gifts, great gifts. Mere contact with her, the mere necessities of the situation, will drive me back to life, teach me how to live normally, like other men. I have not forced her love. It has been a free gift. Who can blame me if I take it, if I cling to it, as the man freezing in a crevasse clutches the rope thrown to him? To which the pale spectre self said scornfully, Courage and effort may as well be dropped out of your vocabulary. They are words that you have no use for. Replace them by two others, habit and character. Slave, as you are of habit, of the character you have woven for yourself out of years of deliberate living. What wild unreason to imagine that love can unmake, can recreate. What you are, you are to all eternity. Bear your own burden, but for God's sake beguile no other human creature into trusting you with theirs. But she loves me. Impossible that I should crush and tear so kind, so warm a heart. Poor child, poor child, I have played on her pity, I have won all she had to give. And now, to throw her gift back in her face, oh, monstrous, oh, inhuman! And the cold drops stood on his forehead. But the other self was inexorable. You have acted as you were bound to act as any man may be expected to act, in whom will and manhood and true human kindness are dying out, poisoned by despair and the tyranny of the critical habit. But at least do not add another crime to the first. What in God's name have you to offer a creature of such claims, such ambitions? You are poor. You must go back to Oxford. You must take up the work your soul loathes, grow more soured, more embittered, maintain a useless, degrading struggle, till her youth is done, her beauty wasted, until you yourself have lost every shred of decency and dignity, even that decorous outward life in which you can still wrap yourself from the world. Think of the little house, the children, the money difficulties. She, spiritually starved, every illusion gone. You, incapable soon of love, incapable even of pity, conscious only of a dull rage with her. Yourself, the world. Bow the neck, submit, refuse that long agony for yourself and her, while there is still time. Kismet! Kismet! 
and spread out before Langham's shrinking soul, there lay a whole dismal Hogarthian series, image leading to image, calamity to calamity, till in the last scene of all the maddened inward sight perceived two figures, two grey and withered figures, far apart, gazing at each other with cold and sunken eyes across dark rivers of sordid, irremediable regret. The hours passed away, and in the end the spectre self, a cold and bloodless conqueror, slipped back into the soul which remorse and terror, love and pity, a last impulse of hope, a last stirring of manhood, had been alike powerless to save. The February dawn was just beginning when he dragged himself to a table and wrote. Then for hours afterwards he sat sunk in his chair, the stupor of fatigue broken every now and then by a flash of curious introspection. It was a base thing which he had done. It was also a strange thing psychologically, and at intervals he tried to understand it, to track it to its causes. At nine o'clock he crept out into the frosty daylight, found a commissionaire who was accustomed to do errands for him, and sent him with a letter to Lerwick Gardens. On his way back he passed a gunsmith's, and stood looking fascinated at the shining barrels. Then he moved away, shaking his head, his eyes gleaming as though the spectacle of himself had long ago passed the bounds of tragedy, become farcical even. I should only stand a month, arguing with my finger on the trigger. In the little hall his landlady met him, gave a start at the sight of him, and asked him if he ailed, and if she could do anything for him. He gave her a sharp answer, and went upstairs, where she heard him dragging books and boxes about as though he were packing. A little later, Rose was standing at the dining-room window of number 27, looking on to a few trees bedecked with rime which stood outside. The ground and roofs were white, a promise of sun was struggling through the fog. So far everything in these unfrequented Camden Hill roads was clean, crisp, enlivening, and the sparkle in Rose's mood answered to that of nature. Breakfast had just been cleared away. Agnes was upstairs with Mrs. Laban. Catherine, who was staying in the house for a day or two, was in a chair by the fire, reading some letters forwarded to her from Bedford Square. He would appear some time in the morning, she supposed. With an expression half rueful, half amused, she fell to imagining his interview with Catherine, with her mother. Poor Catherine! Rose feels herself happy enough to allow herself a good honest pang of remorse for much of her behaviour to Catherine this winter. How thorny she's been! How unkind often to this sad, changed sister! And now this will be a fresh blow. But afterwards, when she's got over it, when she knows that it makes me happy, that nothing else would make me happy, then she will be reconciled, and she and I perhaps will make friends all over again from the beginning. I won't be angry or hard over it. Poor Cathy! and with regard to Mr. Flaxman. As she stands there waiting idly for what destiny may send her, she puts herself through a little light catechism about this other friend of hers. He behaved somewhat oddly towards her of late. She begins now to remember that her exit from Lady Charlotte's house the night before had been a very different matter from the royally attended leave-takings presided over by Mr. Flaxman, which generally befell her there. Had he understood? With a little toss of her head she said to herself that she did not care if it was so. I have never encouraged Mr. Flaxman to think I was going to marry him. But, of course, Mr. Flaxman will consider she has done badly for herself. So will Lady Charlotte, and all her outer world. They will say she is dismally throwing herself away, and her mother, no doubt influenced by the clamour, will take up very much the same line. What matter? The girl's spirit seemed to rise against all the world, there was a sort of romantic exultation in her sacrifice of herself, a jubilant looking forward to remonstrance, a wilful determination to overcome it. That she was about to do the last thing she could have been expected to do gave her pleasure. Almost all artistic faculty goes with a love of surprise and caprice in life. Rose had her full share of the artistic love for the impossible and the difficult. Besides, success! To make a man hope and love and live again, that shall be her success. She leaned against the window, her eyes filling, her heart very soft. 
Suddenly she saw a commissionaire coming up the little flagged passage to the door. He gave in a note, and immediately afterwards the dining-room door opened. "'A letter for you, miss,' said the maid. Rose took it, glanced at the handwriting. A bright flush, a surreptitious glance at Catherine, who sat absorbed in a wandering letter from Mrs. Darcy. Then the girl carried her prize to the window and opened it. Catherine read on, gathering up the mule names and details, as some famished gleaner might gather up the scattered ears on a plundered field. At last, something in the silence of the room, and of the other inmate in it, struck her. "'Rose,' she said, looking up, "'was that someone brought you a note?' The girl turned with a start. A letter fell to the ground. She made a faint, ineffectual effort to pick it up, and sank into a chair. "'Rose, darling!' cried Catherine, springing up. "'Are you ill?' Rose looked at her with a perfectly colourless, fixed face, made a feeble, negative sign, and then laying her arms on the breakfast-table in front of her, let her head fall upon them. Catherine stood over her aghast. "'My darling, what is it? Come and lie down. Take this water.' She put some close to her sister's hand, but Rose pushed it away. "'Don't talk to me.' she said with difficulty. Catherine knelt beside her in helpless pain and perplexity, her cheek resting against her sister's shoulder as a mute sign of sympathy. What could be the matter? Presently her gaze travelled from Rose to the letter on the floor. It lay with the address uppermost, and she at once recognised Langham's handwriting. But before she could combine any rational ideas with this quick perception, Rose had partially mastered herself. She raised her head slowly and grasped her sister's arm. "'I'm startled,' she said, a forced smile on her white lips. "'Last night Mr. Langham asked me to marry him. I expected him here this morning to consult with Mamma and you. That letter is to inform me that he made a mistake, and he is very sorry. So am I. It is so, so bewildering.' She got up restlessly and went to the fire as though shivering with cold. Catherine thought she hardly knew what she was saying. The elder sister followed her, and, throwing an arm round her, pressed the slim, irresponsive figure close. Her eyes were bright with anger, her lips quivering. "'That he should dare!' she cried. "'Rose! My poor little Rose!' "'Don't blame him,' said Rose, crouching down before the fire, while Catherine fell into the armchair again. "'It doesn't seem to count from you. You you have always been so ready to blame him.' Her brow contracted. She looked frowning into the fire, her still colourless mouth working painfully. Catherine was cut to the heart. "'Oh, Rose,' she said, holding out her hands, "'I will blame no one, dear. I seem hard, but I love you so. Oh, tell me, you would have told me everything once.' There was the most painful yearning in her tone. Rose lifted her listless right hand and put it into her sister's outstretched palms but she made no answer, till suddenly, with a smothered cry, she fell towards Catherine. "'Catherine, I cannot bear it. I I said I loved him. He he kissed me. I could kill myself and him.' Catherine never forgot the mingled tragedy and domesticity of the hour that followed, the little familiar morning sounds in and about the house, tradesmen calling, bells ringing, and here, at her feet, a spectacle of moral and mental struggle which she only half understood but which wrung her inmost heart. Two strains of feeling seemed to be present in Rose. A sense of shock, of wounded pride, of intolerable humiliation, and a strange intervening passion of pity, not for herself, but for Langham, which seemed to have been stirred in her by his letter. But though the elder questioned, and the younger seemed to answer, Catherine could hardly piece the story together, nor could she find the answer to the question filling her own indignant heart. Does she love him? At last Rose got up from her crouching position by the fire, and stood, a white ghost of herself, pushing back the bright encroaching hair from eyes that were dry and feverish. "'If I could only be angry, downright angry,' she said, more to herself than Catherine, "'it would do one good.' "'Give others leave to be angry for you,' cried Catherine. "'Don't,' said Rose, almost fiercely, drawing herself away. "'You don't know.' It is for fate. Why did we ever meet? He may read his letter. You must. You misjudge him. You always have. 
No, no. And she nervously crushed the letter in her hand. Not yet. But you shall read it some time. You and Robert, too. Married people always tell one another. It is due to him, perhaps due to me, too. And a hot flush transfigured her paleness for an instant. Oh, my head! Why does one's mind affect one's body like this? It shall not. It is humiliating. Miss Laban has been jilted and cannot see visitors. That is the kind of thing. Cathy, when you finish that document, will you kindly come and hear me practice my last ref? I'm going. Good-bye. She moved to the door, but Catherine had only just time to catch her, or she would have fallen over a chair from sudden giddiness. Miserable, she said, dashing a tear from her eyes. I must go and lie down, then, in the proper missish fashion. Mind on your peril, Catherine, not a word to any one but Robert. I shall tell Agnes, and Robert is not to speak to me. No, don't come. I'll go alone. And warning her sister back, she groped her way upstairs. Inside her room, when she had locked the door, she stood a moment upright with the letter in her hand. The blotted, incoherent scrawl, where Langham had for once forgotten to be literary, where every pitiful half-finished sentence pleaded with her, even in the first smart of her wrong, for pardon, for compassion, as towards something maimed and paralysed from birth, unworthy even of her contempt. Then the tears began to rain over her cheeks. "'I was not good enough. I was not good enough. God would not let me.' And she fell on her knees beside the bed, the little bit of paper crushed in her hands against her lips. Not good enough for what? To save? How lightly she had dreamed of healing, redeeming, changing! And the task is refused her. It is not so much the cry of personal desire that shakes her as she kneels and weeps, nor is it mere wounded woman's pride. It is a strange, stern sense of law. Had she been other than she is, more loving, less self-absorbed, loftier in motive, he could not have loved her so, have left her so. Deep, undeveloped forces of character stir within her. She feels herself judged, and with a righteous judgment, issuing inexorably from the facts of life and circumstance. Meanwhile, Catherine was shut up downstairs with Robert, who had come over early to see how the household fared. Robert listened to the whole luckless story with astonishment and dismay. This particular possibility of mischief had gone out of his mind for some time. He had been busy in his East End work. Catherine had been silent. Over how many matters they would have once have discussed with open heart was she silent now. "'I ought to have been warned,' he said with quick decision, "'if you knew this was going on. I am the only man among you, and I understand Langham better than the rest of you.' I might have looked after the poor child a little. Catherine accepted the reproach mutely as one little smart the more. However, what had she known? She had seen nothing unusual of late, nothing to make her think a crisis was approaching. Nay, she had flattered herself that Mr. Flaxman, whom she liked, was gaining ground. Meanwhile, Robert stood pondering anxiously what could be done. Could anything be done? I must go and see him, he said presently. "'Yes, dearest, I must. Impossible the thing should be left so. I am his old friend, almost her guardian. You say she is in great trouble. Why, it may shadow her whole life. No, he must explain things to us. He is bound to. He shall. It may be something comparatively trivial in the way, after all. Money, or prospects, or something of the sort. You have not seen the letter, you say? It is the last marriage in the world one could have desired for her. But if she loves him, Catherine—' If she loves him. He turned to her, appealing, remonstrating. Catherine stood pale and rigid. Incredible that she should think it right to intermeddle, to take the smallest step towards reversing so plain a declaration of God's will. She could not sympathise. She would not consent. Robert watched her in painful indecision. He knew that she thought him indifferent to her true reason for finding some comfort, even in her sister's trouble that he seemed to her mindful only of the passing human misery, indifferent to the eternal risk. They stood sadly looking at one another, then he snatched up his hat. "'I must go,' he said in a low voice. "'It is right.' And he went, stepping, however, with the best intentions in the world, into a blunder. Catherine sat painfully struggling with herself after he had left her. 
Then someone came into the room, someone with pale looks and flashing eyes. It was Agnes. "'She just let me in to tell me and put me out again,' said the girl, her whole even, cheerful self one flame of scorn and wrath. "'What are such creatures made for, Catherine? Why do they exist?' Meanwhile, Robert had trudged off through the frosty morning streets to Langham's lodgings. His mood was very hot by the time he reached his destination, and he climbed the staircase to Langham's room in some excitement. When he tried to open the door after the answer to his knock bidding him enter, he found something barring the way. "'Wait a little,' said the voice inside. "'I will move the case.' With difficulty the obstacle was removed, and the door opened. Seeing his visitor, Langham stood for a moment in sombre astonishment. The room was littered with books and packing-cases with which he had been busy. "'Come in,' he said, not offering to shake hands. Robert shut the door, and, picking his way among the books, stood leaning on the back of the chair Langham pointed out to him. Langham paused opposite to him, his wavy jet-black hair falling forward over the marble, pale face which had been Robert's young ideal of manly beauty. The two men were only six years distant in age but so strong his old association that Robert's feeling towards his friend had always remained in many respects the feeling of the undergraduate towards the don. His sense of it now filled him with a curious awkwardness. "'I know why you are come,' said Langham slowly, after a scrutiny of his visitor. "'I am here by a mere accident,' said the other, thinking perfect frankness best. "'My wife was present when her sister received your letter, "'Rose gave her leave to tell me. "'I had gone up to ask after them all, and came on to you, "'of course on my own responsibility entirely. "'Rose knows nothing of my coming, nothing of what I have to say.' "'He paused, struck against his will by the looks of the man before him. "'Whatever he had done during the past twenty-four hours, "'he had clearly had the grace to suffer in the doing of it. "'You can have nothing to say,' said Langham leaning against the chimney-piece and facing him with black, darkly burning eyes. "'You know me.' Never had Robert seen him under this aspect. All the despair, all the bitterness hidden under the languid student's exterior of every day had, as it were, risen to the surface. He stood at bay, against his friend, against himself. "'No,' exclaimed Robert stoutly, "'I do not know you in the sense you mean.' I do not know you as the man who could beguile a girl on to a confession of love, and then tell her that for you marriage was too great a burden to be faced. Langham started, and then closed his lips in an iron silence. Robert repented him a little. Langham's strange individuality always impressed him against his will. I did not come simply to reproach you, Langham, he went on, though I confess to being very hot. I came to try and find out— for myself only, mind, whether what prevents you from following up what I understand happened last night is really a matter of feeling or a matter of outward circumstance. If upon reflection you find that your feeling for Rose is not what you imagine it to be, I shall have my own opinion about your conduct. But I shall be the first to acquiesce in what you have done this morning. If, on the other hand, you are simply afraid of yourself in harness and afraid of the responsibilities of practical married life— I cannot help begging you to talk the matter over with me, and let us face it together. Whether Rose would ever, under any circumstances, get over the shock of this morning, I have not the remotest idea. But, and he hesitated, it seems the feeling you appealed to yesterday has been of long growth. You know perfectly well what havoc a thing of this kind may make in a girl's life. I don't say it will. But at any rate, it is all so desperately serious, I could not hold my hand. I am doing what is in no doubt wholly unconventional. But I am your friend, and her brother. I brought you together, and I ask you to take me into counsel. If you have but done it before. There was a moment's dead silence. You cannot pretend to believe, said Langham at last, with the same sombre self-containedness, that a marriage with me would be for your sister-in-law's happiness. "'I don't know what to believe,' cried Robert. "'No,' he added frankly. "'No, when I saw you first attracted by Rose at Muirwell, "'I disliked the idea heartily. "'I was glad to see you separated. "'A priori I never thought you suited to each other. "'But reasoning that holds good when a thing is wholly in the air, 
looks very different when a man has committed himself and another, as you have done. Langham surveyed him for a moment, then shook his hair impatiently from his eyes, and rose from his bending position by the fire. Elsmere, there is nothing to be said. I have behaved as vilely as you please. I have forfeited your friendship. But I should be an even greater fiend and weakling than you think me if, in cold blood, I could let your sister run the risk of marrying me. I could not trust myself. You may think of the statement as you like. I should make her miserable. Last night I had not parted from her an hour before I was utterly and irrevocably sure of it. My habits are my master's. I believe, he added slowly, his eyes fixed weirdly on something beyond Robert, I could even grow to hate what came between me and them. Was it the last word of the man's life? It struck Robert with a kind of shiver. Pray heaven, he said with a groan, getting up to go, you may not have made her miserable already. Did it hurt her so much? asked Langham, almost inaudibly, turning away. Robert's tone, meanwhile, calling up a new and scorching image in the subtle brain tissue. I have not seen her, said Robert abruptly, but when I came in I found my wife, who has no light tears, weeping for her sister. His voice dropped, as though what he was saying were in truth too pitiful and too intimate for speech. Langham said no more. His face had become a marble mask again. "'Good-bye,' said Robert, taking up his hat with a dismal sense of having got foolishly through a fool's errand. "'As I said to you before, what Rose's feeling is at this moment I cannot even guess. Very likely she would be the first to repudiate half of what I have been saying. And I see that you will not talk to me. You will not take me into your confidence and speak to me, not only as her brother, but as your friend. And—' And are you going? What does this mean? He looked interrogatively at the open packing cases. I'm going back to Oxford, said the other briefly. I cannot stay in these rooms, in, in these streets. Robert was sore perplexed. What real, nay, what terrible suffering in the face and manner, and yet how futile, how needless! He felt himself wrestling with something intangible and phantom-like, wholly unsubstantial, and yet endowed with a ghastly, indefinite power over human life. "'It's very hard,' he said hurriedly, moving nearer, "'that our old friendship should be crossed like this. "'Do trust me a little. "'You are always undervaluing yourself. "'Why not take a friend into counsel sometimes "'when you sit in judgment on yourself and your possibilities? "'Your own perceptions are all warped.' "'Langham, looking at him, thought his smile one of the most beautiful and one of the most irrelevant things he had ever seen. "'I will write to you, Ellesmere,' he said, holding out his hand. "'Speech is impossible to me. I never had any words except through my pen.' Robert gave it up. In another minute Langham was left alone. But he did no more packing for hours. He spent the middle of the day sitting dumb and immovable in his chair. Imagination was at work again more feverishly than ever. He was tortured by a fixed image of Rose, suffering and paling. And after a certain number of hours he could no more bear the incubus of this thought than he could put up with the flat prospects of married life the night before. He was all at sea, barely sane, in fact. His life had been so long purely intellectual that this sudden strain of passion and fierce practical interests seemed to unhinge him to destroy his mental balance. He bethought him. This afternoon he knew she had a last rehearsal at Searle House. Afterwards her custom was to come back from St. James's Park to High Street, Kensington, and walk up the hill to her own home. He knew it, for on two occasions after these rehearsals he had been at Lerwick Gardens, waiting for her with Agnes and Mrs. Laban. Would she go this afternoon? A subtle instinct told him that she would. It was nearly six o'clock that evening when Rose, stepping out from the High Street station, crossed the main road and passed into the darkness of one of the streets leading up the hill. She had forced herself to go, and she would go alone. But as she toiled along she felt weary and bruised all over. She carried with her a heart of lead, a sense of utter soreness, a longing to hide herself from eyes and tongues. The only thing that dwelt softly in the shaken mind 
was a sort of inconsequent memory of Mr. Flaxman's manner at the rehearsal. Had she looked so ill? She flushed hotly at the thought, and then realised again with a sense of childish comfort the kind look and voice, the delicate care shown in shielding her from any unnecessary exertion, the brotherly grasp of the hand with which he put her into the cab that took her to the underground. Suddenly, when the road made a dark turn to the right, she saw a man standing. As she came nearer, she saw that it was Langham. "'You!' she cried, stopping. He came up to her. There was a light over the doorway of a large, detached house not far off, which threw a certain illumination over him, though it left her in shadow. He said nothing, but he held out both his hands mutely. She fancied rather than saw the pale emotion of his look. "'What?' she said after a pause. "'You think to-night is last night? You and I have nothing to say to each other, Mr. Langham.' "'I have everything to say,' he answered under his breath. "'I have committed a crime, a villainy.' "'And is it not pleasant to you?' she said, quivering. "'I am sorry I cannot help you. But you are wrong. It was no crime. It was necessary and profitable, like the doses of one's childhood. Oh, I might have guessed you would do this.' "'No, Mr. Langham, I am in no danger of an interesting decline. I have just played my concerto very fairly. I shall not disgrace myself at the concert to-morrow night. You may be at peace. I have learned several things to-day that have been salutary, very salutary.' She paused. He walked beside her while she pelted him, unresisting, helplessly silent. "'Don't come any farther,' she said resolutely after a minute, turning her face to him. Let us be quits. I was a temptingly easy prey. I bear no malice. Do not let me break your friendship with Robert. That began before this foolish business. It should outlast it. Very likely we shall be friends again, like ordinary people, some day. I do not imagine your wound is very deep and— But no. Her lips closed. Not even for pride's sake and retort's sake will she desecrate the past, belittle her own first love. She held out her hand. It was very dark. He could see nothing among her furs but the gleaming whiteness of her face. The whole personality seemed centred in the voice, the half-mocking, vibrating voice. He took her hand and dropped it instantly. "'You do not understand,' he said hopelessly, feeling as though every phrase he uttered, or could utter, were equally fatuous, equally shameful. "'Thank heaven, you never will understand.' "'I think I do,' she said with a change of tone, and paused. He raised his eyes involuntarily, met hers, and stood bewildered. What was the expression in them? It was yearning, but not the yearning of passion. If things had been different, if one could change the self, if the past were nobler, was that the cry of them? A painful humility, a boundless pity, the rise of some moral wave within her he could neither measure nor explain. These were some of the impressions which passed from her to him. A fresh gulf opened between them, and he saw her transformed on the farther side, with, as it were, a loftier gesture, a nobler stature, than had ever yet been hers. He bent forward quickly, caught her hands, held them for an instant to his lips in a convulsive grasp, dropped them, and was gone. He gained his own room again. There lay the medley of his books, his only friends, his real passion. Why had he ever tampered with any other? It was not love, not love, he said to himself, with an accent of infinite relief as he sank into his chair. Her smart will heal. End of Book 5, Chapter 36